Chief Operating Officer of Helpage India, Mr. Prateep Chakravarti, to welcome you all to this webinar. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Anupama. Um, so just welcome. I'd just like to welcome you all to the, the session as well as the webinar on exploring intersectionality of gender and aging. Uh, as you know, and as you might have come to know during these days, Helpage India is a charity that works with the disadvantaged generally. But in terms of the webinar, uh, the, we, we know that the gendered nature of aging plays an important role in shifting or shaping the life of older persons, especially in the world. And of course, when you talk about the Indian context, both men as well as women experience ageism as and when they grow older. Uh, and I think it in, impacts uh, women very differently. So gender discrimination as well as inequalities are exacerbated at older ages and equalities are deeply rooted in our soci societal mores, societal norms. The, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic had further exacerbated the situation uh, and, and, and women and especially older women had, because of health issues, because of socioeconomic issues, had faced a disproportionate effect of uh, discrimination. So this has also highlighted the need to adapt our policies. And I, this is where I think our esteemed panel of uh, jurists as well as panelists will discuss upon this issue about adapting our policies, adapting our programs to ensure the protection of older persons comes in extremely important as well as uh, seminal. So related to this issue is also there is extremely limited data. And especially even if we have worked in the field for around 45 years, we still find difficulty in collecting uh, specific data about the aging of uh, people, especially women. And then the role of women, the, the status and role of women, especially in work, also becomes extremely uh, difficult. And, at, and, and after COVID-19, since there has been a, an extreme dip in India, I think uh, the, the, the situation of women, as well as the situation of aging in the Indian context, has, has been nebulous over since. So there are three main issues that I would like to highlight and as well as I think our uh, esteemed panel of jurists as well as panelists will discuss upon. One is older women are confronted with economic insecurity even during old age. Uh, so, so that comes in the importance of policies and programs. Invisibility of abuse and violence makes their situation more vulnerable and that is an accepted fact. We have some amount of data that, that proves it. And then, of course, we all, including uh, older women, the roles in the society evolve uh, as, as the age. So I'd just like to stop with these three small but important takeaways. And I suppose there will be a lot of uh, animated discussions between the jury as well as the panel members. And uh, and there will be a lot of important takeaways as well as business insights that will come about. And it depends on uh, organizations, academics, individuals, Progress. universities, and, and, and institutions uh, of like, like Helpage India and other Helpage NGOs India. to be able to tweak their policies, the government, for example, to tweak their policies to ensure that women as well as aging issues are not swept under the mainstream of development as well as they recorded the importance that they deserve. So I'll stop there and uh, Anupama, over to you, please. Uh, thanks, Pradeep, uh, for this introduction. I think uh, you've set the tone. But uh, just to drive home the point, because uh, I'd like to like you know, uh, share with all of you that this decision to uh, you know explore the intersectionality of gender and uh, aging has been with us for some time. Because earlier we also thought that you know aging population is like aging population that needs to be dealt with uh, with a single hand. But then when we were working in the field and over the years we realized that there are these intersectionalities that add to the disadvantage of aging people, and gender being a very important point. And uh, you know uh, then demographers also started telling us that uh, feminization of aging will also be a reality very soon. So uh, this is a dimension that we had never explored earlier. So we sat down with the, this has been, this has been a process which has, you know, which has been ideated with experts and iterated and reiterated with a lot of other, you know, uh, domain experts. 
and uh, after consulting all of them international and national uh, experts and practitioners we uh, thought that we should have a national survey on the aging women that's what we did last time and we also looked at the lasi data so i'll just quickly share these two uh, slides with you which will uh, which will set the tone for the uh, for the discussion in the session yeah so if you look at this uh, lasi data which is very very insightful if you look at uh, you know you look at any value here on the on the right hand side and you look at the left hand side females like you know it's actually disadvantage always doubles and uh, you know advantages become half so if you look at schooling for example uh, like you know uh, currently working just 22% women currently work and because they don't work and they have never worked so they lack skills and they also lack ability to save for themselves and save for their old age and will be very well know that you know uh, they are going to live longer than the men in the family so that's an a disadvantage connected to schooling and to other living conditions now those living alone if you look at this figure 8.5% women are living alone compared to only 2.5% males uh you look at uh, you know uh, self rated uh, good health status it is almost same but still there is a there is a difference between what women feel and what men feel health insurance coverage is also women are at a disadvantage decision making capacity this is a very very important point and all my panelists will agree with me that decision making in household matters is very very important point this is how this is what decides everything that you know happens in a person's life so here also there are at a clear disadvantage if you look at awareness you know about a maintenance act which is of such importance to elderly people only legislation probably in this whole world which talks about protection of the elderly people only 8.7% women know about it compared to 15% men awareness of any concession given by the government to the elderly people there also much less so women because their education is less their skills are less their ability to traverse the world is much different from that of men they are almost at a disadvantage and this disadvantage becomes even worse uh, awareness about indira gandhi national old age pension scheme which i think is a scheme which has been there for for a very very long time since 1998 Uh, even that scheme only 51% of women know about uh, and if you look at uh, and this was actually reinforced by the the date that uh, the survey that i was talking about major major challenge for women is widowhood 44% older women are widowed 69% uh, don't own any assets so 70% of them are not even owning a single asset 47% of them feel financially secure only 47% and that's also because if you look at the if you remember the previous slide most of them are living with family highly dependent on them uh, 79% of them are dependent on their children for finances so this dependence is high so it's actually if the children are good and they are wanting to take care of her well and good but if they are not and even if they are good like you know is it that there is a subtle exploitation of older women happening in families we don't know 75% of them do not have any savings this was a this was a big shock for us that 75% of them do not have any savings which i think is a very scary fact only 12% had health insurance 11% were aware of the maintenance act and its provisions and only 22% were aware of the other government schemes uh, now the last point is also something that we we think is very important especially from the perspective of future that you know only 22% own a smartphone and 60% of the older women have never used a digital device now this is something if we are going into going into e governance if we are going to smart cities and if th that is the status of elderly women then i think lot of work and lot of uh, you know discussion needs to happen around these points of disadvantage because uh, once we know where the challenge lies it will be easy for us to find solutions so this is my uh, uh, by very short and brief uh, you know points that we we thought that we should make to the panel Uh, and uh, with this i'll um, welcome the chair and the co-chair and uh, i'll introduce the chair to you uh, dr minakshi sharda thank you very much for agreeing to chair the session uh, she is a senior professor of medicine and hod geriatric medicine at government medical college kota uh, she and she has a dch uh, from the from gmc nagpur she was she was holding the first merit position 
in 1919. She was instrumental in developing geriatric services in GMC Kota from the year 2009. She has an extensive teaching experience of 28 years, a uh, postgraduate teacher, 14 years. She has number of uh, publications, 50. She has presented papers, 25. And she, has she has contributed to books, uh, chapters in books, which is 15. She's organized various health checkups, vaccinations, social, spiritual, fund welfare camps for elderly persons at multiple places, including old age homes and NGOs and geriatric welfare societies. She is chairman of uh, something very interesting, Brain Death Committee for Organ Donation. And she has um, she is also actively participating in body donation campaigns. Um, she has also been awarded uh, Excellence Award from District Administration, Medical College, RMC, NGOs, media and various awards for academic papers and excellence. Uh, she has organized uh, con she has organized research review board of GMC Quota. She is vice president AIG. Um, President IAG Quota Chapter, she's organizing Chapter of Jericon 2018, and she's Vice Chairman Rajasthan Chapter of IAG. IAG, for those who do not know, is the Geriatric uh, Society. Uh, so uh, thank you, Minakshi Ji, for joining us. And I'd also like to introduce the co-chair, uh, Mrs. Ghazala Minai. She is an officer of the Indian Audit and Account Service uh, of the 1985 batch. She holds a master degree from Jawaharlal Nehru University and a master's in development management from Asian Institute of Management, Manila, Philippines. She has held uh, important assignments in central government, including ministries of social justice and empowerment, consumer affairs, food and public distribution and defense. In her capacity as joint secretary at the Ministry of Social Justice, she has handled issues at the national level relating to policy formulation, program implementation in respect of uh, not just senior citizens, but transgenders, uh, victims of alcoholism and drug abuse, beggary, and other backward classes, denotified nomadic and semi nomadic tribes, uh, economically backward classes, media and advocacy. So you can see that she's, she has that extensive experience of administratively dealing with the aging uh, population in the country. She has also represented the respective ministries at various bilateral and multilateral forums, including SCAP forums, uh, FWEAP, UN DOC. And after superannuation as Director General of Audit from the Office of Control Auditor General of India, uh, she has she is she was associated as an advisor to the National Institute of Social Defense, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. So she continues to work for the cause of the aging population. And uh, I welcome both of you, ma'am. Thank you very much for sparing time. And uh, it's over to now. It's over to now, Min uh, Minakshi, ma'am, for taking this forward. Hello. Thank you, Anupama ji, for the nice words. And uh, I first of all, I wish a very bright morning and a coming happy Women's Day to all the beautiful speakers, the chairpersons sitting here and joining the webinar also and uh, on the live also. And uh, very, uh, uh, all the first of all, a uh, very um, Happy morning to a very key person, Anupama ji, from Helpage India, who is a, a source for this, um, who has organized this and has planned this uh, session. And very nicely, uh, you have put the LASI um, study. That is That was very nice and it was very disturbing also to see. And uh, I'll be very thankful to uh, Dr. A.B. Desar, and the other organizing committee of the Helpage India who has given me this opportunity for sharing the first, very first session of today's webinar on intersectionality of gender and aging. That is really an important uh, topic you have chosen, I would say. And because we know that, and we all have experienced and we know, and some or the other time in the life, that the uh, intersectionality definitely influences and it gets influenced by various factors, cultural, social, economic, which I've already put. And when I look from a medical and health point of the perspective, and especially after working for the 20 years in the geriatric practice, this uh, aging is no bar to this or is not an exception. It also faces the same um, changes, uh, same uh, affects the same way the other factors are being affected because uh, gender plays a very vital role in the aging process and access to health care facility, delivery and utilization of the health services also gets affected by the gender 
uh, gender of the person because we have seen it in our practical um, clinical uh, practice that the, definitely the services are less utilized by the females compared to the men. Men Maybe that they do not themselves opt it or maybe that the family members do not bring them. That is one thing I would say. And when we look the, towards the convergence of gender and aging, and it introduces the layers of complexity that demand the urgent and undirected, undivided attention of the policymakers for a holistic approach to total well-being of the elderly woman who is facing the unique challenges which you have already put forward, the challenges. And today's session on health and well-being of the aging woman not only will address these issues, but also justifies the 2004 theme of International Women's Day, which is that invest in women to accelerate the progress and count her in so that you have to count her in for this. And from medical point of view, and if I say the real and successful investment is taking care of her health. So today's webinar on this health and well-being of women is will justify the our International Women's Day theme also. A holistic approach must encompass geriatric care that recognizes the unique needs of elderly women with integration of the preventive measures such as proper nutrition and I would say vaccination also, our mental well-being, social health support and community engagement so that there is a comeback of the woman in the society again. Today's webinar will bring out such a comprehensive approach for the health and well-being of aging women as the various issues which I have taken for this webinar will be addressed by the galaxy of the speakers from different places. And in short, I would just uh, tell, uh, tell uh, for the benefit of the, our viewers, I'll just in short tell who will be the speakers and what subjects will be dealt today. First and foremost in this regard is how the changing demography of aging population will in intersect the number of, will intervene the number of older people, women, will affect the challenges as there is an increasing number of the older women and it will in, in affect the challenges and the need of exploration of opportunities for active and healthy aging of the older women. This issue will be dealt by none other than Professor Mala Kapoor, who is a retired faculty member from the Delhi University. The role of the second uh, uh, issue will be dealt by, that was the last minute entry, that was a rethinking dependence and caregiving among older women by Dr. Kavita. She is uh, uh, from Columbia Center. And the other issues are role of social support, physical structure in mental being, well-being of the elderly woman will be addressed by Professor Minu Anand from Delhi University. Importance of nutrition in life course approach for healthy aging will be dealt by Dr. Deepthi Anil, she is from Sophia College, Mumbai. And after all these stories of resilience and comeback of over older women from Delhi and Dehradun will be narrated by Dr. Shivani Bhardwaj. And finally, for all this good thing to happen and to achieve the healthy aging, what changes in current health care system are required so that we can achieve the goal for the healthy aging of the woman, her well-being of the, her total well-being. And they, so that what changes we should have in our healthcare system, that the system becomes older woman friendly, they are more approachable, more affordable, and this will be addressed by uh, Dr. Alka Ganesh, ma'am, whom I respect like a, any legend in the geriatric field. And I... Uh, in my regards to her, I have seen her joining here and it is really my privilege when uh, she is delivering some session, I am I'm on the chair. So, Madam, I welcome you in this session. So, this in total is the roadmap of today's session. Good morning, ma'am. And uh, I wish good luck to all for a very beautiful, interesting and interactive session by our learned speakers. With this opening remarks, I think I declare that this webinar is open and uh, first uh, I will, uh, for the first session, I'll invite 
professor mala kapoor for delivering delivering her topic or her deliberation on feminization of aging population need for opportunities for active and healthy aging and i am very much privileged to introduce her and uh, she is an Dr. professor mala kapoor a retired faculty member from delhi university is a highly educated person and a post doctoral specialization in sociology and uh, she is a an international consultant academician researcher writer and an activist and uh, she uh, she has a total 38 years of teaching experience she has uh, had a uh, hold various prestigious assignments in various indian and foreign institutions and in the uh, indian uh, ministries and the departments of the government of india she has held honorary positions also international and national organizations and uh, she has been associated with a consultant with unfa new york and india office of and on since 1997 and she has a main job of reviewing the manuscripts and articles for the publishing houses and reputed journals and she has herself published 12 books with the reputable world publishers and she has written approximately 100 articles in specialized journals magazines and the newspapers she is presently a board member of a few civil society agencies editorial advisor to scientific journals she is a founder member and managing trustee of development welfare and research foundation and she is an executive active executive board member of eating consortium asia pacific so with these words and uh, i would request professor mala kapoor to please start the session with her deliberation thank you very much days greetings to all respected chair and co-chair i'm always happy to be part of helpage india's endeavors and appreciate mr chakraborty and anupa datta inviting me as a resource person and a panelist as mostly it requires deliberations on topics which are not only close to my heart but relate to my work over the years today's session is particularly pertinent for me as i have few publications on this aspect and i look forward to advocating for the need to bring in opportunities for active and healthy aging especially for aging women on which i focus this morning it is so very timely as we mark the international day of women with this conference since i'm the first panelist to highlight on health and well-being of aging women it is important to set the grounds for focusing on some critical issues which impact on their quality of life anupma pointed out earlier grave realities of older women in india let me proceed by bringing attention to what feminization of aging means and why is there the need to discuss for opportunities for active and healthy aging we must understand that an aging population is indeed an achievement for any country as it reflects improved health and longevity now when feminization of aging happens it means that women are living longer thanks to advancements in healthcare and reduced maternal mortality it also indicates that women constitute a growing majority of the older population however this demographic shift also presents challenges that require policy solutions for women to enjoy healthy well-being question arises are women's health care needs being met from a life course approach ample research from countries suggests that as women age they face 
unique health challenges related to post-reproductive health, chronic conditions, and overall well-being. Another issue which needs to be addressed is, does, do aging women have social protection? This question is particularly pertinent, especially as women often outlive uh, their male counterparts and are economically vulnerable due to factors like widowhood, limited work opportunities, and unequal pay during their working years. Thus, an important question is, are aging women economically empowered? And how should it be done if they are not? To answer these questions, or rather to meet the challenges which aging women face, there is an urgent need to have policies that must empower women to make informed choices about their health and well-being. In addition, governments, communities must encourage active lifestyles, social engagement, and lifelong learning that can enhance the quality of life for aging women. Also, uh, we must understand that this is achievable when in societies, gender considerations are integrated into policies which ensure meeting specific needs of older women. It has to be accepted that older women have unique needs and it is pivotal for all aging societies to create a society where everyone can age gracefully, actively and with dignity. It is essentially crucial for all of us to realize that aging is not just about numbers, not about having longer lifespans, but rather it is about ensuring fulfilling and healthy life for all, inclusive of women, transgender communities. So what strategies need to be adopted so that aging women have income security, access to health care, receive retirement benefits, whether in formal or informal sector, do not face discrimination and isolation. It must be realized that for all this to happen, societies must work towards removing structural gender inequalities that go against the status of older women. The work done by women must be valued, even if it is unpaid, as happened often. Women must be provided with opportunities to move away from low-paid, low-skilled, and informal employment. Their rights must be recognized, whether these are in terms of labor rights or in families and wider society. Moving ahead with this strategy means that active aging be promoted with gender considerations at a, as it brings to forefront emphasis on maintaining physical, mental, and social well-being as people grow older. Let's be clear that active aging is about staying engaged, maintaining independence, and enjoying life to the fullest. Some effective steps towards achieving the active aging goal requires being physically active with tailoring the fitness or exercise regime to individual abilities. It also involves taking care of nutrition and hydration, having various kinds of mental stimulations, social engagements, and all this is possible if emphasis is kept on preventive measures towards keeping healthy well-being. This also has correlation with having facilities for learning new skills, having a purpose in life, and above all, being financially literate as well as techno-savvy. In contemporary world, women need to embrace technology for communication, and other purposes across the lifespan. Clearly, all this fosters positive well-being and generates pursuit for creativity in managing their lives, 
doing necessary and voluntary work, which is not a burden. We all know that many women over their lives, over their years, realize the importance of all aspects stated towards active and healthy aging, but yet cannot manage these because governments and communities do not provide the necessary support. What needs to be done in this direction requires reflections. Most pivotal is the need for appropriate and adequate healthcare. Governments need to make primary healthcare easily accessible, organize health camps with provisions for necessary health checkups, and uh, <clears throat> treatments have nutritional programs for aging women, raise awareness about health issues, preventive measures, and benefits of physical and mental activities. Along with this, governments of different levels, whether state or central, must ensure provision for community centers for socialization, recreation, and voluntary activities, especially to facilitate reaching out to those alone. For dignified living, a sound financial status is a prerequisite. Aging women must be included in pension assistance schemes. Microfinance facilities must be made available along with training for managing finances and savings. They must have many livelihood opportunities. Women, whether involved with household chores or with work outside, can always gain with skill upgradation provisions and availability of such training may be organized through formal channels or with creating self-help groups which allow for collaboration, knowledge sharing, and supporting each other. Such mechanisms can empower older women and also by providing legal awareness, their voices for their rights can be assertive, which then has a protective value. Safety and security of older women is of immense importance, especially by creating abuse-free environments, which can be enhanced by community watch programs, setting up emergency helplines, various home security measures, along with having affordable housing and shelter options for comfortable living, and not to forget proper transportation facilities. All these are significant attributes contributing towards emotional well-being, an important component for active and healthy aging. I end my talk here and it leads to deliberations by other speakers covering various resultant dim dimensions and discussing practices which show good results for maintaining active and healthy aging for older women. Communities have the power to create nurturing environment for aging women and together let's all do it. We need to celebrate lives of women as they age and overcome all uh, obstacles, hindrances towards achieving this goal for the present and future cohorts of aging women. So thank you for your patient hearing and hope the platform is set for more de deliberations, discussions and sharing of good practices towards well-being of women across the board of all ages. So cheers to all for the 8th March International Women's Day and I try to keep within my inner word limit. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Madam Malaji, for a very clear and concise view on the active and healthy eating of the older woman. And as you have rightly said, there is a feminization of the aging population. More and more female are going to survive more than the men compared to a men population. And just to put uh, this, um, highlight this, I would like to just share a data 
that in 2021, older women were 10.4% of the total female population. And it is estimated to rise by 14% in 2031. Whereas the main population, it was there 9.7 less as compared to the men pop, uh, female population. And the rise is also going to be less as compared to the female population. It will be 12.2% shift compared to 14% shift in 31 of the females. So the older women, they will be living longer. So they will face more, more of the challenges. And as you have rightly said that her active aging and you have told the importance of the physical activity, her nutritional demands and for her other well-being, you have already said that her contribution, maybe she is in whatever position she is, her contribution has to be recognized at every sphere of the uh, uh, place and may, maybe she is a household worker, maybe she is a laborer or maybe she is a professional that has to be recognized by the society and her she has to be paid accordingly she her, her value she has to be given an adequate value for that and you have said about the technology also techno savvy we have to make our females more techno savvy you have told about the financial stability financial assistance also and you have said about the safety and security very important our household safety not only that but her transport, during her transport also, she should be able to move fearlessly in the society. And uh, you have, for all these, you have said that the availability of the health services may be at the primary health center or maybe through the camps or maybe by awareness, they have to be utilized by our female population adequately so that she can achieve in total the, not only the physical, but the total well-being. That, I think, was uh, to sum up your talk, which I could gather. And we would like to have the question and answers if there are in the chat box or some on the... Uh, personally, if they want to ask, I think, Anupama ji, we can take questions directly. Yeah. Some yeah, of I, uh, yes, Dr. Minakshi, I see some uh, query, uh, I think, put by Anupama. And I would like to share here, we do have some very good uh, examples of good practices from certain East Asian countries and also from Sri Lanka, a South Asian country, uh, which are good for us to develop and uh, take guidance from. So Thailand has been able to develop very good health care at the primary level for uh, older people. Similarly, some of these Asian countries, uh, Singapore, China, are emphasizing a lot on physical activities, on having everyday health practices, uh, physical health practices, with and mental health uh, challenges, which can be overcome by certain exercises. And these are being promoted and a lot of awareness Mala, you no. oh. so now you are audible. Oh, sorry. So, no, uh, 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 just taking up uh, something uh, in terms of giving an illustration of uh, where such good practices are working, I would say that some of the East Asian countries and Sri Lanka from South Asia also provide some good examples uh, where we can uh, uh, move forward. And this is in terms of, you know, um, uh, making primary health care very, very accessible uh, to older women. It is reaching out to various vulnerable populations of older women in the countries. And also what is important is that many of these countries are encouraging and raising awareness on the importance of physical activity. Uh, since the last few years, while I've been traveling to these countries, I'm finding uh, in the mornings, the number of women who are participating 
even in uh, you know small residential neighborhood colonies in terms of exercises in terms of emphasizing on nutrition i mean talking to some of these women i find that there is so much more awareness which has come through in terms of the oils to be consumed in terms of cereals to be taken in terms of what vegetables are more beneficial and also uh, uh, what is becoming significant and that i'm seeing in some of the parts of our country too where people are becoming conscious of their health needs especially in terms of making provisions for uh, dental for dentures for uh, op cataract operations the it is increasing of course we need to encourage much more participation in bringing about uh, or uh, using of these facilities but it is happening then many countries uh, are developing very uh, enabling environments uh, which uh, facilitate older women to participate uh, in uh, outside activities at different times of the day uh, plus what is also happening is in some of these countries parent care leave has started which is a very good sign uh, where if older generation are in need of care uh, they have their children who can help them with provision and support from governments singapore has this and they also have certain incentives to take care of parents and this also uh, in some ways we are finding that uh, limiting the family is actually uh, bringing pressure on older people uh, to feel that they cannot be dependent on children and they need to develop their own independent uh, resources to take care of themselves a change which i'm seeing in some countries is where uh, especially in the south asian context is although yes it is still limited but which needs to be promoted and encouraged more is uh, many couples they are living on their own and the male a uh, companion is taking up to helping in households in various other activities and the women are becoming equipped to handle the outside things so in a way it is a reversal from the traditional uh, stereotype roles which we were seeing in terms of gender differentiation and so forth what we need is documenting uh, these practices and that is where i think uh, much more research needs to be done lasi is a good uh, attempt at documenting but i think what we need is also a uh, documentation at various community level uh, programs or community level responses uh, which need to be adopted and shared and so i encourage government and uh, civil society organizations to come forward uh to help more research in this area so far lot of it is anecdotal evidence but we need strong scientific evidence based studies which promote certain specific practices there are practices i'm seeing uh, especially like i reviewed some of the complexes in gurgaon which is a, a city in haryana state of india uh, that some of the residential complexes are becoming very age friendly they are providing various facilities which assist older people uh, to live independently and we need to look at these things in a more positive way we need to, to look at the change in mindset of seniors who say they don't want to be dependent on older people so capturing of these voices is very important some of my work has captured this but uh, we need more um, uh, 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 sort of large scale studies which we can then adopt as good practices and reach out to many more parts of the country especially uh, we find that even in rural areas there is a tremendous change coming uh, with the migration uh, happening and with the 
uh, you know, children who are outside facilitating uh, certain changes in the lifestyles of uh, their older parents who have been left behind. So much more studies need to uh, take up how these things are happening and what kind of changes are happening. So given the limitation of time, I would just say that yeah. some practices are coming up and we are happy that things are moving in the right direction, but the consolidated effort and uh, experts need to get together. Civil society organizations have to partner with government, which is also happening, uh, but we need more visibility of this. So I'll stop here. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am Malaji. Uh, you said all, I would just say self-recognition of the woman herself that she yeah. can do, she has to do. And uh, mm -hmm. she is nothing less than anyone else. That also mm -hmm. amounts it's a lot. Point. That will yes. And with this, I think we have already um, overgone the time. So I think, Madam Nupmati, do you have hey, a... Uh, Ma'am, we'll do a poll question quickly. Thank okay. you. Thank you, okay. Mala. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mala is a storehouse of knowledge. She can go on speaking forever about it, I know. But so we have this poll for the audience. And if you could quickly uh, respond to this and then we'll move forward. Host and panelist cannot vote. We cannot vote. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was saying. This probably we ourselves. This question is you can, very. You can express apt. your opinion while you speak. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so we have enlightened audience. See? Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful to see this overwhelming. That's what I was telling. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll move on with the session. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, for the next session, I would request my co-chair, Madam Ghazala Ji, to please introduce the next speaker. And, Th and thank you, ma'am. A very good morning to everyone. And um, yeah, thank you to Helpage, to Dr. Chakravarti, to Anupma for having us here. It's a very, very exciting uh, uh, webinar. And as always, Professor Mala has set the, as somebody commented, has set the tone for this whole thing. It's my privilege to be here and to introduce Dr. Kavita Shiva, Shivarama Krishnan, who is going to be the next speaker. She's a, uh, she is a global health historian of South Asia with a focus on the politics of health, aging and the life course and chronic diseases, and is based as a Department of Sociomedical Sciences, Mailman School of Public Health and History, School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia University. Early research her early research focused on politics of indigenous Ayurvedic medicine and its reconfiguring in a, in a late colonial context in North India. She's also worked on social histories and politics of epidemic crisis and the role played by experts and scientific evidence and its national and regional politics in South Asia. Recent, her recent research is on global politics of aging and her new book is titled As the World Ages, Rethinking a Demographic Crisis, which will be brought out by the Harvard University Press which has been brought out by the Harvard University Press. She was co-director of the Butler Columbia Aging Center at Columbia University and leads the Global Health and Aging Cluster. She's the interim director of the Center for Science and Society, a co-director at the Center for the History and Ethics of Public Health at the Mailman School, founding director Yusuf Ham and Yusuf Hamid Exchange Program in Public Health. She is currently engaged in a book project on the history of consumption, life course risk in South Asia, and is co-authoring a book on the history of heart disease in India. A very, very useful um, contribution from her side. May I invite uh, Dr. Kavita to please uh, go ahead with her presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone. Most of all, I think we all owe a very strong debt to people like Anupama and Helpage who really lead from the front. There's not a, I think I've been involved in some of this research now for almost 10 years and at every point, whenever I've started my qualitative interviews or started uh, to work on policies, the first stop has always been the help page office. And there's always some data that they give us access to and an insight that they bring in. So wow. any support that we offer them is little compared to what they have contributed. So my sincere thanks to her and um, also to both the chair and co-chair. 
um, to Dr. Ghazala and to Dr. Sharda for so kindly um, chairing this uh, chairing this session. Uh, it's an honor to be here, actually, because I always feel that um, when I talk about the work I have done in India and in comparative perspectives between India and Southeast Asia or Africa, I feel that it's never more relevant than when I speak to people who worked in the field and to whom it makes a difference when we talk about aging. The current paper I've been writing, which I think will be of interest to this group, has been focusing on uh, two states in India, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And um, I took the examples of both those states, basically, because as all of you know, that both Tamil Nadu and Kerala are ahead of the demographic transition as compared to the rest of India. Tamil Nadu has almost 8.6% 8 of those who are above 65 who are elderly. Kerala tops even that. It has more than 12.6% of its population who are above 60 years. So what it brings us to when we think about gender and aging is really some of the studies in Kerala and Tamil Nadu have shown that it is older women who lack substantial assets. It is older women over men who mostly tend to live in the midst of families. Often men live alone, older men live alone, but women have to live within families. So it's interesting that it then brings up, I think, to me, what is an important question for this panel, and I want to raise it with you, which is this question of aging and care, especially long-term care. Um, care itself, the way most of us like to think it, is something soft, something nurturing, something that, uh, you know, like feeding or caring or nurturing. But what we forget is that Care also brings in, when we think about gender, is that involves both paid and unpaid labor. Uh, it is made out in most policies, especially uh, when we talk about older women. We talk about it as being presumed that women will offer care out of bonds of affection that they have for family or that they have for a community, or even women who can come to work in our houses, we think come simply out of a certain kind of emotion and will work for us. But to me, what I'm trying to offer is that actually older women are also caught in a power dynamic of offering care, but not having control over their own health over offering the terms of the care that they will offer, whether it is long-term care that they offer to a family member or whether it is long-term care that they offer in the labor market. There is a power dynamic here. And I think it's the question of emotional labor in particular that I want to bring out when it comes to older women, because I think older women particularly offer emotional care often to their partners. They are expected to offer it also to their families. And it becomes both a sense of obligation or commitment, but it can also become, unless it is, it, it, it has a sufficient reciprocation, it becomes a form of exploitation. And increasingly, I feel, when you look especially at Tamil Nadu and Kerala, there are new aging policies that are coming up there. And in all of the aging policies, the question that is brought up is the question of a care crisis. The fact, particularly in Kerala, that there is a care deficit. Who is going to care for those who are dependent? Who is going to care for older parents whose children have gone abroad and migrated to the Middle East? And care is seen as a form of what women give both as older women to the family, but also what daughters and kinship and community people give to, uh, to those who are older. And there is a lot of stigma attached, therefore, I feel, to the, to women who are not able to offer that kind of care or to women who expect that kind of care. I'm taking the example of um, two of the policies that have come up recently. The one that's under consideration in Tamil Nadu, which is a Tamil Nadu state policy on senior citizens of 2022. Um, there is There are some recommendations for a change in the policy in Kerala based on the 13th plan recommendations. And all of them have a series of recommendations for an age-friendly kind of policy, for an age-friendly society and state. But all of them assume, when you talk about being age-friendly, that geriatric care centers, mental health care centers, dementia care centers, rehabilitation care centers, they all rely on a form of gendered labor. They all rely on finding primary health care workers that are women, 
being able to find women in the family who will offer that kind of geriatric care. So, and including in Tamil Nadu, where you had an intensified scheme called the Makkal Thed Marudatam, which is basically the delivery of health care to the doorstep. Again, whom does it involve? It involves the labor of women. So what I really want to bring out is that this is, this is something that we really need to think about um, because I think the seriousness of the care crisis has increased, especially as data has shown post-COVID. The, during the COVID years, we realized how important it was to consider the, the health of older women who are an informal care workforce, who work in other people's home and go back and forth the vulnerability of older women who are staying at home. Uh, there is a Madras Institute of Development Studies who talk about how older women, particularly the informal care workforce, are some of the biggest social security beneficiaries of widows' pensions, of um, uh, poorer women's pensions, all because they are below poverty line. So, and it's clear that almost 68.8 or 70% of women Older women rely on daily earnings. So when we talk about care, what we need to remember, and this is how I'm addressing what uh, Professor Shankar Das and Anupama were discussing also, is that when we talk about care and when we talk about older women and care, when they talk in the context of poverty, there is no question of active aging. It is a very difficult question that we bring up here when we talk about active aging is possible for certain women uh, who have had certain kinds of access to nutrition, to uh, certain kinds of job security, who possibly have a pension. The question I really then want to bring up is, what, when we think about the effects of caregiving on the health and the quality of older caregivers, when we think of the effects of a life course effects that women have of poor malnutrition, of poor education since early childhood, then there are life course effects of this that make it difficult for older women to have the same activities of daily living, to have to ha the same kinds of physical stamina, to be able to survive. So what I'm trying to say is that the chronological age of older women, often at 40 or 50 in my interviews, is actually the physiological age of women who are 70 or 80 often. Because when you've had malnutrition or poor access to education, and poverty in early parts of your life, then the life course is such that by the time you're older, you are in a much worse shape than most men are who have always had better access to nutrition. And you're in a worse shape because you've been through worse life experiences. So it's something we have to remember that you can't really equate the caregiving responsibilities, the needs for care, or even the kinds of healthy aging and resilience that we expect from older women, because there is no question of being able to match them across the life course. We know that even as young girls, there is, and the LASI study shows that there is gender-based discrimination in the allocation of cognitive resources, of nutritional resources for young girls. So when you think about that, you see how older women actually carry the legacies of these, uh, the legacies of these kinds of setbacks. So what I want to highlight to the panel and to everyone today really is how can we really value women both at home and their labor at home? And how can we also value it when it is actually a transactional labor, when they offer it as caregivers, as informal caregivers who come to look after our elders or others at home or who are offering their services in the labor market? And this is really, I think, a, a really very difficult question to answer because all our aging programs are relying on a life course on, on the workforce of women. Everything, even when we are becoming age friendly in our policies, we are relying on the care crisis being resolved by women. Even when women from Kerala are migrating, they are often facing the responsibility, even when they are in the Middle East, to be the caregivers for both their mothers-in-law and their mothers somehow. So there is a responsibility, whether you are in place or whether you go away, of carrying the responsibilities of giving caregiving assistance. Let me take the example of two kinds of policies, which are innovations, both in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, which is um, policies to offer geriatric care at home, policies to offer caregiver assistance within homes. These are very innovative policies. They are really state-of-the-art policies that these two states have enacted. But in spite of that, 
you unless they have a gendered women labor force i feel there is no solution to be able to say they are we are innovating and we are becoming age friendly so i think what we need to have is a life course approach when we think about gender and aging we realize that the life course trajectories of women are very different from those of men that they actually are expected to be part of a culture of care even when they are young even when they are girls or sisters or daughters and they are oppressed by different kinds of gender regimes and this means really that a woman's life course unlike a man's is much more dependent on an intergenerational family they are much more connected in their lives and dependent on families so when the government passes something like the maintenance of welfare and parents act you see when i was doing an analysis of some of the court cases filed by women the women are the first often the rates of court cases filed by women are quite high but they are the first to go into mediation and to take back the cases men file proper men file cases under under the maintenance of women uh, women's uh, women and parents act for property women file cases not for property they file for abuse or they file for maintenance within the family and that i think is a very big difference even in attitudes between women who are looking just for maintenance who are looking for reassurance within the family while men are filing those acts mostly to retrieve or to take back or to resolve a property issue so when we are talking about the regimes of gender we are also talking about how women's lives are much more interconnected and they need a very different approach when we think of their life course as compared to men and it's also true that when we talk about active aging i would respectfully ask the panel to think about how active aging and gender has intersectionalities with caste with class with religion so the first things you remember often is that for those who are below poverty line some of the studies show that if you are living and dying on 1 dollar or 100 rupees a day then there is no question of you being able to have a regenerative life there is no question of retirement there is no question of a pension and um, i remember even in the lassi study when i was involved in the initial pilot we were doing some pilot interviews in haryana and you know i could not rec- when when you would ask the age of women you would say um kitni umar hai and you would not be able to believe when they said actually we are we are only 35 or 25 because to look without dental care having worked in the fields having had poor nutrition their physiological age and the fact that fertility cycles have really sapped them they are much older in so i feel that even chronological age is not enough for us to decide on issues of gender and pensions and care because women have a very different way in which their bodies and their bodily regimes as well as their emotional give and take of care saps them and i think that is something to remember that the luxury of uh, leisure the luxury of walking the luxury of being able to have retirement and to have a pension to be able to decide should i volunteer in the arya samaj should i volunteer in my kerala community it is a luxury for some social classes of women so we need to intersect our questions with class and caste and finally what i want to say i think uh, respectfully to the panel and i'd like to open it up for questions is really that i think when we talk about gender and care we certainly need to think about what the state needs to do very actively when it plays a role not simply in judging families in the maintenance act saying you have been morally wrong to abandon your parents or not i think you need much more mediation you need incentives for intergenerational solidarity and i think that is something which is not given enough importance we can't talk of aging as a separate policy issue we need and that will mean that it will become like what is happening in places like the us and other things which is that you know old people and aging is seen as one policy issue they vote one way and young people feel they are alienated that they get some funds that we don't so in a country where we have mixed resources like in india when we are always struggling whether to give to youth or older people whether we are giving to men or women children or women whether fertile women or older women i think it's important that we need to have not only separate aging policies we need an integration of these policies into what exists why can't we think of aging schemes that are in the nutritional 
and child and nutritional schemes that already exist in Tamil Nadu. Why can't we think of intersecting aging and embedding it in what already exists for youth, what already exists for younger women? So I feel that kind of integration is something that is really vital. If we create for aging a separate terrain, then that will also mean that we will marginalize ourselves as something separate. So I think it's important to ask for a certain representation and age, but an age-inclusive approach, one that looks at intergenerational solidarity. And we had actually done a study like this in uh, some of the slums in Dharavi in Bombay is very important when you think about how there is deprived youth who are unemployed in Dharavi, but you also have older people who are deprived or who are marginalized. Then how do you answer the needs of two groups that are very needy? And you can only do that by saying, if you have gyms or if you have other places where older people go to exercise to be active, but younger people are also going, that you have shared services, that you have ways in which you address it together. So when we talk about women and gender and aging, I feel we need to have an integrated kind of approach which sees aging itself of older women being integrated with what exists rather than just building new buildings or building new policies, because I've seen that many of the policies often remain on the desk. It's very important for us to think uh, strategically as to what we can execute. So on that note, um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone, and I'd be very happy to entertain whatever um, reflections or questions you have. And um, thank you very much again for giving me this honor. I'm deeply honored to be able to speak with this panel. And uh, as a last word, I hope I will also stay in touch with all of you um, to be able to work together uh, with you on it. It's very rare in aging to find groups that have the same commitment. So I hope we will share the solidarity also that we have uh, today to carry it forward. So thanks very much. Hello, Ghazala ji, you, are, huh. you have to unmute yourself. No, yes, yes, we've done it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kavita, for a very, very exhilarating uh, 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 talk. And uh, I think you are kind, you have uh, shaken a few foundations, including mine. But uh, 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 that I will discuss with you one-to-one -one personally, you know, some issues that you have raised here. Very important issues about, uh, about uh, you know, it all, it, um, it, we all look at it, but... Uh, we do, uh, we don't, uh, I mean, we've never voiced it. And that is true that the chronological age is really in the re in respect of women in the rural areas, in the unorganized sector, is certainly really not uh, the same because they have gone through a lot. So it has, as you said, it has to be a continuum, you know, from the beginning, if we have a, if we have a policy that, you know, weaves everything together. So the, uh, we do have a lot of, uh, the government has put in a lot of uh, programs and policies. There is no dark of that, you know. And uh, But yes, where I have a little pressing problem is that I want the elderly women to, there should be a segmentation. And because without that, the elderly woman will never get, it, she will always get covered with senior citizens. She will never get covered with you know, as a as an elderly person, as an elderly woman with her the kind of peculiarities all of you have described and all of us know. So uh, I think let's. Alka Ganesh, I would like to ask her the answer. Ah. Doctor Alka. Doctor Alka Ganesh wants to say something. Uh, Madam, there is. Uh, she has Dr. Alka Ganesh has uh, in the put chat. Some, she has put some chat in the chat box. If you could unmute yourself, Alka ma'am. If you could unmute yourself. Madam, unmute yourself. No, I was merely, I was merely um, amplifying what Dr. Kavita has already said. And uh, that's a good idea, but it is so difficult for us to do this integration. And mm -hmm. also, I think those of us who can, can be demanded. But as she has said, people like us are so privileged that we know that we can demand it. Amen. But those whose bodies and minds have been sapped already do not have that voice. So we have to somehow empower women also to do this. It's a good idea that you have done, as mentioned. Thank you, Dr. Alka. Ma'am, Minakshi, will you yeah. do the honors? So uh, I think there are no further questions uh, or any suggestions. Uh, so I we move on to the third session.
that is by Professor Minu Anand. And it is on the mental being of older woman, role of social and physical structures. I'd like to introduce Ma'am Minu Anand. Uh, she is uh, from the University of Delhi and uh, she teaches at the Department of Social Work. Before that, she has taught at the Bhim Rao Ambedkar College also. And she has led very various national and international projects with uh, which focuses on the multifaceted developmental issues and uh, really has worked with the grassroots NGOs for that. She specializes as a trainer and conducts the various uh, capacity building and gender sensitization workshop for school, colleges, university teachers, policy personnel, NGO functionaries, and several other stakeholders. She has a list of publications to her credit and has uh, um, in the form of the books and in the research papers in national and international journals, which with the issues related to the gender, mental health, and social work within interdisciplinary frameworks. And she has published three books, Gender and Mental Health, Combining Theory and Practice. That's very nice, I think. And uh, she has her upcoming book also, Mental Health Care Resource Book. Concepts and Praxis for Social Workers and Mental Health Professionals, which are being published by Springer Nature, Singapore, in May 2024. So, uh, I think we have a very qualified uh, person on uh, mental health issues who will be talking to us. Uh, she has already had published uh, her book, book, Gender and Mental Health. So, with these words, I would like to, to invite Madam Anand to please start her deliberation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, a very good morning to everybody. And uh, at the outset, I want to thank Anupama ji and the entire team at Helpage India for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this wonderful webinar. I'm very thankful to the chair, uh, Dr. Minakshi Sharda ji and the co-chair, Dr. Ghazala Minai ji for their motivating and spirited presence and remarks. Uh, the issue of gender and mental health is very, very close to my heart. And uh, I just wish to have uh, a conversation with everybody and share some perspectives on mental well-being of older women, role of social and physical structures. Uh, we are amidst the UN decade of healthy aging which is aligned with the last 10 years of SDGs. And uh, older women, we all know, imply a woman who is 60 and above. And uh, this, as uh, pointed out by my honorable panelists earlier, and the chair is the fastest growing segment. And uh, I'm also very happy that we are looking at uh, feminist uh, perspectives on aging. Now, uh, to begin with uh, mental health, for me, mental health means hope, it means optimism. It means how I view my life, how I view myself. Mental health for me means dignity. It means having a purpose in my life. It means belongingness, managing my life, adapting, coping with my day-to-day -day stressors, my day-to-day -day challenges in my personal and professional life. And I strongly feel that gender and mental health are linked and gender is a critical link uh, um, to mental health. Now, uh, as Dr. Uh, Kavita very rightly shared, that when we talk about the vulnerabilities experienced by elderly women, we need to take into account the developmental approach where we know that gender is a critical socio-cultural determinant of mental health. It means that it's not suddenly that elderly women have become vulnerable. Women, by virtue of being females, right since birth are exposed to certain gender-based socializations in terms of expectations, the do's and the don'ts, the behavioral patterns that they ought to have or ought not to have, the personality traits, the career choices, the roles, the responsibilities, resources and the access to the resources. And these have probably continued for over six decades of their lives when their bodies, when their minds have, suscept have become susceptible to ageism. That which, which is exactly what Dr. Kavita was saying, that when we looked at a woman who is 60 and above, we need to take into account the cumulative impact of gender as a sociocultural determinant in their life 
and in their entire persona as a whole. Therefore, many health ailments, for example, low hemoglobin, general weakness, osteoporosis, menopause and related impact of menopause, socioeconomic vulnerabilities, psychological and emotional needs that we see in later years are actually a result of continuum of vulnerabilities, experience of discriminatory practices and disadvantages that they have uh, had since a very, very early age. And gender continues to be a deciding factor in terms of beliefs, in terms of attitudes, representations about elderly women, and how they have to or need to spend the remaining years of their lives. There is a huge caregiving burden uh, on women. And after six decades of uh, uh, having that kind of a burden, uh, there is a data uh, uh, by UN uh, gender snapshot 2022 report by UN women and it says that it is going to take 300 years to achieve full gender equality at the current rate where we are going. Now ageism also results into negativity. We know that old people are perceived according to their birth age and they are bracketed as old and unattractive. So when we think of uh, elderly women, there are stereotypes, uh, for example, a woman who is bichari, passive, kamzor, fragile with poor health, depression, uh, uh, unable to learn new things, cannot understand technology, a woman who is dependent, busy with rearing of grandchildren, doing household work, still into caregiving roles of maybe the children as well as grandchildren and is dependent. And many people also feel that uh, elderly women are more uh, incompetent and less active as compared to elderly men. Therefore, uh, when we look at the challenges uh, experienced by elderly women, we have psychological challenges, for example, loneliness, depression, and these are uh, risk factors for mental disorders. And depression in elderly women is, according to data, um, underdiagnosed. Uh, and the problems can also become more severe when uh, if the woman had been working and post her retirement, maybe there is some kind of a financial devaluation. There are also social challenges. For example, there is decline in social relationships. There is social isolation, abandonment, disregard, and people think they are useless. Domestic violence against uh, elderly women has increased, especially in the context of nuclearization of the families separation of private and uh, public spaces, increased individualism, and commodification of relationships. We are also looking at elderly sexual, elderly women sexual abuse, which nobody somehow wants to talk about. Of course, there are physiological challenges. Uh, decline of estrogen leads to various problems like osteoporosis, um, um, uh, decrease in strength, arthritis, and neurological and cognitive issues like dementia. And there is, as uh, uh, very rightly pointed out by my co-panelists, there is also a lot of burden and caregiving roles, in, whether in terms of household responsibilities, grandchildren care, widowhood, loss of partner. We also add to a lot of cultural factors, which increase the burden on elderly women. Now, when we talk about building structures, what can we do for uh, the mental well-being of elderly women? So among the uh, social factors, the first thing which I really want to point out is uh, mental strengthening. We say it's all in the mind. So many uh, women we know at the age of 60, uh, they feel that life is over and they feel like a 70-year-old or an 80-year-old woman. Uh, we find uh, more active men as compared to active women who are elderly. And ageism involves stereotyping, how we think about elderly women. It involves prejudice, how we feel about elderly, and the discrimination, how we act towards women who are elderly. And gender is a very important role. Uh, um, I know a woman who is 80 plus. She had been a housewife uh, all her life. And two years back, uh, her husband uh, expired. And life came to a standstill because all her life, she had never, ever been alone to a, a, a big market, to a bank, 
to to uh, maybe a government office she had never gone shopping alone except buying vegetables or fruits from a local person who comes near the uh, gate of her home she never she never had the confidence after her husband's passing to actually go alone and to think that she could actually uh, even buy basic things for her personal needs so mental training i think is the first thing that we need to build confidence and self esteem for a woman who is elderly and then thinking of self throughout their lives women are uh, socialized to worry to be in helping roles worrying about family slogging to make everybody happy so they need to be trained to relax and let others take charge and focus on self and focus on self care then life skill development focusing on self empowerment emotional intelligence proactive thinking and having that attitude of letting it go in a sensitive manner so that one can focus on oneself and have some kind of a me time now uh, we know especially in the urban areas the uh, support systems are dwindling and uh, we need to look at issues related to grief we need to look at bereavement issues and uh, encourage them to think of themselves as individuals with own identity and i know it's a very difficult thing to do especially when they have not thought of themselves as uh, individuals in their own right but probably that is where we need to start working with them then uh, being a part of uh, in terms of building social structures being a part of religious groups connecting with spirituality training them about mindfulness mean time being a part of senior <laughs> senior citizen associations rwas self help groups and uh, within the rwas also i think women's group must be promoted now uh, professor mala uh, kapoor shankar das very rightly pointed out meaningful engagements and uh, active involvement of elderly women in different activities so i think uh, activities like reading cooking grand parenting uh, uh, getting into social activities voluntary work listening to music watching a film reading gardening whatever makes them happy has to be encouraged and nurtured then learning new skills uh, whether it is driving whether it is drawing painting uh, playing a um, um, instrument uh, creative arts getting into social media uh, these i think are very important um, one of my research scholars her mother uh, retired two years back and she retired as a school teacher and uh, she is now learning from uh, my student and her sister about uh, how to make videos and she is uh, putting all her knowledge uh, into making youtube videos she has started recently her youtube channel and she says that all her life uh, she has worked for others taught children and now she says that i want to utilize my experience and i want to do what i want to do so at the age of uh, 62 or so she is now creating content and uploading it so i think these are some examples which we need to share and we need to uh, uh, disseminate among the wider people then healthy eating we know that uh, there is a lot of importance of nutritious balanced diet and in the context of women uh, eating together uh, with with friends with peer groups cooking together um, uh, um, uh, amidst stories amidst laughter sharing concerns maybe grief maybe happiness and i think these can add happy days happy months and happy years to their lives then um, importance of exercise whether it is yoga or stretching as per the bodily comfort of elderly women these i think can bring a lot of um, endorphins and release of happy hormones because exercise we know lifts mood and fights against depression and loneliness then connecting with family networks um uh, preventive networks now um, there are a lot of preventive camps being organized by organizations for example rajiv gandhi cancer institute and women i have seen that elderly women they don't want to even if there is a mobile uh, camp close by they don't want to go because they have never probably paid so much attention to their body especially reproductive organs of their uh, bodies so we need to encourage women to go for such camps and periodic health checkups mass media i think can play a very important role in highlighting the situation of elderly women and ngos like helpage and others they can actually um, work 
with social media and uh, uh, bring it at more accessible to them then um, dr kavita also spoke about intergenerational bonding i think which is very very important to be developed and promoted because if we can uh, have value based education to strengthen the intergenerational bonding this has to be incorporated in the school curriculum this has to come from the classroom discussions family familial discussions so that the bonding bit across generations can be developed and uh, we need to encourage women to um, be a part of the support groups in the communities we have to develop support services uh, for example helplines and daycare centers or the old age homes i think should be the last last resort but i think religious organizations whether whether it is temples or uh, churches or mosques they can be a involved in rebuilding of rebuilding the culture where we take care of the elderly women now in terms of the physical structures i strongly strongly feel that we need to have a uniform and centralized database we need to have a data portal for the elderly we have but it is not updated for example last week only i got a call from the election office and they said that uh, uh, we uh, should do you want uh, uh, us for the upcoming elections in may do you want us to uh, uh, take the uh, come to your home to take the voting from your mother and father and my mother passed in 2017 and my father you know uh, i mean <laughs> 2021 so the data even if it is there it is not updated and this data has to be centralized it has to be available we say that there are helplines 14567 how many people know about that there is a helpline we need centralized information centers we need centralized resource bases uh, which are available location wise for example facilities for health physiotherapy counseling police ambulance aids and appliances the hearing aids calipers sticks medicines legal support access to a lab test somebody wants to get an ultrasound done somebody wants to get mri done ecg legal help might be required so where where does a person go we pe people don't have information and women have usually we know lesser information now uh, we need open gyms and facilities for exercising and uh, in 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 all the locations we need green spaces for healthy living smoke and pollution free environments we need to have provision for mental health counseling we need to have capacity building centers for learning the usage of smartphones it ai which is available online we need to encourage women to overcome their hesitancy towards it i remember uh, some of the students were working could, with uh, helpage just meenuji if you could just sum up in uh, next one or two minutes sure sure thank you sure so at public spaces also we need infrastructure which is age friendly for example ramps lifts low floor buses cleaner toilets at household level also few measures are important to prevent the falls especially in the bathrooms and in the homes role of women police from the local police station i think beat constables can play a very important role then rwas contacts local emergency contacts need to be readily available safety concerns referral mechanisms for hospitals awareness and publicity about government schemes digitalization and digital literacy for example for life certificate if the woman is retired there are they say that you don't have to go but there are complex systems that need to be installed and gender perspective has to be built in across all the facilities and social workers i think have a very very important role and to conclude i will say that lives of older women they need to be celebrated and the aim is to provide aging women which is an environment which is conducive to their well-being through a life course approach and a human rights perspective we have to respect them as individuals with their own personal strengths and capabilities and with that i uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity thank you ma'am meenu anand ji uh, for a very uh, simplified way you have explained what is the mental health it is just not the absence of the disease and uh, how does the mental get affected with the psychological and social challenges and what alterations has to be made in these challenges 
and uh, i would like uh, to say that the most important you have said is about the mental training of the woman itself and the second thing is that uh, focus on the self care of herself that what she wants to do how she wants to achieve and maybe the encouragement by the policy makers her family members or any other persons who can encourage her and by the examples you have quoted that that was very nice and i don't think that there are any questions in the chat box anyone is interested can ask the question yes i but i wanted to uh, thank you uh, may i uh, dr sharda yes, yes. yes ma'am kavita yes surely so thank you um, professor anand for a very interesting uh, talk i really enjoyed your comments i wanted to agree with you that actually the the cognitive gap between uh, women and men as they grow older is also greater because of the differences different ways in which women have been treated um, across their life and i agree with you that women are socialized not to be able to um not to be not not to be able to perform you see there is uh, in the bengali they say ghare bahire the the domain of the domestic which is personal and intimate where women pr proliferate but bahar ka jo uh, the area which is outside is area which is sort of masculine so when you lose a partner like you said how is it that the woman can go between the inside spaces and the outside spaces so my question to you is um how do you in the third age of a woman when there is a loss of a partner and most data shows that that is when whether it is men or women they go into depression if they lose a partner at that age what is the kind of intervention you feel at that stage that can be done because it is very difficult when you've been socialized all your life to put yourself um you know we have a culture a little bit of the shravan kumar which is that uh, we must always look back on how devoted men were but i mean you know but actually lot of devoted women were there <laughs> looking after their parents also so there is a question of you know the burdens are even culturally we always feel that women are invisible so how can you make sure that women put themselves first i'm thinking you know thank you so much dr kavita i too loved your talk and um, um, your question i think is very very pertinent and i am afraid uh, there is no uh, 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 one uh, one answer because it's a very very difficult situation for a woman uh, in that kind of a situation and uh, i think uh, we need to give time to uh, women to heal uh, give them space first and foremost and uh, be somebody has to be there to take care especially in the first uh, i don't know whether it is 3 3 months or 2 months or 6 months and gradually gradually only i think the capacity building and with with lot of gentleness with lot of uh, care has to be uh, instilled because telling a 10 year old that oh you can do this and telling a 70 or 80 year old woman that you can do this i think these are two different uh, things so i think it's only gradually that uh, one can actually instill that kind of self confidence with loads and loads of care and positive reinforcements we are still struggling i mean that lady she is better off in 2 years now as compared to where she was but she is also struggling some days she feels good and confident other days she falls apart ma'am i would like to say that uh, rather than uh, starting when uh, at the time when it is needed we should train rather ourselves that this thing is going to happen some or the other person or the partner is going to be lost and we should start preparing ourselves before yes. uh, we reach to that then it is suddenly a uh, setback and then you have to have a lot of time to come back if you start preparing from the and thinking at accepting this reality that this is going to happen i think that should be uh, that also should be reinforced in the mind that's what i think I mean. there are some uh, projects even in chennai of the young old looking after the old old it prepares you for uh, if you're in your 50s and 60s as an as an as a middle woman at that age you are able to help someone who is older 
so like uh, like dr minakshi is saying then actually it prepares you also and it gives you satisfaction you have contributed so there is a connection between the young old and the old old because you can live through and predict what can happen so you have to prepare for it in advance i think that's a very valuable point to make you can't just arrive there and think now i am i have to be ready it is a it is a much longer thing to remember that in the third age you have to prepare for the fourth age that there is a continuity i agree with you it's a very valuable point to make yeah there's a there's a comment in the chat box by dr alka ganesh uh, ma'am would you like to say it yourself or should i just read it for you yeah if, what i wanted to say was that women as she said uh, kavita said they stay within their house that is their whole universe uh, whereas men have a much bigger universe uh, and they go to the local chai kade in south india you know and they meet other men and they probably talk about their wives or other things get away from their wives whereas women also do meet but maybe at the temple maybe somewhere else perhaps there need to be more organized spaces where women can share their um, ideas do their uh, as somebody was pointing out uh, dr mala in southeast asia they get together in the mornings and do their exercises and i've also seen that so uh, women can have you know sessions for cooking and this and that who is to do this is it uh, sociologists or is it community people themselves i think it has to be the community itself which has to evolve into that but with some help from uh, from people who are uh, you know wanting to foster this relationship uh, there is a i think mala wants to say something mala please go ahead uh, yeah thank you thank Not you that, uh, huh? professor shivani uh, yes, yeah, thank you uh, yeah uh, dr ganesha yeah i just wanted to share with you that uh, you know uh, some of the things i've noticed in rural areas of himachal and in uh, up is uh, you know while traveling to these areas find that uh, quite often especially in himachal i've seen women who are out in the fields or who are out with certain activities do find some time to sit together uh, in the meadows or in you know on the rocks over there or you know near the river bed and we find that they are sharing uh, certain aspects of household activities i've interviewed some women and i'm wondering what are they talking about and uh, they say we talk about children we talk about our uh issues related to you know uh, growing up because some of these villages uh, have men uh, less uh, population uh, men have moved away so it's only these women who are sitting there and i think uh, like i pointed out we need to really document a lot from a country which is such a diverse nation and has so many different kinds of practices so uh, there is uh, uh, some myths and some misconceptions also which need to be removed about aging and about uh, you know e even poor women i find that even when they are uh, you know uh, construction workers or something there are certain times when they just sit there and uh, chit chat and sort of it's and i uh, have asked them कि आप ऐसे बस बैठे हैं अभी कहती हैं हाँ कुछ तो आराम करना है और कुछ तो एक दूसरा का साथ होना चाहिए ना वो सो दैट कंपेनियनशिप विद दे गेन इवन फॉर फ्यू मिनट्स एक्चुअली कंट्रीब्यूट्स टू दे वेल बीइंग सो वी आल्सो नीड टू डू मोर रिसर्च ऑन व्हाट वेल बीइंग मींस व्हाट काइंड ऑफ मेंटल हेल्थ the uh, well being stands for these people what kind of practices they adopt in their day to day activities to maintain that the resilience of women have to be more captured and seen so i think this is a broad field which needs much more research and i'm glad emphasis is coming on uh, uh, paying attention to some of these aspects thank you uh, i think shivani uh, you have something to say Okay. Okay. Unmute. Unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah. So, um, a woman doesn't become old overnight, you know. So there are things that have to start on much more earlier 
to come out of the house, as we are saying. Men have come out of the ho- house very early in life without uh, uh, barriers. And women have uh, go- uh, lived with barriers and then they've made further barriers for themselves. Uh, so uh, this is what needs to be uh, understood when you when uh, Alka Ji is saying that the community must for- come forward. It is the uh, change of gender roles very early on in life to take on more social roles, to take on more economic roles. And the younger generation is now understanding that. Our generation of women uh, took on roles without questioning. But chartering on new roles and then uh, taking charge of governance, taking charge of other things, uh, uh, ensures that you move away from the patriarchal control of resources. Uh, So that's the key to it, to say, how do you uh, claim your uh, city, your space, your space, not just in your own household, your village, your neighborhood, your country, the world. So um, many of us have done that and found ourselves uh, different from the earlier stereotypes. So um, uh, that's, that's the thing to do now, to say, not just become a woman, man, or a trans, but be the human being which can contribute. And that goes to a wellness uh, uh, staircase uh, by and by. There is a lot of interesting research evidence coming from Uttarakhand, where they are actually looking at how women are, as Professor Shankar Das was saying, how women are chatting and laughing together, sharing about the day-to-day concerns, and how actually it is leading towards catharsis and how it is actually uh, preventing them uh, from becoming uh, mentally, uh, uh, you know, having a, a, a mental disorders. So Uttarakhand is actually coming up with a lot of qualitative uh, evidence on this. I can share uh, those research studies if anybody is interested. Okay, now over to, I think, uh, Madam Ghazala. Uh, for the now we have a poll speaker. question before we go into the next Okay, okay, session. there is a poll question. Okay. We have Professor Dipti after this, but we'll have we'll have a question first. Ma'am, it is unfair. We should also participate. Your views are known. Your views are you can share them with me privately. Yes. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Everyone agrees, I think. Let's see. I am here. Let just come back. Baba, very good. Strongly disagree. See, there is there is somebody who strongly disagrees also. Somewhat Somewhat agrees. disagrees. What is really to be seen? Why? <laughs> you must be so, giving good nutrition to so these are the, the the marginal cases, but normally it's like an overwhelming response. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now we'll uh, move to the next speaker. Madam Ghazala, to take over, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Talo. CV. CV. Where is it? So now we have Dr. Deepti Anil. He's a practice, practicing nutritionist. She's a lecturer in food and nutrition and program officer with the Sophia Center for Women's Studies and Development, Mumbai, for the last two decades. She has completed her master's in food and nutrition from Mumbai University and a PG diploma in public health nutrition from IIPH, New Delhi. Ms. Anil is also a trained yoga teacher and therapist since 2005. So looking forward to listening to Dr. Deepti because we just had a question on nutrition. So she can throw more light. Over to you, Dr. Deepti. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, a very... uh... Greetings to the esteemed chair, co-chair and my extremely experienced panelists. I'm very grateful to be here and I thank Ms. Datta for this invitation. Uh, to I think you kind of set stage for what was what I was to speak in terms of uh, lifespan nutrition and how it affects the older woman. Uh, as we all here agree that aging is not a disease and nor are the so-called diseases of aging the ine- inevitable consequence of advancing years. With increasing longevity, the proportion and number of persons in the age group of 60 years and beyond is increasing, with uh, women outnumbering men. The physiological changes that occur with aging uh, contribute to the body's declining function, which in 
turn influences the nutritional status of the women. A, a life course approach to nutrition for older women in India involves considering the various factors that influence their nutritional status over the course of their lives. Now, this approach recognizes that nutrition-related factors during different life stages can have a long-term implication on the health and well-being of the older woman in her later years. Now, one such approach that can be applied to older women in India is, of course, early life nutrition, uh, nutritional status that is during infancy, childhood and adolescence can impact health outcomes later in life. And very rightly, we were speaking uh, during the course of these discussions about uh, intrafamilial distribution of food that is highly gender based. So ensuring access to adequate nutrition. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. You can yes. please switch on your video so that. Ma'am, I'm sorry. I just spoke to Anupama, ma'am. I'm having some technical. Okay, okay, okay. Laptop. No issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for understanding. I'm sorry for this. Um, Ensuring access to adequate nutrition, promoting breastfeeding and addressing malnutrition during these critical periods can contribute to better health outcomes for the older woman. Of course, following that is the reproductive years and nutritional needs during the reproductive years, including pregnancy and lactation, are crucial not just for maternal and child health, but providing access to prenatal, postnatal care, nutritional supplementation and education, about healthy eating habits during these stages too can have long-lasting effects on women's health as they age. Now, like we, we did speak about the fact that women don't age overnight. And as women age, hormonal changes, lifestyle factors and dietary habits definitely influence their nutritional needs. So promoting a balanced diet rich in essential nutrients, encouraging uh, physical activity and addressing any specific health concerns or conditions which are common in midlife, such as menopause related issues or chronic diseases are important considerations for the midlife uh, nutrition age. The elderly in, in the older age, nutritional requirements change due to factors such as decreased metabolism, uh, changes in appetite, we have dental issues, chronic health conditions, um, immune system changes, and also depression, which uh, cause changes in the food choices. And therefore, it is essential to focus on nutrient-dense foods, address issues related to food accessibility and affordability, and provide nutrition education tailored to the needs of the older woman. Uh, in addition to this, of course, there will be speakers who will focus more on this, but as far as food choices also go, we have socioeconomic and cultural factors which uh, access to healthcare services, again playing significant roles in shaping nutritional patterns throughout a woman's life. Interventions uh, should consider these factors to ensure that they are culturally appropriate and address barriers to accessing nutritious food. Community support and empowerment. So building community support networks and empowering older women to take charge of their health through nutrition education, cooking demonstrations and peer support groups can enhance effectiveness of interventions aimed at improving nutritional outcomes. Uh, at Sophia College, we also have our Sophia College Ex-Students Association, largely comprising of older women. And uh, we have a very... Uh, we have like a community support network wherein we meet twice a month to discuss health concerns via nutrition or try and practice uh, some form of exercise which would address the physical and the physiological needs of this older population. A common uh, problem that one does see in older women is malnutrition. And malnutrition, especially talking of undernutrition in older women, is a problem public health problem in India. And um, malnutrition is often due to several factors, including inadequate food intake, uninformed food choices that lead to dietary deficiencies and illnesses that cause increased nutrient requirements, increased nutrient loss, poor nutrient absorption, or a combination of all these factors. So nutritional inadequacy in the older woman can be a result of several factors, which include physiological, pathological, sociological, as well as psychological factors. Now coming um, 
as the esteemed speakers before me have rightly mentioned, uh, that have shared the vulnerabilities of this age group. The public health policies regarding nutrition for older women in India uh, have been evolving to address the specific needs of this demographic group. However, there are still several lacunae or gaps, I would say, in these policies and improvements are needed more deliberation, more policy making, agenda setting to ensure the well being of older women. Now, in the current landscape, if I were to discuss the, the three policies that do deal with older women, include the national policy for older persons uh, formulated by the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, which outlines various welfare measures for older people. Uh, including provisions for healthcare, nutrition, and social security. However, specific nutritional guidelines targeting older women are very limited in, these pol in this policy. We also have the ICDS or the Integrated Child Development Services, which is implemented by the Ministry of Women and Child Development, again, aiming to improve the nutritional status of women through the provision of supplementary nutrition and nutrition education. Uh, the coverage here again of older women is very limited. Now I'm just dealing with the nutrition linked policy. So we also uh, come across this policy called the National Program for Health Care of the Elderly. Uh, again, it aims to provide comprehensive health care services to the elderly, but specific guidelines tailored to older women are not prom are not prominent. So if I were to uh, markedly point out the lacune uh, in current policies, there is extremely limited focus on older women and um, there is a broader focus on older persons in general with less emphasis on the unique nutritional needs of faced by older women. So gender specific considerations related to menopause, osteoporosis, iron deficiency are not adequately addressed. There is a lack of nutritional guidelines, no comprehensive nutritional guidelines. Uh, considering factors such as the hormonal changes an older woman undergoes, decreased metabolism and age-related health conditions. So this gap leads to an uncertainty, I guess, among healthcare providers and older women uh, regarding themselves and what their optimal dietary recommendations should be. Uh, there is also the limited accessibility and affordability uh, I would say um, access to nutritious food, especially for older women from marginalized communities or rural areas, remains a challenge due to factors such as limited availability of diverse foods, economic resources, a lack of awareness about balanced diets, and um, public health programs often struggle to reach these vulnerable populations effectively. Uh, there is therefore a need for enhanced nutrition programs targeting older women to promote awareness about healthy eating habits, portion control, dietary diversity, and the importance of micronutrients which enhances wellness as they uh, in the advancing years. Also to provide practical guidance on meal planning and cooking techniques which can therefore empower an older woman to make informed uh, dietary choices. Uh, to develop specific nutritional, gender specific nutritional guidelines, uh, I think there should be a collaboration between policymakers uh, along with nutrition experts to develop evidence based nutritional guidelines specifically tailored to the needs of the older women. Uh, guidelines should, of course, address the age related physiological changes and dietary strategies to prevent and manage chronic diseases prevalent in this demographic uh, group. Enhance also food security initiatives because efforts to improve food security among older women have to prioritize measures to enhance accessibility, affordability and availability of nutritious food. Uh, this may include uh, providing subsidies for nutrient rich foods or promoting home gardening uh, for fresh produce, strengthening social safety nets to support the vulnerable older women. Uh, and promoting lifelong nutrition education. Um, these programs should utilize culturally appropriate communication channels, peer support networks, and innovative teaching methods to impart nutrition knowledge and skills 
effectively. Uh, one also suggests conduct research and monitoring that is invest in research initiatives to better understand the nutritional status, dietary pattern and health outcomes of older women in diverse socio-cultural contexts across India and uh, regular monitoring and evaluation of public health interventions are essential to identify gaps, assess impact and inform evidence-based policy decisions. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to say that while public health policies in India have made uh, tremendous strides in addressing the nutritional needs of older persons, there is still a pressing need to prioritize older women's specific requirements and overcome uh, the existing gaps and lacunae through targeted interventions, um, policy reforms, and probably a concerted multi-sectoral effort by integrating gender-sensitive uh, nutrition strategies into public health agendas and fostering community empowerment, we can, I guess, together work towards ensuring better health and well-being for the older women. Thank you, and I'd be open to any questions that the panel has. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Deepthi. Uh, it was really a very interesting this thing because somewhere you echoed what I was about to say. You're correct that you know um, the while the while everything has been laid out. I mean the policy programs, everything concerns only senior citizens. That is why I was talk when I was talking to um, uh, uh, the previous speakers, and I was that's why I told her that yes, it is it is true that it should be a continuum, but then there has to be specific provision for elderly elderly women. So while there are policies and programs for senior citizens, and I, I just want to tell you that there is a portion of Abhiyan for zero to six children also, and there is a portion uh, Abhiyan for senior citizens also. It has been launched in 2021. But as always, it there is nothing, you know, there's no something, not something very specific and uh, this thing for elderly women. And that is a very important point that you have raised. And that is, I think, the whole crux of today's, uh, I mean, our seminar is this only that while of course, interventions are there, everything is there, policy and programs are in place, but there is no focused intervention as far as elderly women are concerned. There is only one provision which says that you can set up an old age home of 50 elderly women. That is the only thing that is, you know, that is elderly women specific. Otherwise, really, there is, a, I mean, maybe they it was thought that it is better if you put senior citizens, but now the time has come because of the of the problem and the magnitude of the problem that we now should seek segmentation of this of this cohort and say that okay let us do something specific and focus for elderly women so thank you very much and it was really nice huh? and there are two questions i think we you will uh, please kindly have a look and oh yeah uh, dr alka ganesh please if you could just go ahead yeah i've asked uh, deepthi a very difficult question as to what is the <laughs> reason why nni hyderabad has not put out, even for the, yeah. because uh, I looked at this uh, some time ago when I was preparing for nutrition uh, talk, and I found that what NNI has put out, even for right. senior citizens, is totally inadequate. There is no mention of women, of course, but what I would like us, uh, us when I say as a medical community, nutritionist community, etc., yeah. to look into our indigenous foods. See, we are a vegetarian society we are not going to become non-vegetarian because we need protein and we need vegetarian sources of protein and the whole world is now becoming plant-based diet. Older women and older people in general need protein, they need calcium. And what are the indigenous foods? For example, you look at amla. Uh, it is like full of calcium. It is full of so many things. The Ayurvedic people know this. Why is it that other people don't know it? Ayurveda is lacking. I mean, I, I'm sorry to sound so judgmental, but they are doing research, but not enough. You see, they have so many foods. And, uh, you know, I just think that uh, prob probably, Professor Deepthi, you can take this up as your life course. I, I noticed that you're a very young person. <laughs> and your <laughs> life's thing about uh, women and diet, older women and diet, and of course, uh, uh, senior citizens in general. And look at indigenous foods. Thank you so much, ma'am. I will keep it in mind. And you're right. Uh, even when we did look at NI and Hyderabad, the resources regarding older women and diet are uh, very limited. It, I think they put it all under older people, not mm. so much older women. So diet specific or nutrition specific concerns of older women are 
are very rarely mentioned even in papers like I was looking through a review in the Journal of Clinical Medicine in 2023 um, where Mattioli et al. have looked at papers from all over the world and they still say that um, studies in older women are limited though they will tell us things like good nutrition and regular physical activity are milestones for counteracting the effects of aging. They do not have essential studies in older women all over the world. And I think you're right. Maybe I should take this up as my <laughs> life study. Thank you yeah, so much. Good. I yeah. will. Thanks, Adipti. And I think I have a question and a comment. I'll be very happy to work with you uh, for the rest of your life on this subject because it's very close to my heart, I think, because it's very important for healthy uh, aging. You know, it's very important. Uh, the concerns that Dr. Gangane shared, like, you know, calcium, for example. And how little things can be done. And if you look at the, uh, you know, the agenda that the government and the other agencies have for uh, reproductive age women, you know, they're very mm -hmm. careful. They go and tell them what to eat locally also. Like, you know, there are those uh, volunteers in the village who go and counsel the women in village what you should eat in your uh, prenatal and postnatal you know, stages. But nothing like that for the elderly women. So that's my biggest grouse uh, with everybody. Uh, but I, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that if you look at the LASI data, uh, 45 plus, when we look at 45 plus uh, elderly, we find that 15% are underweight. But when we go up to 60, then it's 25%. Mm -hmm. So we, people, when they age, they're actually becoming, uh, more people are becoming underweight. But if you look at obesity and overweight, uh, it's 25% in 45 plus category and 18% in 60% category. And obesity is declining from 12% to 8% in that same cohort. So uh, when we are looking at healthy aging and life course approach, uh, do you think that we should start early and look at 45 plus and say that because you have overweight and you are more obese, uh, we don't want you to go that way further. So uh, like, how do you, how do you, how do you think we can tackle this situation? So you uh, interventions for aging, like uh, rightly mentioned by people I think should start early on because uh, eventually when you do reach that certain age and then you find out that you know you have these essential problems. So I guess uh, nutrition, education and community-based intervention should start much early. So 45 or even I would say 35 plus is a good time to start thinking about this. And like I said, malnutrition covers both ends of the spectrum. While here we are looking at undernutrition as a problem in aging. Uh, we are also, we are, I, I did not speak about the overnutrition problem of aging. So depend, it's, it's very uh, area specific. When we look at rural areas, we find malnutrition uh, evidenced as undernutrition, whereas in the urban areas, it is the other end of the spectrum. So I think you need to have area-based interventions depending on the population there. That's, that's my uh, understanding. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Thank you. I think we'll go forward, uh, Dr. Manakshi. So, uh... okay, ma'am. Uh, now, for the next session after the nutrition, uh, we have a very interesting session by Dr. Shivani Bhardwaj. I'm sorry, ma'am, I could not understand what is this OD. So, I'll just read it. You will please uh, let me know what it is OD. Organization and... Development. Okay, okay. Organization Development and Development Sector HR Expert and who has founded NGOs like Sati that all for partnership that is SAFP. Pravaha, Nirmana and Network such as National Alliance for Labor Rights. A consult for Women and Land Rights and India Alliance for Child Rights and has been awarded by the Niti Ayo Ministry of Donor for her very social enterprise that sustainable developmental development zone in each neighborhood for equal access to space, services to coexist in collaborative peace. Her work on mental wellness links support groups to induce training curriculums on behavior change. And she has authored publications on training old adults youth development, child rights, and on gender resource gap. She consults to fund work on to increase resource base of the vulnerable. Her assignments worldwide, gender-based violence, 
safeguarding and human resource development, deepen child rights, human rights and workers concerns. He is uh, in the steering committee member of the World Urban Campaign and Gender Equality Action Plan of the UN Habitat. He is also on the board of NGOs such as Ank Ankur and Nirmana she, as a member. And she is also the member of the startups like Green Assets, Love Your Neighborhood Campaign. Uh, very new things uh, I have read in this. I think uh, may this will be reflected in your talk. What the work you have done, really very admiring. And she'll be speaking on feminist analysis of resilience among older adult women in privately managed institutions. And probably she will tell us the uh, very interesting stories from Delhi and Dehradun related to this aspect. So I welcome you, ma'am. I'm very excited to listen to you, Shivani. Please. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, greetings and salams from Satyon for Partnerships. Uh, this is a trust that uh, the co-author Dr. Sudesh Narawai and I are part of, and we worked for over two decades on how to address the gender resource gap in policy and practice. I'm really thankful to Helpage and all people present here who are very learned, and I offer to work together to change self for our own functionality uh, in younger years and our older years. Uh, as uh, mentioned by the previous speaker, area-based interventions are really required. But these area-based interventions need people and they need a woman to lead the change that we want to make. And the paper that uh, I have uh, written very hurriedly uh, is Feminist Analysis of Resilience Among Older Women. Uh, in privately managed institutions has uh, about eight to nine case stories of women who have chosen to live in institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I have chosen uh, uh, these stories as these are my very close friends mm -hmm. who have uh, um, uh, bought uh, um, uh, senior care living in uh, Ashiana Bhivadi. Uh, in uh, Bhagavad Dham, which is in Mayur Bihar in Delhi, uh, in senior uh, uh, citizens complex in Dehradun, and in Antara uh, senior living uh, facility. Uh, the stories uh, give a changing understanding and visualization of aging women in institutions other than patriarchal family which is what I earlier uh, also said, that uh, people need to come out of the um, cage, mm -hmm. cages of what family is offering. Vasudeva uh, Kutambakam has to be uh, 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 not just a narrative, but a reality for uh, um, this, this community that uh, has peace and it has uh, uh, a giving. So the paper narrates stories of women who have used time, resources, assets, money, uh, to channelize into a future planning of living. These stories have a commonality that shows that senior living institution is an alternative to patriarchal controlled family wealth that does not provide women independent choices to uh, use their talents, to use their inherent uh, uh, fac uh, faculties for uh, contributing to uh, larger causes uh, rather than just family. I will give the case of my friend uh, Sanjana, uh, who even at the age of uh, 30 uh, or 35 bought a flat in Ashiana, even mm -hmm. though she knew that she couldn't um, live there, she planned for it uh, very early in life, which yeah. is what I said, that uh, you have to uh, look at your age, uh, uh, age and aging uh, much before you come to that age. So at 60 today, I uh, look at how my friends have planned for it uh, for a long time. So Sanjana uh, knew that she could inherit a lot from her father, but the father said that she, he'll give all his property to her brother. Um, so she planned her old age very much in advance. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the brother um, passed away. And willy-nilly, uh, she became the owner of all the property that she could gain uh, from her father. And then she used all this 
to uh, give to charities like uh, World Wildlife Fund, to environmental work and so on and so forth. And then she, when her ripe age came to stay in Ashiana, she stayed there and uh, changed a lot of uh, uh, work, uh, water, uh, gardening, uh, and so many, so many things that she was interested in uh, within Ashiana Bhivari. Um, and now after her father has passed away, she has chosen to uh, be in the Himalayas where her father had a cottage. So here is a case story of a woman who um, chose her resources and planned to be her own uh, uh, resourced uh, person very early in life. And today at 65 or 62, she is a citizen of another country as well as of her own country. And she flits between two places. So um, this is just an extreme uh, case of... Uh, a, a person who has uh, changed her life according to what uh, she uh, and and also her husband have uh, have made their life to be. Uh, this will be in direct contrast to uh, Mrs. Uh, Tony that I have uh, mentioned in the paper, who uh, had a mentally ill son, and when she became widowed, she had a flat in Lajpat Nagar a three-story flat, which she sold and divided it among the children. And then she went to the Bhagavad Dham uh, uh, place, uh, which, which was really a lower middle class uh, senior living, to uh, be equally available for uh, her daughter, her son, as well as her the, the, the son who's mentally ill. Uh, after maybe 10, 15 years of living uh, a very active life, and she also was a member of our uh, Love Your Neighborhood campaign in Mayur Vihar, um, she now has uh, aged and she started limping. She cannot hear, maybe a little bit of Alzheimer's. It is now that her son and her granddaughter visit her very regularly and they've now given her a assisted uh, assistance, uh, a paid assistance. And when the paid assistant doesn't come, then um, uh, the son or the granddaughter or the daughter-in-law come in. Uh, but she chose very early in life to use uh, her resources the way she wanted to and shift into uh, something that was uh, not patriarchal, somewhere where she could uh, call the shots and she could reorganize her life to look at her responsibilities. So women in these uh, senior care institutions uh, are looking after their responsibility, but they have a very special relationship to them, their own selves. And this is what is the change that uh, we all are talking towards in this age of digitization and isolation, that uh, our relationship to ourself determines what we want to do with our lives. Um, and uh, this is where the feminist analysis comes in, where uh, uh, Sudeshna and I are working on this theory of uh, uh, feminist uh, uh, interlinking of resources, resilience and relationships. The case stories that we presented in this paper um, are uh, of those women who uh, have cracked this puzzle to make these three circles into a bigger, huge circle. The case of uh, uh, Fozia, who was my boss, uh, who had spent her very illustrious life in Unifem. Uh, the names have changed, but perhaps some of you may know her by the story that I'm going to tell. Um, she chose a marriage which, uh, uh, which was uh, cross-country. Her husband uh, was not even living with her. And we in the, um, in the office, uh, when we worked with her, uh, we were in uh, direct relationship with uh, with this uh, husband of hers, which was across the country, because every day he knew what was happening in the office, and every day he knew like what even each staff member would uh, would uh, need in terms of support that Fozia could give or he could give through Fozia. So that was the kind of relationship uh, network uh, Fozia was able to uh, uh, put forth. And that's the kind of relationship I am saying that each one of us can um, channel while we are young. Um, what does this really do? It gives us uh, resilience that um, uh, Madam Anand talked about. It gives us mental strength and gi it gives us opportunity to look beyond our own limitations, to look beyond the limitation of a family, to look beyond the limitation of just our area and our country. 
um, uh, these give us relationships to then uh, bank upon. So why women have really chosen uh, institutionalized living instead of family and they've planned for it for so long is because of a very deep uh, feminist value that they've understood early on in life. These older uh, women uh, took time to become upwardly mobile, to become a higher middle class uh, to by bettering economic environment. These days, I uh, spend a lot of time every morning I spend at Ashiana because I'm a club member, uh, not, uh, not Ashiana, Antara in Deradun. And I see uh, women who uh, even at 84 are buying and selling property, uh, which is which was really not a role for women for some, some time. They have taken on a role that men were comfortable with. So there is a social change that has come up. And uh, now... I don't see ageism with these women. I see ableism, which is what people have been talking about. So I'll end my presentation here. There are very interesting stories of uh, women uh, uh, taking on uh, uh, the role of uh, being the head of RWA. There was a woman committee in, woman, uh, in the Masuri Senior Living Complex. Uh, and uh, when they uh, gave power to the men committee, they were they were questioning, and then they even went to the DM to say, please uh, ask them to step down because they are not working well enough, and we want to take over the charge. So this struggle is still going on. And when uh, in another senior living facility, the yoga instructor who was a young woman who was being harassed sexually harassed by the by the manager. Uh, they uh, took it, took it upon themselves to uh, oust the manager, and at that time the senior living uh, facility were totally polarized between women and men. Uh, men were siding the manager, and the woman was siding the young yoga instructor. But the case came to the fruition, and uh, even when um, no. this person uh, was thrown no. out, no. yoga manager was not. Uh, the yoga you. girl was not you in the job. Madam. Mm, uh, there was a sense of solidarity among women to uh, mm, uh, be together. So um, I'll stop at that because I feel being active and being uh, conscious of your own resource base is what will make the difference. And this is what we, sh we should all work towards. It's not only just policy, it is how we change our own lives and how we became uh, uh, leaders of creating safe spaces for everybody that we will make a difference in. Uh, the peaceful world that we want. Thank you so much. That was very wonderful mm -hmm. to hear about the stories. Your story is really interesting. Uh, what to comment on them. Uh, a big salute to both of your these friends. I think mm -hmm. they have gone uh, beyond the stream and out of the stream also. So anyone would like to comment, please? Any questions, any suggestions, any comments? Uh, I have a quick question uh, because there's nothing in the chat box yet. Uh, Shivani, uh, if you could just reflect a little bit on, uh, do you think that it's uh, in institutions, the atmosphere is more conducive to women playing that role rather than if they were living in any housing society or generally in you know like in communities do you think you have you noticed that difference or... yes the difference is that in the institutions your um, plumbing your uh, daily garbage picking and all that is taken really care of you can even uh, go to the canteen and have your morning tea and not cook if you choose not to um, so when you're freed of these uh, daily living activities you can look towards being higher in the Maslow law uh, um, uh, ladder. And that's what these women did. That uh, in institutions, the gender role of caring, nurturing, etc., they could pay for. Or if you're not in a very um, high-flying institution, uh, that can be a rotational responsibility. And then they, you can be freed of uh, doing uh, routine to then look at uh, your social actualization. Dr. Shivani, you know, the, uh, the, the examples that you've saw, uh, you've given are all those very high end, uh, you know, places where people who have a lot of uh, financially secure can, uh, can, uh, you know, go and live there, and they are better managed. But we have come across many places where which are less 
less endowed and little middle class where you know there's a problem with, where women are not uh, you know so welcome where there is a problem with the administration you know in fact i had to appear before the madras high court in one case and um, and they said you know they had stopped giving food to these people there was some little skirmish oh, yeah, and yourself. Stopped. so justice sanjay call call was the this thing and he made me come and you know kind of be present there after that we have actually we have amended uh, we put an amendment into the maintenance of pa- uh, parents and be- welfare of, and senior citizens act and we we put in a this thing regulating these homes and also uh, you know trying to make them come under the uh, some legal purview so that that also has to be and, and you know this is for the rural and the unorganized sector this is really not an option we have we have very very uh, from the ministry side which we support we have these old age homes but they are very 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 basic and nominal so we you know we i think attitudes are very different uh, attitudes are different and we need to now find a a place for the for the you know really vulnerable elderly you know how do we accommodate them in this continuum because uh, people like you and me can afford this we can go to antara and live in all those places there also it's quite very expensive but about i mean how do we handle oh, this sorry. the common women the the people who are on the margins you know how do we handle that issue um uh, i have uh, all my career worked with uh, uh, people from marginalized sections and uh, i have found that uh, they uh, work very hard to change their present uh but planning for the future is not uh, an option because the present itself is in dire states and that's the point of uh, the presentation uh, yes it is a higher class but in bhagavad dham there are not higher class people i've taken uh, there is also a dormitory uh, where people are there who are who languish uh, but this choice can be made even for a person who is on the hari uh to say uh, will everything be spent on uh, today's needs or do i make a collective do i then uh, break out of my silo and uh, also relate to uh, people who are even more vulnerable than me or who are less vulnerable than me and organize ourselves so uh, in many poorer areas people have organized and uh, taken cogn- cognizance of one problem if you did take cognizance of your old age and you worked from it uh, from a very early stage uh, things would be different so this is just to take learnings from uh, the the haves to apply to have nots so uh, when you reach it's not the time when you reach the the institution the work has to happen uh, with a cohorts who are aged uh, 35 and 40 which is what sanjana did when her father denied her inheritance so she planned for it when she was 30 she planned for it it was only when she became 50 that her brother died and then she uh, started looking at her father and her father has just died about 3 uh, or year, 2 years ago so she got all this property when she was 65 so uh, what sanjana did anybody in the rural area can also do to then plan to be economically viable and to be socially relevant and to be uh, uh, active in governance to be active to make uh, make your own you know, social and economic networks but the fact is that you must know how to utilize your resources in a way that you pl- plan long term so that can be uh, an individual choice and it can also be a policy choice in the absence of not having the social security uh, totally laid out by the government uh, we have pensions we have to uh, we have uh, uh, the whole focus on the immediate right now aishman card hai ye hai wo hai sab kuch abhi ke liye gas bhi abhi ke liye to humko ek lambe taur ki ek planning chahiye जिसमें हम देख सके कि एट द एज ऑफ फोर्टी व्हाट कैन वी प्लान फॉर द एज ऑफ एट्टी नॉट द गवर्नमेंट पेंशन बट आवर सेल्स विद आवर रियालिटीज थैंक यू डॉक्टर मीनाक्षी यू वांट टू से समथिंग नो नो आई जस्ट वांट टू टू मैडम गजाला 
at that I had been visiting various old age homes here also, which are government funded. And uh, as Madam Shivani has said, they though uh, they are from the uh, lower socioeconomic status, the females and especially the females, they have uh, they have, have I have observed that they become very socially active there in the groups of their old ladies. They will have a um, bhajan, kirtan, koi uh, dafli bajata hai, koi gana gata hai. So at least that networking can be there. Economic development, that is different uh, issue because out, because majburi thi wo isle wo log wohan aate hai. But then finally I think they feel happy among the group of, same group of the ladies there. That was my observation. Or they enjoy with each other. Wo ek cheej hoti hai. But this is something, Sanjana's story was something different. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we'll have a last poll for the afternoon. Uh, and then we'll, okay. then we'll request Dr. Alka Ganesh to say. Okay, there is a poll question. Yeah, just final poll question. Okay. Guys, strongly disagree with this. Any part of my light bulb company, I have less access to healthy services compared. So, Dr. Ganesh, I think you have you have every like-minded people on the uh, in the call. <laughs> so we'll we'll just um, request Dr. Dr. Ghazala to please take it forward. Okay, <clears throat> for the last uh, last speaker of this session, we have Dr. Alka Ganesh, who's an MBBS from CMC Bellur. She's an MD in Internal Medicine from Delhi University. Faculty and HOD Department of Medicine, Bellur from 1978 to 2008. Registrar Department of Metabolic Medicine in 1981. And she's undergone geriatric medicine training, Newcastle on Tyne in UK. She's a visiting professor at the University of Malaysia at Sarawak from 1999 to 2000. And full time at the GKNMH Coimbatore Geriatric Consultant, teaching DNB Medicine and course director. Physician Assistant Degree Course from 2010 to 2022. She is currently semi-retired, teaching online. And she started the Medical Education Unit at CMC in 2004. The Family Medicine Department at CMC Wellore in 2008. And is a recipient of the Distinguished Teacher Award, NBE, in 2014. So with these excellent credentials, we look forward to Dr. Alka Ganesh, uh, her presentation. Over to you, Dr. Ganesh. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, if I may be permitted to share my screen, can I do so? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So thank you again, uh, Anupama, for inviting me. Uh, it's very rare for medical people to have the privilege of talking to non-medical people. <laughs> Today, it has been such a bonanza because being a feminist, along with Dr. Minakshi Sharda, whom I know well, uh, we uh, rarely get to express our views in a fairly male-dominated uh, kind of profession, though women are at the forefront in medicine. So. 
how do my topic today is what changes are needed in the healthcare system if we have to improve the healthcare of older women so why are these changes needed so the answers have already been given in many of the previous talks feminization of old age so there is a larger number of old people uh, women um, gender specific clinical problems and then the societal problems for older so i'll run through this because just to show why we have a feminization of old age because life expectancy of the woman at birth is more at least three years more than the men and people have wondered why that is so and not quite sure but certainly estrogens do protect you in the premenopausal period at least from heart disease and many others and they feel that the immune system in the woman is much better women are not so liable to use toxins like alcohol and smoking which is not uh, throughout is not true but it is true that women comprise 55 percent of the elderly in india and many of them much more of them are single and widowed as compared to the men but having said that the longevity of women is not associated with good health they are old and they are in very poor health so we need to have separate or different ways of addressing health problems of the elderly. The societal perceptions of widowed woman is a disadvantage. All this has been talked about and mental health. So I won't deal with that much. So mainly I will deal with the medical issues. So in the medical issues, I've just divided it into the gender neutral health problems. When I say gender neutral, it's my own coinage. It's, it's the comorbidities and diseases which are common to men and women. So like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, these are common. Women have a different set of cancers as well, but they can have any other cancers as well. So these gender neutral problems are uh, in women also. They need to be addressed as we are dealing with uh, them in other older men, except to say that it, when it comes to heart disease, premenopausal women have less heart disease. But the moment they become menopausal and lose their estrogen, they tend to have an accelerated form of cardiovascular disease, specifically if they're diabetic. And as you know, we are the diabetes capital of the world. So we have a large number of older women who are diabetic, not having heart disease when they're young. Or when if they're diabetic, of course, they do have heart disease also. But when they go to menopause, their heart disease becomes worse. And there's not enough research into the management of heart disease in women because it has not been a problem for many decades. So most of the drugs and the methods of treatment are ideally suited for men. And now there is a renewed interest in are these same treatments all right for women? But let me go on to the main issue, which is the gender-specific health problems, which is the menopause, the genital urinary symptoms, osteoporosis, mental health. And this is something which comes to every woman as if she ages. So the menopause, hot flashes, changes in the skin, changes in the hair, insomnia, weight gain, depression. These are all the somatic symptoms or bodily symptoms of menopause, as well as the mental symptoms. I've only put depression, but anxiety and a lot of other mental health issues also come into uh, at the time of the menopause. And men, natural menopause is a natural process and it is slow. It doesn't happen suddenly one day. There is a premenopausal period in which the periods are irregular and some of these changes are coming on. Uh, but the time when a woman has her last period and in one year, the next year has no more periods, then we call that as a menopause. And at this time, early menopause, many women begin to feel very uncomfortable, especially with the hot flashes and then they can't sleep. And then not being able to sleep is not recognized as part of the menopause. Then feeling depressed and having a whole lot of other symptoms is not recognized as due to menopause by the medical profession, either the gynecologist or the non-gynecologist, perhaps the psychiatrist, yes. So we need to look at this and recognize that the menopause is an important thing, even though it's a natural process. Then apart from these, the specific uh, genitourinary, the, the vagina, the bladder, all these things are very, very troublesome to women. 
And POP is pelvic organ prolapse, urinary incontinence, the vagina, because of the lack of estrogen, wall becomes very thin and creates a lot of problems, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then there is this other issue of loss of libido. Whereas this woman's partner or husband, uh, because men continue to have the sexual drive for many years after that, even though they do have something known as andropause, in which the testosterone levels come down, but that happens much later. So the man has a different sexual drive. The woman uh, does not. And that leads to a lot of problems within the marriage. When it comes to cancers, women have cancers of the reproductive system, cervix, vulva, uterus, breast, which uh, we won't be talking much about today. But this is another issue which the government and uh, the oncologists have taken a lot of interest in. And there's a lot of uh, public health screening for these cancers because especially cancer of the cervix, etc., takes is and breast now take the lives of many women prematurely. And cervix cancer, of course, is a is a game changer now because we know that it can be prevented with vaccinations for HPV. So I won't be talking much about that. Mental health, depression, dementia. This has been dealt with in the by previous speaker. Osteoporosis. Estrogen is very important for bone health. The moment the estrogen stops, the bone literally begins to melt, something like a candle melting. And so postmenopausal women are very, very vulnerable to what we call as fragility fractures. That is the minor fall having a fracture. You don't need to have a very major um, uh, push or accident, a minor fall. So women are extremely vulnerable to this. Not that men are not, but because their testosterone stays on for longer, they will get this osteoporosis also, but maybe 15 to 20 years later. So as you can see, most of these problems, apart from uh, these cancers, are related to estrogen deficiency. And this slide actually shows you in greater detail, uh, you know, the symptoms of the reproductive uh, gender urinary, the ones directly related to the organs, that is the vagina, a lot of itching, burning, irritation, sexual, I've already mentioned, and then the bladder, the urine, a lot of urinary infections because of the change in the opening of the bladder, the urethral open meatus, it gets a little inside, it gets due to atrophy. And women in that age group get a lot of urinary infections and they get keep getting treated for each infection with several courses of antibiotics without the doctor actually realizing that if they gave a little estrogen cream, some of these infections may not recur. And then of course, apart from infections, they still have a lot of problem with passing urine, a burning, but you check the urine, it's normal. It's not infection, but it's because of the atrophic vagina. So there are a lot of these issues that I can tell you, I don't have a figure to show it, but this is extremely common. Almost every woman has this. They go to the doctor. The doctor doesn't really understand this very much and they don't get the proper complete treatment. Now I want to show you this study, which is very recent and conducted in 250 rural elderly women very close to where I'm sitting now. Um, uh, it's in Tirupur. And it's a very nicely conducted study in which they have administered a questionnaire on health problems, asked these elderly women, what are the health problems you have? So they have not got the issues from the women. The women have answered yes or no to a administered questionnaire. So they come out with this result, vision problem, almost 80% of them. Hearing problem, 40%. So like that, it goes on edentulous, not having teeth, uh, diabetes, hypertension, all the blue ones, they have it. Asthma, not that much heart disease, you can see. Very little kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, very little um, 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 stroke problems, and they've had some surgery. And as you can see, what is glaring is that these women were not asked about their menopause. They were not asked about their genital urinary symptoms. So naturally, they didn't answer so this study is so flawed and I just brought it out to show you how studies are conducted without even asking the proper questions. So naturally you don't get the proper answers. And this study also showed the women did not say they were stressed, very few. That is very interesting because we just asked a yes or no question. You will 
it may not be there. We, I don't have the details of the question, but I think it was a yes and no question. Tobacco was in large amounts, more than 60% of the women were taking tobacco. It doesn't say what type of tobacco, whether smoking and chewing. Sleep quality, very poor. And physical activity, they had to do a lot of physical activity. So I put this slide just to show you how so-called scientific studies are not even geared to address the actual problems of the women-specific problems. So what are the challenges? Now, knowing what are the issues among women, what are the challenges we have to address in order to look after women's health, older women's health? One is poor access to health care, which I think in the questionnaire, most people agreed. And this is certainly there in rural areas, in remote areas even more. And I know that we uh, Health, Health Page India is doing a lot for that. And even though we say this, the public health system, the new Ayushman Bharat, which is on the older health system of PHCs and subcenters, is trying to address this problem. So whether there is women are included in that, we'll have to see. The second challenge is failure to discuss health issues by women themselves and by doctors and by healthcare professions. i just give a small anecdote here that once I uh, asked a lady who was running a gynecology center uh, as to whether there was something that I could do there as a geriatrician. And she said, oh, you know, I have all these old women who are full of problems. They want to talk and talk and talk. And, you know, we are so concerned about, you know, deliveries and this and that and infertility. We don't really have time to talk to these women. So I said, oh, you know what? I want to talk to these women. And so I was immediately given a job and I then saw how little their problems were addressed. And I'll come to that more. So you see, even the gynecologists, the specialists, they don't want to discuss old women's problems because it's not entirely their fault. Because all this while, for decades and decades, they have been involved in reproductive, maternal and child health because that was the focus in our country. How to bring our, down our maternal mortality, how to uh, care for our children and bring down deaths. So the whole government machinery as well as the specialists were geared into this. So they didn't have time or the expertise to look into older women who now started to show their face in the last 20 years. And because of this, we have lack of trained healthcare personnel, nurses, physiotherapists, counselors, and I, I don't know why I didn't say doctors, I mean doctors as well. And the Ayushman Bharat PMJ uh, scheme, it provides a community health worker, mid-level health worker, multipurpose health worker for specifically the elderly. But if you look into that, and I've looked into the training manuals of each one of these, including the doctors and the nurses, it is woefully inadequate when it comes to treatment of health issues of the older woman. And then in the medical profession also, lack of clear protocols for the management of older women's problems. And I'm specifically referring here to hormone replacement therapy. You remember in one slide I had shown how many of the genital urinary problems are related to estrogen deficiency. And today, there is some form of consensus, but a lot of confusion about which woman to give hormone replacement to and which woman not to give to. So looking at all of this, I have just put a kind of a schematic representation of what is possible in the public health system, the Ayushman Bharat, the range of services for healthcare of older women in the health and wellness centers. You know, the sub-centers, those who are not familiar will, uh, I can just explain that uh, for a certain amount of population, I think it's 10,000, you have a sub-center and then for a primary health center for 30,000 women. They've put the two together and they've stopped calling them health centers, primary and secondary health centers, and started calling them health and wellness centers because the focus is not on disease alone, but on wellness. And I think this is a very, very, a very good uh, change that has been made because it includes health promotion and disease prevention rather than just treatment of disease, which is the way to go. So what can these centers do for older women? As I said, the Ayushman Bharat does have provision for looking after older people, but woefully inadequate, but at least it has that. And it is allocated um, 
non-medical health workers as well. So what these people can do is a community-based screening of all older people, men as well as women. And the WHO has done a very simplified screening tool or ICO, Integrated Care of Older Persons. I'm not going to go into that, but it is so simple. You just need a trained health, a trained lay person to administer the screen, uh, this the tool, so that they can at least identify those people who are okay and those people who are not, and then send the ones who need treatment to health workers. Cancer screening of cervix, breast, and uterus, as I mentioned, already being done, it can be strengthened. Screening for gender neutral diseases, the non communicable diseases, what we call again our general public health system is quite good. Today, I see so many women and men getting treatment for diabetes and hypertension, which was not there when I just started out medicine uh, when I'm working. So, at least there's something, but it needs strengthening. And this can be done very well in the current system. Now, screening for gender-specific diseases. This is not being well done. We need to enhance this. And this is by, I, I can suggest later as my talk goes on. And then vitamin D and calcium supplements are very necessary for all women who undergo menopause. And this can ideally be just given out, doled out, just like we give iron and calcium to pregnant women. This can be just doled out to every woman who is past the menopause. So now, I've said this is the thing that uh, uh, the Ayushman Bharat should do. The government has said this is what Ayushman Bharat can do. Is it equipped to do it? No, it's not. So how can how can that change be made? <coughs> the doctors, nurses, and community health workers they need experiential training. Sorry. So the health manuals are there. They are inadequate. They need to be. Uh, improved and by just reading a manual you can't learn it so there have to be model training centers and i think the government does have model training centers for its um, reproductive uh, and child health maternal child health management schemes so they can be just repurposed redesigned or added on to train with, um, these health workers on specific how to do uh, for the older women and then if we can identify community daycare centers like the Integrated Child Development Scheme, uh, which is which is run quite well by the government. Now, less and less children are dying. More and more children are well nourished because of these ICDS. And I've just shown you a picture of one lovely painted one. I'm sure it's a very few, but at least there are these places in villages and in urban areas where these sub-centers, these health and wellness centers run these clinics and ASHA uh, accredited social health workers and there is a whole scheme of of uh, health workers who look after these children and give them nutrition etc so the same things can be repurposed added on for older women so you don't need extra um, uh, facilities to be built it's just a repurposing and this is where the assessment and management as i said the i hope every older person should be assessed for health problems because they may have three, four, or five health problems without them knowing it. And if this is detected at an earlier age, then interventions can be done so that they don't go on to the full length of the disease. For example, a per older person is unstable. If you can find out through a screening method, even before they know, we can prevent the first fall. We can prevent so many more fractures. Uh, uh, even if they're osteoporotic, we can detect it early. So these centers can be used so that all women can, can have this. And then appropriately, those who need higher end services can be sent to the district hospitals if they need specialist care. And then this process is to be repeated annually. So we know such a good system we have of immunization. The whole world recognizes that uh, universal immunization for children is so good in India. You have a whole cadre of people who do this. So if we can do that for children, we can do that for older people and they can be visited on an annual um, um, basis. And then as we do all this, and as somebody else mentioned, we have to do data collection. And this data has to be updated. As we look at old, because as we know, the treatment and management of older people is still in its infancy. So if we have data that we collect today, it will help us to, it will help us in research now and in improving health services 10 years from now. So using modern technology, we have to facilitate 
the data collection of every aspect of health problems in the elderly, including mental health, and this will facilitate new knowledge and improvements. So, as I said in the earlier slide, we can't just, we've got all these health workers, they're already sanctioned, but they're not skilled. So we need to know what are the crucial specific skills which have to be taught, and they have to be taught at model training centers, which the government already has. So the doctors, we have to train the doctors about health problems of older women, as I've just mentioned, and indications for hormone replacement. So when I say indications for hormone replacement, uh, I don't know how much time I have, but if I can spend just two minutes to tell my panel, tell everybody here, why am I putting this hormone replacement? Because giving estrogens to a person who doesn't need it anymore in the sense for reproduction, it seems, uh, you know, uh, an oxymoronic thing. It, we don't need to do it. The, uh, nature has decided they don't need hormones. Why are we giving it? But 20 or 30 years ago, Western research based on the societal development of women where menopausal women no more were considered to be, you know, on the heap. They were up and going. They had professions. They, con they needed to remain healthy. They needed to prevent heart disease. They needed to prevent osteoporosis. So hormone replacement therapy came, became the magic pill for every woman as soon as she entered the menopause. Menopause clinics came all over. They even came up all over in the 1990s in India. And women in the menopause began to look so beautiful. They all had black hair and lovely skin. And uh, this was all to prevent osteoporosis uh, uh, 15 years later. And suddenly in the 19, late 1990s, a major study came up. It's known as the WHI, the Women's Health Initiative in the US, which showed that if you give hormone replacement to women, they get enhanced cardiovascular disease. They're protected, protected from uh, osteoporosis, but they get more and it's not good for them. Now, this was leaked to the media. And overnight, menopause clinics closed down. Uh, I know we had a big one in CMC that closed down. Uh, women stopped using hormone replacement. And so this is like a blow hot, blow cold thing with hormone replacement therapy, you see. First it was, it's very good for you and now it's very bad for you. But the truth lies somewhere in between. Now, all the international societies, our Indian societies, the FOXI, everybody says, hormone replacement therapy is beneficial, is safe to women immediately after the menopause when they get these menopausal symptoms, as I showed you earlier, the hot flashes, the, even the mental symptoms, all these things make a woman's life miserable. And it's not one or two women. There are many women who don't have a problem, but there are an equal number who have severe problems. And I've seen them in the geriatrics clinic. You put them on the prescribed dose of hormone replacement therapy. They say, what did you do to us? Because we are so okay now. But the gynecologists, and here I'm saying this in a big uh, forum because I have got uh, reports from, I have just done a questionnaire from my gynecology colleagues, that though it is sanctioned that you can give it, they are still worried about producing cancers and other things in older women, deep vein thrombosis, cardiac uh, problems. And so they deny older women even this prescribed dose. There are certain women who must not have it. If they've had breast cancer, etc., they must not have it. But the majority of women who do not have this, they are denied hormone replacement therapy according to the prescribed and sanctioned limits. So that's why I want to say, and I don't think we need to go to the gynecologist. General family medicine people, geriatricians, we can should be able to give hormone replacement therapy at the primary care level. We don't need to go. So this is a very major change which has to be done. Now, nurses have to be taught how to do cancer screening. I think they already know. Uh, there's very simple type of screening that can be done. We don't need a medicine, uh, you don't need a gynecologist. They should know how to give estrogen, how to teach a woman to give estrogen in the vagina. This is very useful for those local symptoms. And they should know how to insert a pessary. It's just a ring which has to be put in if the pelvic organs have come down from where they should normally be because of weak muscles in women who have. ma'am, uh, if you could okay. just. Um... I'll just uh, cl uh, close up now. Yeah, so thank you, the management pathways is to have an integrated approach to holistic medicine, optimum use of uh, hormone replacement therapy, evidence-based use of non-pharmacological treatments. I can't spend much time on this, but there's a lot in our indigenous medicines that we can do. And we must get the data to do. 
And then the management of all this is to be done as close to the home as possible. It should be community-based because menopause is not a disease. And then public-private mode. These are the mobile units, which I think should be used. Help Age India doesn't have to be taught about this. They are the forerunners on this. This is also part of the national health mission, but there are very few states which actually have enough numbers, but they should have more to reach this women. And so in conclusion, I would like to mention that there's a huge multifactorial burden of older women's health management. Social problems, discrimination against older women, poverty compound the medical care. Lack of clear management pathways needs to be addressed. Health workers have to be upskilled. And this should be done in model training centers. The Ayushman Bharat framework should be adapted further for women's health care. And then most importantly, or very importantly, data should be collected continuously to aid in further research and tweaking of the programs. Because at the moment, the medical profession does not know how to look after women's health care. Thank you. All of Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm requesting uh, now Dr. Minakshi Sharda to please uh, give a concluding remarks and then I'll ask Dr. Uh, Ghazala to say the same. Okay. That was very nice to hear you, ma'am. Alka Ganesh. It is always very nice. Uh, can I, I, though we are uh, running short a little, I would just like to ask you one thing. It was a very good talk and a very basic talk. And especially it was uh, on the very eye-opening talk on the hormone replacement therapy. Uh, uh, first, uh, I have two uh, questions from you. Uh, there was a poll question in which uh, they totally agree that the healthcare facilities are not, uh, uh, there has to be more healthcare facilities for the woman-oriented. I, but I totally disagree with it. Why? There are healthcare facilities, but the utilization of those services are poor with the woman, I think. That is in my opinion. That was why, one why do you think that is so? The healthcare facilities are there, but the utilization is poor. What is your because they women themselves neglect themselves, they do not come till the late stage of the disease. They would just go on neglecting, or either the uh, the uh, uh, persons, caring persons are not worried about the woman's health more as compared to a yes, man's health. Yes, I would agree with you there. For example, when it comes to prolapse of the pelvic organs, it's hidden. Okay. Yeah. A woman doesn't want to talk about it. Yes, she can't yes. tell the men, you know what, there's something happening down there. It's very uncomfortable for me. They will say nothing. So the, the their concerns are dumbed down. They yes. Are not any concerns. The woman looks otherwise well. So what if she's having burning in the urine? That's a minor problem. So women don't like to press it forward. So that is the thing, even though health facilities may be there. And then when she goes to the doctor, most doctors, as I told you, the gynecologist told me, oh, you know, these old women, they come and they talk. What do they talk? I've got leucoria. I have got discharge. Gynecologists don't like this discharge business because they can never treat it, you see. Whereas I said, I want to talk about it because I know. I know what to do. I can give you hormone replacement and you'll yeah, be fine. True. So you see, it is the not the fault of the woman. It's not the fault. It's a fault of the health system, and I think mainly the doctors and society. <laughs> I yeah, agree. there are less of the uh, uh, women, um, female doctors, maybe less in proportion to the male doctors. And that the is knowledge, one is thing. Good. knowledge is not good. Knowledge is in the medicine department also, in the geriatric department also. That's what uh, I, my second question was to that was linked with it. If the healthcare facilities whether they should be opened separately for the women, that is one thing, or there should be a, a woman-friendly time for the healthcare facilities because mostly the healthcare facilities are in the morning and the evening hours in the no, periphery I, also. I, yeah. And when the no, women I, I, are I, I busy just, in the household work. Yeah. No, I agree with you that, uh, no, I, I feel that uh, though I agree with integration of services, don't have separate services. But it is necessary, I think, because the mindset of the healthcare workers, everything is, is if it's a orthopedic clinic, you know, you're geared towards something. When it's a women's clinic, you're geared towards something. Yeah. So now women's health has taken up a major leap. And in, in the private sector, what is the harm in having women's clinics? 
So right. just like, yeah. So women's clinics, and you don't need expensive investigations. You don't need any tests. You don't need any equipment. You just need to be able to do a gynecological examination and counseling, very important, uh, empathetic attitude towards our older women and the proper treatment. So I think women's clinics should be there in every corporate hospital. But mind you, they won't be interested in it. Why? Because they can't do tests. They don't earn you money. The corporate system wants money, you see. But if by volume, large numbers of women at least come and pay the consultation fees and come there, that's the only reason why they would be happy. But I think it's the non-profits which will be more interested in this. And finally, it is the public health system which has to amplify all these things. The private health system is not available to most women who we talk about in the actual numbers, but they do need to be there. So women's clinics are very important. Lastly, one thing about what is your experience? Are the more women on the drugs compared to the same age men? Which drugs? Any drugs, number of drugs. Oh, polypharmacy. Yeah. yeah. Very few women, very because they don't have health care. Many of them don't bother even about these uh, so-called non-communicable diseases. Uh, and the men have so much of heart disease. So, you know, that is much more obvious. They go, women, they will have a little chest pain. They're so used to having symptoms and they just suppress it. So they don't go to the doctor. I have seen that as a geriatrician so often. The other thing about women is the mental health issues. As a geriatrician, you have to be aware of mental health issues. Women, when they can't sleep, that is, that is the way to get into finding out. But most of our doctors don't, can't recognize this. So we need special training to listen and understand women. And when they say, I can't sleep, when they say, I have pain here, here, and here, multiple pains, which do not uh, go to any specific region. They are trying to tell you, hey, please listen to me. I've got lots of other problems inside. So they're testing you. Do you want to listen or not? And most people have no time. As I said, even the gynecologist said, you know, these women have got so many funny problems. I can't listen to them. So we need to have women doctors. No, they can be men doctors also who are interested in listening to older women. I mean, actually, you and I should get together. <laughs> thank, thank you, ma'am. That was very um, good interaction with you. And uh, it was a good opportunity. And uh, before I hand over mic to Madam Gazala, I would uh, pay my sincere thanks to Anupama ji and Helpage India for organizing such a wonderful event Thank and um, giving the opportunity to be a part of this webinar. Over to you, ma'am Gazala, please. Thank you, ma'am. I I just wanted to uh, 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 say that it has been very, very interesting and Dr. Alka's um, uh, intervention and her entire presentation was very, I mean, it was an eye-opener and good uh, information for us. All I want to say is that um, I personally feel that senior citizen as a category is not a homogeneous category. Age is a, is a continuum. And that is why we should have separate programmatic interventions for the policies there, the programs are there. But we must have separate programs for elderly women so that there is more focus, especially elderly women relating to the scheduled cast, scheduled drive, minorities, transgender persons. They should have access to government schemes. They have access, but it is very limited. So we need specific programs for elderly women. And... Uh, basically i feel that government has done its bit it is now the civil society and uh, us and all people you know whether it is a csr initiative or is it a community based organizations we have to move together and try and uh, you know get the, get to the elderly because implementation is the key everything else is there ma'am the only thing is that we have to make sure that the implementation is there there are measurable indices. We are whatever is happening is there's an outcome based approach so that we know what has happened. Their impact assessment studies should be done so that we know that you know where do we stand? How, where do we go? How do we go further? Lot of lot has happened. Lot you see uh, the number of interventions government has made, the number of schemes and programs. But now we want to know what is the 
this thing. So basically, financial allocations have to be specific and measurable outcomes should be there. And we should also focus on intergenerational bonding and sensitization and advocacy on the issue of elderly women. That is uh, that is how I feel that we can take the program together. The, the, the focus on elderly women can be brought into the forefront by talking about it, by advocating about it, by, by sensitizing people around us, including our families and our neighborhoods. That is how we can go forward. So thank you all very uh, for this excellent uh, session that we had. And I also want to thank uh, Helpage and Dr. Chakravarti and Madam Anupma for calling us here and so thoughtfully uh, you know, working out the first session and covering almost all aspects of health and uh, care for the elderly. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Now it's my turn to say thanks to everybody. So I think a uh, very enriching panel. I think uh, some uh, some things which were so obvious to us, which we didn't notice, I think these were brought out by the experts. I think most important for us mm -hmm. as practitioners, I think we'll uh, take up uh, most of these points, um, maybe in phases, uh, but all subjects were very important. And uh, I must thank uh, from on behalf of Help Pitch India, all the experts who took time and who painstakingly provided you know that that input and that timing i'm sure they're all very busy people and special thanks to the chair and to the co-chair uh, for bringing this session together and we'll keep in touch and we'll uh, probably uh, you know poke you from time to time because now we know that you are a resource <laughs> so we'll bank on you to uh, help us develop better programs uh, have better policy interventions so that we can make the change that we thought that we will make with this effort so thank you all very much uh, we'll now uh, Reassemble for second session at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good time. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. लक्ष्मी साथ में है तो किचन लक्ष्मी के किचन में खाली कोई नहीं जा सकता आप नहीं पहुंचेगी दो बजे मुझे पता है अरे कोई दो बजे नहीं अच्छी बात है मुझे India has over 138 million elders. Nearly 8 million live alone. 32 million are visually impaired or blind due to cataract. 50 million have to work. Which is why HelpAge India has been at work since 1978, reaching them with what they need the most. A nationwide mobile healthcare program provides regular and free healthcare to the underserved. It is recognized as Asia's largest mobile healthcare network. For hundreds and thousands of elders, the mobile healthcare program is their only hope of receiving modern healthcare. It takes vision to provide vision to those in need. Preventable blindness is being addressed through partnerships with credible hospitals. 
over 12 lakh elders have benefited so far. A team of medical professionals visit cancer patients like Ram Pyari regularly. They take care of the patient's pain, infections and the side effects of chemotherapy. Geriatric physiotherapy clinics across India are supported to help elders retain their mobility and overcome situations such as paralysis and nerve diseases. Rapid changes in technology often leave elders struggling to cope with the digital divide. Help Age India conducts digital literacy and safety workshops to help elders navigate the digital world safely so they can become self-reliant and independent and also helps tackle social isolation. The Elder Self-Help Groups or the ESHG are a unique idea that helps elders pool their resources, avail microcredit and start their own enterprises. Above all, this helps them care for each other. Millions of our elders lack adequate shelter. The Tamaraikulam Elders Village or TEV is a model old age home run by Help Age India. The most salient aspect of this home is active aging. These activities enable them to earn and regain their self-confidence. Help Age India supports many other old age homes financially as well. India is aging rapidly. But are we equipped to look after our elders? Support us to help provide our elders with a healthy, empowered and dignified life. मेरी जिंदगी इतनी है वो गई थी कि मैं जान लेने के लिए तैयार हो गई थी अनन्ना श्रम में आने के बाद मेरे को घर के सरे का लग रहे हैं और मनीषा मैडम मेरे को मिली तो मिले बच्चे सरे की लड़की सरे की है प्यार बहुत देती है मेरे को खाने पीने का सब सोई इधर हो गई है और बीमार हो गई है तो मैडम को फोन करके डॉक्टर वगैरह बुलाती है
हमार नाम भेल पंचन देवी प्रभा गाँव में हम रह हम समूह से जुड़ल जबकि बाढ़ के पीड़ित आठ ईस्वी में आएल रहा वही टाइम से हर सबके हेल्पेज में जुड़ल थी और हेल्पेज के सहायता से हर सबके मशीन खरीदल एक मशीन यह तहे से हर सब सिलाई हम करे शुरू करल और वृद्ध सब कहीं रहा एक दू ठोटा युवक सब बैठल रहे और सीखलिए और बहुत लड़का सब भी सीखलक यहाँ से जबकि बाढ़ अपनी कम और हमारा हेल्पेज के तरफ से मिलल रहा मास्क बनबे वास्ते जबकि कोरोना का टाइम रहा वही टाइम हमारा कोई ना काम मिले रहा वही से हमारा कुछ उपार्जन हमारा सबके परिवार का अच्छा से चलल और आदमी सब जो सीखल वो भी के चलल हमारा नाम रेणु देवी है यहाँ पे हम सिलाई सीखने आए हैं और वो जो सिखाती है पैसा नहीं लेती है वो वो फ्री में सिखाती है और बहुत सी दीदी सब है जो फ्री में सीखती है वो इससे हमारा बहुत लाभ होता है मेरा नाम करिश्मा कुमारी है और यहाँ पे मशीन सीखने के लिए आए हैं सीख कर हम अपना भी मतलब मेंटेनेंस कर लेते हैं और दूसरों को भी सिखाते हैं You see me every day, but do you ever really? I look after you each day, but do you see me truly? I have the money to spend, but it's all yours to give. I have nothing to call my own, yet it is for you I live. I'm not as strong. As I earlier used to be, my bones now ache a lot. Can't you simply see? I no longer have beside me the one who would grow old with me. Life took him away, and I thought, now you would look after me. I know sometimes I get angry, and I test your patience a lot. But remember, sometimes I forget. Have you ever given that a thought? Your raised voice really hurts. It shatters like pins inside my heart. I know you don't mean to raise your hand but that's only the start it hurts me deeply too do you ever understand i don't need much from you just a supporting hand i want to spend my days working and earn my rightful place in this world but chances seem so few for those opportunities to unfold Yes, I have the fear of falling. My eyes are not what they used to be, but my spirit is still strong, and there's still much juice left in me. Years have given me more experience, so much I can contribute. If only you would see me. I have many attributes. I'm so proud of you, of the person you've become today. I watched you come into your own, day after day. Now that you've grown older and have a family of your own, maybe you will understand the value of your mom. I look after you still, and now your little ones too. I do love them dearly, but sometimes I need some time off too. I remember the sleepless nights, the tiredness, and your constant waking. Today, as you make your grown-up plans. I'm nowhere in the decision making. I'm not just a mother, a sister, a grandmother or a wife. I'm a woman who has dreams, but it always comes with a price. Dependence is not what I crave for, 
but to stand on my own two feet feel that i'm more than enough to feel confident and complete so don't treat me as if i'm invisible i'm right here not someone new i've been with you all along just remember main bhi hu since 1978 reaching them with what they need the most a nationwide mobile healthcare program provides regular and free healthcare to the underserved it is recognized as asia's largest mobile healthcare network for hundreds and thousands of elders the mobile healthcare program is their only hope of receiving modern healthcare it takes vision to provide vision to those in need Preventable blindness is being addressed through partnerships with credible hospitals. Over 12 lakh elders have benefited so far. A team of medical professionals visit cancer patients like Ram Pyari regularly. They take care of the patient's pain, infections and the side effects of chemotherapy. Geriatric physiotherapy clinics across India are supported to help elders retain their mobility and overcome situations such as paralysis and nerve diseases rapid changes in technology often leave elders struggling to cope with the digital divide help age india conducts digital literacy and safety workshops to help elders navigate the digital world safely so they can become self reliant and independent and also helps tackle social isolation the elder self help groups or the eshg are a unique idea that helps elders pool their resources avail micro credit and start their own enterprises above all this helps them care for each other millions of our elders lack adequate shelter The Tamarai Kulam Elders Village or TEV is a model old age home run by Help Age India. The most salient aspect of this home is active aging. These activities enable them to earn and regain their self confidence. Help Age India supports many other old age homes financially as well. India is aging rapidly. but are we equipped to look after our elders support us to help provide our elders with a healthy empowered and dignified life
हमरो आर का अपन रोजगार मिलत रहे छे तो काम धंधा करै छिए तो हमरो आर का बढ़िया छिए तारो तारो दीदी से समूह में जुटल से पिया इंडिया से तो बाल बच्चा के पोषण पालन कर जे सहारा इंडिया हेल्प इंडिया जे सब बनले तिन हमरो आर का सब चीज मेरी जिंदगी इतनी है वो गई थी कि मैं जान लेने के लिए तैयार हो गई थी आनंद आश्रम में आने के बाद मेरे को घर के सरीका लग रहे हैं और मनीषा मैडम मेरे को मिली तो मिली बच्ची सरीकी लड़की सरीकी है प्यार बहुत देती है मेरे को खाने पीने का सब सोई इधर हो गई है और बीमार हो गया तो मैडम को फोन करके डॉक्टर वगैरह बुलाती है हमारे नाम भेल पंचन देवी परवा गाँव में हम रह हम समूह से जुड़ल जबकि बाढ़ के पीड़ित आठ स्टीम आएल रहा वही टाइम से हमारा सबके हेल्पेज में जुड़ल थी और हेल्पेज के सहायता से हमारा सबके मशीन खरीदल एक मशीन यह तहे से हमारा सब सिलाई हम करे शुरू करल और वृद्ध सब कैंट है एक दू छोटा युवक सब बैठल रहा सबके सीखलिए और बहुत लड़का सब भी सीखल यहाँ से जबकि बाहर अपनी कमबे और हमारा हेल्पेज के तरफ से मिलल रहा मास्क बनबे वास्ते जबकि कोरोना का टाइम रहा टाइम हमारा कोई ना काम मिले रहा वही से हमारा कुछ उपार्जन भी हमारा सबके परिवार का अच्छा से चलल और आदमी सब जो सीखल वो भी के चलल हमारा नाम रेणु देवी है यहाँ पे हम सिलाई सीखने आए हैं और वो जो सिखाती है पैसा नहीं लेती है वो वो फ्री में सिखाती है 
और बहुत से दीदी सब है जो फ्री में सीखती है वो इससे हमारा बहुत लाभ होता है मेरा नाम करिश्मा कुमारी है और यहाँ पे मशीन सीखने के लिए आए हैं सीख कर हम अपना भी मतलब मेंटेनेंस कर लेते हैं और दूसरों को भी सिखाते हैं बनता तो है ना फिर उसको कॉपी किया तो बनता है में लास्ट में बोल देंगे उससे बेटर गुड आफ्टरनून मेरा मैम गुड टू सी यू हियर गुड आफ्टरनून अनुपमा हाउ आर यू आई एम वेरी वेल मैम हाउ आर यू फीलिंग आर यू फीलिंग बेटर नाउ देयर इज नो टेंपरेचर बट आई हैव कॉफ सो आई थैंक्स थैंक्स वेरी मच फॉर अग्रीइंग टू शेयर द सेशन Thank you. Uh, so, what should we start right away, or uh, I see most of the panelists are here, so I suggest that uh, we can start if you like. We still have five minutes, but uh, if you like, we can start. Or we can we can wait we can wait for five minutes and then we'll start at two. We just have three minutes left. Yeah, yeah. So we'll wait.
Yeah. Meera will join. Devlina will join because she's third in the line. Yeah. Ma'am, I suggest that we start now uh, because we have a long list of panelists. So I suggest that. Um... Yeah, so, I think we should. Yes, In the interest of time, let's start. So on behalf of Felp Agenda, I welcome you all uh, to this uh, discussion. Uh, we had a very uh, fruitful discussions in the morning session, very invigorating. And I hope to have even better discussions in this afternoon because uh, we are covering a wide range of issues here uh, pertaining to women. And um, thank you, Meera ma'am, for, for agreeing to chair the session. So it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Anupama. And I'll just, and... Uh, sorry, but uh, we are just flashing your CV to, <clears throat> for the uh, participants to see. She's a, a she's a social activist, writer and poet. And um, she's all that and much more. I know her for a very long time and she's uh, nothing can match her energy levels and her motivation and, uh, you know, uh, drive to do something for women. Uh, so these are some of the uh, some of her achievements that we are putting on the paper. Uh, so you can read it. And she's like um, she's uh, co-founder of Every Woman Treaty and chair of the South Asian Coalition for the Treaty. She's director of the Secretariat of the Regional Alliance. South Asian Network for Widows uh, Empowered in Development and Director of Global Alliance, The Last Woman First. She has served as a consultant to the high-level committee on the status of women, uh, Government of India, and has served, as, uh, served on two expert committees on widows, one with Supreme Court of India and the other with the National Commission. She's authored four books, two of which are about Kashmir, several papers on women's rights and widows' rights, and presented papers at both national and international forums and the UN system. She currently serves on the Civil Society Advisory Group on the UN uh, Women for India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Bhutan. She joined uh, the working group in 2016 and served on the uh, Expert Special Committee on Life Stages. Uh, she has been awarded Women's Achievers Award by Amity University. Women's Federation for World Peace recognized her uh, with the 2019 Fostering Peace Within the Individual Award. She featured in the UN Women uh, India's Mujhe Haq Hai, Campaign which aimed to inspire women to defy norms by raising uh, by rising above challenges. So you can see that we have a uh, we have a true feminist amongst us. So I think, uh, ma'am, thank you again, and over to you. Thank you, Anupama. You know, I'm always very frightened when this when this introduction is read out because then somehow I feel the expectation levels are raised to such a uh, extent. And uh, I don't know whether I will match up to the, those expectations or not. However, thank you so much, Helpage, uh, for giving me this opportunity. And I must also uh, put a rider that in case I need to switch off the uh, microphone in between, <clears throat> it's because I have a bad throat and possibly will be disturb will be a disturbance to the to the uh, proceedings. Uh, as a uh, as a chair, as having had the privilege of being of chairing this uh, session, and I'm particularly happy because this session has a extremely wide ranging and very august uh, panelists. So I am extremely excited to hear the different multi layered. Uh, you know, uh, cross sectional cross sectionalities between aging and uh, gender, which will be thrown up during the course of the discussions. So, uh, just a, um, before I make my uh, remarks as the chair, just a couple of uh, logistical issues. Uh, I know Anupama has given uh, has slotted fifteen minutes for each of our panelists, which is a extremely I think generous time to uh, make our points. I have a suggestion that if it is fine by the panelists, let us st uh, stick to say about 11 to 12 minutes and leave about two to three minutes for uh, interaction from the audience on your presentation. Because if we leave till the end uh, for to ask for uh, question and answers, sometimes 
fatigue sets in, people drop off. So I feel that while the paper and the presentation is fresh in our minds, we give the opportunity to the audience to ask questions. So if it is fine by the panelists, uh, Anupama, is that a good uh, uh, suggestion? Yes, ma'am. I think we did. The, we followed the same for the first session as well. And excellent, you. excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, according to the uh, twenty one census projections, the elderly female and male populations stood stood close to seven point one crore mm -hmm. and six point seven crore respectively. Yeah, and it in clearly indicates that elderly female. Uh, it indicates that elderly females outnumber their male counterparts, and this outnumbering is only going to strengthen with time. So there is one issue of the uh, of the larger female aging population, and aging, no matter how it is presented, aging is not gender neutral. Aging has many gendered layers. Uh, because patriarchal uh, norms in any case perpetuate a sense of entitlement among uh, some individuals, leading to discriminative and abusive behavior towards women, particularly older women, because they are seen as a non-productive asset within the household. So within a patriarchal framework, older women may face additional challenges due to ageism, the devaluation of their worth, and agency within families, and often this is at the hands of relations and caregivers. Now, traditional gender roles reinforce the idea that older women as are less valuable or deserving of respect, which can contribute to their abuse and neglect. But gender discrimination, which starts right from the cradle onwards, has its uh, long-reaching impact which continues into aging. So it is not as if older women are suddenly devalued. Women, by nature, by virtue of their gender, are devalued right from the beginning, and this has long-term impact on their on the issue of aging. For example, in our country, because of the gender discrimination, the the access to education or the access to employable skills is limited for women. Now this, as much as its impact during the reproductive years, in the older years, it has even more impact because the lack of education and lack of skills leads to a situation of economic dependency. Or for example, lack of awareness or lack of literacy, education, you have lack of awareness of the legal rights of inheritance which again has its impact on the aging. <coughs> the literacy rates among <coughs> elderly females is 28% less than half of the literacy rate among elderly, <coughs> elderly males. For elderly males, it is 59%, whereas for elderly females, it is 28%. And the periodic labor force uh, in uh, numbers indicate that 65% of the elderly women and only 18% of the elderly women in the age group 60 to 64 years have participated in, in any economic activity. I'm just giving these figures just to flag the issue of economic dependency, which gets enhanced uh, because of age but enhanced even more because of the gender implications. So as the age advances, the labor force participation decreases and the dependency on the family and state increases. Now, gender difference is noticed among the dependents as more number of women are dependent than men. Now, the old age dependency ratio in India currently stands at 13% and is expected to become 20%. And this dependency ratio among women is much higher than, and than among men. The second uh, issue that I want to flag is the overlap between the marital status and aging. There is an overlap between the incidence of widowhood and aging among women because of the prevalent practice of men marrying uh, 
yeah, much younger women and also the life expectancy of the uh, higher life expectancy of the women. So taking the first issue of economic dependency and the second issue of widowhood. So the future scenario is large number of elderly widowed women with no economic support. And this is the future scenario that is facing us in this country. Now, the third issue, which I again want to flag, which of course, this will come out in our discussions, is the aspect of health. Now, of course, old age, uh, the, the body of both men and women age, and there are uh, multiple health issues. But women, by nature of their gender and by nature of the patriarchal roles that are assigned to them, there is a greater problem. For example, multiple pregnancies or too, too, uh, too many pregnancies with less gap leads to prolapsed uterus, prolapsed uterus uh, uh, in old age, which becomes which uh, which uh, con uh, constrains the quality of uh, life of the older woman uh, because of uh, the same kind of issue, loosened muscles, urinary incontinence. All these issues get enhanced uh, in a uh, in an older woman. Uh, lack of uh, uh, good nutrition again ha has its greater impact on anemia in the older uh, women, and long hours of uh, cooking uh, with uh, leading to respiratory illnesses again gets enhanced. Uh, uh, long hours of walking, trying to get water or fodder or food or caregiving increases the joint pain. So, so the health issue, again, is very closely linked to the stereotype roles that women have been assigned to and also the lack of equitable access to health and education. So the gendered, li gendered lived experience results in large number of elderly and widowed women with not much access to income, totally dependent on family members. So that is the uh, future scenario. The larger population of elderly women, uh, elderly females is a sign of feminization of the elderly population in this country. And that is going to bring its own unique set of uh, challenges both for governments, societies, and families. What is the kind of policy that we can look at? What is the kind of innovative, out-of-the-box uh, thinking that can ensure that we give a modicum of life of dignity to uh, elderly women? What about the fatigue, uh, which is going to be a reality in nuclear families as smaller families grapple with uh, caregiving? <clears throat> That is one aspect of it. What is a policy? The other aspect which I hope will come out uh, in the discussion is that there is this huge domain knowledge that we're looking at. There is expertise which is born out of experience. Can we make use of that talent pool? Can old people, old elderly women be an agency for economic growth, thus impacting their own lives and the lives of their communities? So these are some... <laughs> these are just some of the issues that I wanted to uh, flag and uh, without further delay I am going to uh, invite our uh, uh, first uh, speaker for the day uh, this is Miss, Miss Aura Sevilla focal person for Southeast Asia and older workers and she's going to talk about older women workers in the informal economy, advancing gender inclusive uh, social protection strategy. Uh, uh, Aura's uh, capacity and capability is being flashed on your screens and she's in a perfect position to, uh, to uh, pick up on how to uh, make use of the domain expertise of older women. Old, over to you, Aura. Thank you, Ms. Mira. It was really a good um, uh, introduction. And thank you again for having us. Again, I'm Aura from Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. 
Um, we are a global network, but we are born. We were born in India, particularly in Ahmedabad, India, through Self-Employed um, Women Association or SEWA. So now we are a global think tank working in promotion of the livelihoods of the working poor, particularly the women in informal employment. So thank you again. So I just be mindful with the time, but please do not hesitate to um, call me out if I'm over time already. So I just prepared a very short presentation. Um, this is just a few slides just to give you some visual representation of what's really going on with older women in informal employment. So first and foremost, I'd like to share the story of Victoria. Um, she's 83 years old and she's a fish vendor for six decades in the Philippines. Um, through the years that she's been working, she already developed a club foot because she's been carrying a big um, fish, a uh, bowl of fish at, at, uh, on her top of her head. And she developed like club foot. Um, but then when I asked her, like, why you still continue working, she told me this. I do not see retirement in sight. And I'm, I'm ashamed to ask for money, particularly from his children, her children, because her children have their own family now. And I don't want to receive money that I didn't work hard for. So Victoria is just one example of the millions of older women who continue to work on what we call ceaseless toil. So they continue to working until they can or until they die. So um, globally, 61% um, of the world's workers are informally employed, representing around 2 billion, uh, uh, billion people. Um, if you will see at the global figures, there are more men who are working in informal employment than women. But if you look at the 56 countries or in the developing countries, there are more women who are engaged in informal employment. And similarly with aging, um, informal work is also not homo homogenous. So as you can see in this uh, graph, in this pyramid, um, there are different uh, informal work based on risk and also authority. Um, employers have more control over the work. They have more authority with um, how they can keep the job versus unpaid family workers. They have less control with their work or whether they can keep their work. So the risk is higher at the bottom. And then the earnings are also higher for the employers while um, earnings are lower for the bottom of the pyramid. And one important thing I'd like to note here is also gender segmentation because women are tend to concentrate at the bottom, which are more precarious types of work. So I think um, we should emphasize this in recognizing and developing policies, both women as a as, uh, caregiver, uh, sorry, as a worker, and um, also the gender issues. So um, it was mentioned by Mira, population aging has different impacts in different sectors of the society, and that it also has an impact with the labor market. In particular, we see that through aging, there will be dwindling of um, working younger working age, but at the same time, there would be more people working um, due to the population aging. So, and we look at the data globally, right now, older people, three in four older people are engaged in informal employment. Um, and there is also a gender area on this. If, for example, if we look at the region in Southeast Asia, older women are also more affected by informality than older men. In some countries in that region, more than 95% are the informal rates for 65 plus for women. This includes Cambodia, Laos, and in Vietnam. Um, but what are the reasons? What are the diverse motivations why women continue to work? Um, according to a study by um, Samuels, there are three reasons. One, economic necessity. Second is personal preference, and third is social norms and broader gendered inequalities. But if you look at the global data, mostly in developing countries, the motivation is economic necessity. When you also look, when we also look at the data in India, most women, widowed women, single household, poor women also tends to work compared with men in similar situation. This shows the significant needs for older women to continue to work because of their economic um, situation. So, but um, 
According also to the UN reports on human rights of older women, there are also both advantages and disadvantages for women, for older women working. So one of the advantages include increasing financial independence because they have their own income. They do not have to rely on their kids or their husband for, for their own income. It also provides them a sense of fulfillment and greater status within household. Mira mentioned again also the importance of autonomy and also importance of agency. So it gives them that, that they have more control over their lives. And also can give cognitive advantages because instead of um, just keeping style at the home, they can still economically active. However, there are also disadvantages. It can negatively affect older women's physical and mental health due to poor conditions, exposure to discrimination and abuse. Especially for women, for example, domestic workers, street vendors, those who are engaged in precarious and dangerous um, working condition. This would be very difficult and also harmful for them. Another disadvantage is it can cause them added stress from multiple responsibilities because caring responsibilities doesn't stop at 59 or at 50 years old. Caring responsibilities of women continues even at older age. Um, even the kids, their children grow up, now they have to take care of their grandchildren or at the same time has to take care of their um, husband who have like disability or have sickness. So it's additional burden. Um, these are some of the characteristics of older women working in informal economy. They are more likely to be economically and socially vulnerable due to life course disadvantages. Um, older women workers are more likely to be working as unpaid caregivers, unpaid care, um, uh, also as unpaid family worker. They're also likely to earn less than older men. Um, and then I look into this uh, data from 2017 Longitudinal uh, Aging Study in India. It shows that approximately 33% of older women are in agricultural laborers as opposed to 16% of men. And when you look at it, in all types of work that indicate ownership of wealth, for example, as an own account worker, farm worker, or own business, men usually dominates this. So, and of course, if they have more owner, they have more ownership with the job, they have more authority, and then also they earn more. So another is at older age, older women also often experience multiple forms of discrimination based on both gender and their age. This also continues at um, older age. So they also experience AGSM, like you will commonly hear, why are you still working? You should just be at home. Um, you should stop working. Vulnerability to exploitation. These are very common for street vendors because they were kicked out from the street. They are also being abused and also have scam, like often abuse, uh, often victims of scamming. So I think this is also very important to note. And as I mentioned, they have lower incomes. They have uh, also prone to gender pay gap. They have poorer working conditions. And most importantly, they have income insecurity because they are more likely to rely to their children, they have lower pension benefits and lower savings as well. So, and one thing as well that is important to note is that women do not have old age income security through a public pension mechanism. So this is primarily due to the cumulative disadvantages of precarious and informal work that they have done when they were younger. And because of the regular breaks from paid work, and also, uh, because of this, they were not able to continuously or consistently pay for the contributory pension system. Um, for example, in India, when we look at the pension coverage, it benefits only 12% of older men and 3% of older women um, who, among those who are working or worked previously. This is also based on LASI 2017. Um, while social pension or the non-contributory pension has close the gender gap in old age pension, but does not go far enough. Like in many countries it's still targeted. And then the benefit amount is very small for people to enable to, them to retire. Um, I'm not gonna go in depth on this because I know HelpAge, other speakers might talk about social pension. But one thing I would like to note is ironically, you know, like women have a shorter career 
period to save, but because they live longer, they have a longer retirement period that doesn't cover up for a sufficient pension system. So you have that very ironic situation. So how are we going to deal with it? So here are some of the things that we find like uh, we go particularly push. So um, uh, along with HealthAge, we're a staunch also advocate of universal social pension. We think, yeah, a basic pension for older women and men could enable them the choice to continue working or not and the level of intensity of the work in which they do engage. We know like there are several studies that pension helps in contributing for retirement of informal workers. For example, in Thailand, it has contributed for the retirement of those in the rural areas to, to lower the work or to significantly reduce the time of work. Or we saw also in other countries where when the time that they have to collect the pension, so they are also reduce or social pension, they also reduce the time that they will engage with productive work. So at so this universal social pension somehow, I know how, even how meager it is, it's very important for them, for the sense of um, accomplishment and also for the sense of them to have some form of retirement. Or are you? Yeah. Yeah, this is just my last slide. So this is just my last slide. So these are also one thing that we are um, pushing, engendering the old age pension system. So aside from social pension, what can we do for the social security system? So there are a couple of things. One, reforming the pension system to account for these gender pay discre discrepancies that we talked about. Another is flexible pension policies that recognize caregiving responsibilities, like providing care credits in some countries. It, they've been already doing this, like France, Japan, but mostly in developing countries. It should be extend, sorry, developed countries. This should be extended as well in developing countries. We should also remove provisions that reinforce gender bias. For example, in Singapore, if you are women, you pay higher premiums for the provident funds because you live longer. So it's we should not we should remove those kind of um, gender biases as well and then secondly is adjust the pension eligibility age and benefit structures for example women have uh, some women have um, younger retirement age so i think that should be adjusted as well and lastly which is just timely for our topic is the intersectional approach to pension policy that can help ensure that needs of all women are addressed this could be based on race, age, um, ethnicity, and I think those are very important in considering um, designing the pension. So, yes, as, as a closing, uh, WIGO works um, to help older workers. Uh, we, 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 um, we recognize the contributions of older men and women and also help them in challenging um, in fulfilling their rights to work and access to labor market. So we hope that the decent work agenda must also extend them to them. So that's all, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aura, for that was such an extremely lucid uh, presentation. Uh, are there any questions? I, I'm not seeing any questions on the chat box. Uh, we have, we can... Uh, I think give about two and a half minutes for uh, questions on uh, Aura's excellent uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Jang, you have a question? Yes, can I? Thank yes, you. please. Uh, yeah, keep you. it as short as possible in the interest <clears throat> of time. Thank you. Yeah, nice to see you, Aura, here, and really great presentation. It was very great to hear all the perspective and thoughts. You particularly mentioned the social protection policy for older women. So, is it like you are already working with the ILO in in the region on on this matter? Uh, hello, Doctor Jang. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Um, yeah, um. Actually, we got just launched the older pillar worker. So this is just an initial work. Um, that this is just an initial work that we're starting. And one of the things that we're actually actually 
going to do as well like is the analysis of the informality and aging in Thailand because we know Thailand is one of the also fast really would be considered a super agent society soon and they have also like really big informality rates so that's why we would start to work with that and also yes we will continue to work with um ILO and also we're part of the WHO healthy aging meetings so because we we know that it's important for older informal workers uh, especially those who would like to continue to work to access um health care um while they are working uh Dr Shivani I was just asking uh, that uh, main messages if they can be just uh explain because there was so much information uh, that uh, consolidating everything in my head is a difficulty to get down to asking. So what is the main message uh, of the presentation? Uh, or uh, I hope you will be uh, mailing the presentation to HelpAge so that it becomes part of the documentation that is going to be done. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Basically, we want to say, um, contrary contrary to what they think, that older people are no longer productive, we're trying to say that there are a vast majority of older people, particularly older women, who are still active. And apparently, it's not by choice. It's because of economic necessity. And social protection, if we, if we design it properly, if we design it to make it more gender inclusive, um, and also inclusive to all workers, particularly self-employed account workers, then we can make it possible for these workers to retire or to stop working or to reduce working or um, uh, if, if we consider their needs in designing social protection. Hope that clarifies you. Thank you, Aura. You got it. And uh, we move on to our next uh, presentation. Um, by... We have a poll question before that. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, participants can um, uh, fill in the, their answers, their responses, right? We'll just, oh uh, yeah, but somehow the panelists can't vote on this, so sorry for that. Oh, I'm very hurt that I can't vote on this. <laughs> Since you already have an opinion, we know where you stand. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have very enlightened audience which are saying that strongly agree. Aging women should have employment opportunities to attain financial independence. Uh, this is not to say that what Aura is saying is not important. I understand that, you know, working out of economic necessity is something very different from working because you wish to work. So um, we can take this forward now, ma'am. Uh, we move on to our next presentation by... Uh, Ms. Raki Sai, who is the lead at Access Assist, and she will be talking on driving women entrepreneurship by leveraging technology and skilling to impact financial stability, which really is taking off from where Aura has left off. Uh, Raki, of course, is a very impressive uh, uh, profile, as I can see. And I would encourage all of you to read it. Uh, Raki, you you have, uh, I will uh, give you a, a, a heads up at around 11 minutes so that uh, you can have three minutes to answer questions which rise from your presentation. And over to you, Raki. Thank you so much, Meera. And, um, and thank you, Aura. Uh, I think your presentation has kind of set the stage and certainly, uh, Meera Ji, your context of, you know, how and where we stand in this very important agenda was very useful. So hi, everyone. I am Rakhi and I, I co-lead a nonprofit, which is called Access Assist. 
Um, I also uh, work as a chief strategy offer, uh, officer close to around more than two decades of work across South Asia and Southeast Asia in the inclusive finance impact investing space. So, yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Help Edge and, and Anupama to kind of, you know, inviting me for this. So I'm I'm truly delighted to be given this opportunity to talk about something which is so close to my heart. You know, how do we look at driving women economic empowerment, driving entrepreneurship, particularly from the perspective of, you know, how technology and digitization is kind of taking bigger leaps as we sit here in India, right? So, yeah, maybe next slide, Anupama, please. So um, just, you know, a few numbers to get the context from where, you know, what is it that we're trying to put it, put here and, you know, talk. Um, as for MasterCard's, uh, you know, MasterCard Index on Women Entrepreneurship uh, Report, India ranks 57 out of the 65 nations, right? And as in terms of the Female Entrepreneurship Index, India stands at 70th as compared, you know, in, in, in the entire scheme of 77 countries that were part of the index report. Now, um, while these numbers are kind of, you know, they, they helps us to kind of position ourselves that where we fall in the ambit as compared to other countries, I think it gives and poses a deeper question to all of us to, uh, one, acknowledge, understand what are, you know, where are we lacking, one, uh, and two, to try to understand what, what, what are some of the mitigation efforts, what are some of the, you know, key drivers that we can work on to kind of look at improving these numbers. Now, India as a country, you know, we have a thriving, you know, micro and, you know, small and medium enterprise segments, and we have close to around 63 MSMEs in India, 63 million MSMEs in India, and only 20% of these are owned by women. Right. And uh, currently, the segment actually employs close to around 27 million people. So uh, uh, these numbers are kind of, you know, it helps us kind of think through that, you know, where the potential lies and where are we in, you know, in the hierarchy of things. And it has been estimated that, you know, if we look at accelerating women's economic, uh, women's uh, entrepreneurship in the country, you know, India is capable of actually creating 30 million women-owned enterprises and potentially employing 170, uh, creating 170 million jobs uh, for people. Now, these numbers are really huge, right? When we talk about these numbers, suddenly it kind of, you know, uh, it gives a light bulb kind of moment that, wow, you know, it sounds all so jazzy and nice. But um, so, uh, sadly, uh, I think the pace at which we are going is still something that needs to be kind of bolstered quite a bit. Now, India as a country, like we all know, you know, is an innovation hub, global, you know, powerhouse of technology, digitization and everything. So I think now is actually the right time where we can look at convergence of women economic empowerment, particularly the entrepreneurship, uh, to marry the digitization and technology journey to move forward. Next slide, please. Um, so coming to, you know, uh, what are some of the hindrances, you know, and this is just a very uh, small list, and I'm sure all of us are aware of these, and, you know, Aura also mentioned, uh, she touched upon some of the, you know, issues of women uh, that they face as part of their economic life cycle, right? I think limited access to capital is something which is very, very apparent to women entrepreneurs, and uh, and that that certainly hinders the growth and the scale of women entrepreneurship in our country. Um, it is estimated that 90% of women enterprises do not have access to formal credit, right? So, which means everything is kind of getting operated within the just 10% space, right? And in order to look at, you know, improving this, uh, you know, we've had examples where uh, people are experimenting with, you know, uh, you know, redefining credit worthiness for women, particularly, you know, can we look at uh, doing away with, you know, a male member being a loan guarantee, a guarantor to, you know, to look at access to credit. So these are some of the things that, you know, people and organizations are experimenting globally. Uh, the second thing that I feel uh, something which really hinders women's, women's uh, you know, potential and ability to become entrepreneurs and also to drive entrepreneurship is limited capacity, limited access to capacity building and scaling avenues. Like by virtue of being women and, you know, I think, uh, you know, Mira also pointed out that the discrimination starts right from the cradle. Right. And that discrimination actually is bucketed across different verticals of our lifestyles and lifespan. So that is also something which is very important. And I think 
um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, looking at limited access to capacity building also translates into women's ability to take the first step and get into business or get into employment generation, get into economic, you know, activity. Uh, the third piece, which I feel is important is, uh, you know, in the given context, the limited ownership of digital assets. You know, if we look at, you know, how many, uh, what is the percentage of mobile phone uh, ownership? in India, what is the percentage of uh, internet usage of women in India? And it's extremely starking that women in India are actually 15% less likely to own mobile phones uh, than men and 33% and 33 less likely to use mobile phone services, right? So uh, th there are kind of liberal or dichotomy in the market that is happening as we speak here, right? Uh, there, is a, there, there is a whole, uh, you know, there, there's a whole thing of, you know, how India is kind of, you know, growing, but I think some of the numbers when it comes to uh, gender equality, women economic empowerment, they are still at, at, at a stage that needs a lot of attention. Now, <clears throat> unequal care burden, I think Aura touched upon this, uh, is is becoming, I mean, it has been a very, very important aspect. And I think it's, it's about time that we start giving due importance uh, and notice to this to to this particular aspect of our time that goes in right so and essentially when it comes to you know it it, it the kind of burden that women face as entrepreneurs or you know and also hinders them as becoming an entrepreneur that they have you know they actually have to go through this entire care burden at the household level and that is something if it doesn't get reduced or shared or addressed it further actually restricts women getting into the workforce Right. Now, I think most of the things are also driven by a gender based social cultural norms and mindsets, and that needs to be kind of tackled across the board, across the stages. And I feel that, um, you know, ecosystem players, both from the demand and supply side, need to kind of converge on these change in the mindset. Next slide, please. Um, so I think I've, I've also I've put in some of the, the some of the opportunities that I feel are, you know, we can look at leveraging, you know, to see how we can look at changing the, you know, the paradigm here. Uh, certainly access to technology is something that can be looked at, you know, uh, giving more power to women as, as we see women becoming entrepreneurs or women looking to kind of, you know, take into entrepreneurship uh, in their lives, in, in their lives, right? Um, access to technology also means that, you know, uh, how do we look at leveraging the booming uh, e-commerce online marketplaces, right? How do we look at skilling of women uh, so that they are better able to understand and navigate through the digital landscape, right? And I think uh, the moment we talk about digital, the moment we talk about platform, the ambit of any business, uh, you know, kind of expands substantially, <laughs> expands substantially. Now that expansion uh, also needs to be managed and, uh, and, and there has to be a support that needs to be provided to women entrepreneurs when we talk about digitization. It's not just, you know, hey, here's a digitization story. Here is an online platform. Why don't you go ahead and kind of start selling your stuff? So it's, it's not that. There is a lot of mentorship. There's a lot of handholding that is required along with that skilling. Now, skilling is something I feel becomes all the more important because here we're talking about a very different kind of a marketplace. So we're talking about, uh, you know, a digital marketplace of which uh, most of the women are not, uh, you know, they don't have a history of using them. They don't have experience in using them. So there has to be kind of capacity and training to look at using first the interface, then see how we can look at uh, growing the business right from, you know, looking at financial literacy to look at digital literacy. And um, uh, WhatsApp has been actually uh, doing some very phenomenal work when it comes to looking at, uh, when it comes to imparting digital financial literacy, particularly for women entrepreneurs. So I think some of the new platforms that are coming up and some of them are actually looking to experiment with new models of literacy are some, you know, I, I feel those are some of the beacons that we can really look to uh, move forward with. Um, access to finance, again, um, I don't, I, I mean, is, is something which is very, very critical, right? And uh, access to finance actually, uh, access to finance actually uh, doesn't only translate into looking to uh, credit, but, uh, you know, access to financial services is what something that we should look at. So, you know, savings, insurance, pensions, so all the entire gamut of financial services is what one should look at. 
Now, policy also plays a very important role here. You know, how conducive is the regulatory environment? What are the kind of tax incentives that are given to women entrepreneurs? How is the ecosystem being organized so that women feel that, you know, they are able to kind of thrive in that ecosystem? The last point that I want to mention here is, uh, you know, the recognition of women in nano enterprises. Now, within the MSME segment, nano enterprises constitute a very large proportion. Right. And this is a segment where, uh, you know, uh, engagement of women is also pretty high. Right. So one thing that also becomes important when we talk about women entrepreneurship is the ability to recognize and acknowledge them as part of your statistics, as part of your data inputs, and then to be able to do something about that, uh, you know. So nano enterprises in itself, I feel, is a segment where women are employed, where there are a lot of women-led enterprises in that segment needs to be looked at. I mean, in India, I think there are close to around 11 million nano enterprises as we speak right now. So that's, again, a very big number. And as per the estimates, it seems that, as per the estimates, it has been mentioned that the segment has uh, an estimated uh, credit demand of close to 50 billion US dollars, right? Um, and the moment we talk about, you know, a credit gap or a credit estimate, uh, the role of digital technology payments, digital public infrastructure, UPIs, and all these things come as, as a natural kind of a fit to enable scale up, to enable access, and to look at improving and impacting women's economic empowerment. So, yeah, so I think uh, these are some of my thoughts. And I think in my last two lines would be that, you know, um, making technology, skilling, financial services, policies work for women is not only good for women, I think it's it's actually a good business for everyone as well. So, yeah, that's where I'll stop. Thank, thank you, Rakhi. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Rakhi. And... I think one of the biggest takeaways from this excellent presentation was that, that if India's uh, uh, growth story has to be sustainable, it has to be engendered growth Absolutely. story. Yeah. And okay. uh, we'll open this out for questions on this excellent presentation. There are a couple of questions already on the chat box. One, of course, is what role can policy play in encouraging women to be entrepreneurs? Are there any sectors where women have better chances of success if they decide to become entrepreneurs? So, thank you so much. I think uh, policy-wise, again, there are a range of policy initiatives that uh, currently, uh, you know, the government of India, you know, has taken, and there's still potential. Like I was mentioning, you know, tax benefits and reforms, the way uh, the schemes and policies are kind of designed, how how you know it needs to be gender intentional rather than you know responding to an equality inequality kind of perspective so i think those are some of the things you know there are uh, if you look at the uh, you know the msme department you know they have schemes that are particularly driven towards women entrepreneurs you know right from uh, you know supporting in terms of you know say gst filing registering your organization so there's a whole range of uh, you know, value chain work that needs to be done and government is actually trying to see how that can become a one-stop shop so that, you know, woman doesn't have to kind of hop into multiple places. So so that there are several, there are several uh, reforms that are there, but I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, sorry, the and next... Huh, sorry, do you word. think the B schools uh, can play a, a, a positive role in encouraging women entrepreneurs? Well, you see, many of the B-schools actually run these accelerator programs and, you know, uh, innovation uh, cohort and stuff like that. They do have a role to play, but I think um, um, at, at some level, you know, uh, it's still only approaching or getting impacted at a certain segment level only. The moment we talk about a level which is low and moderate income segment, right? Um, I think that is the place where we need to make the dent. And I feel that the B school needs to think about that segment a little bit more rather than, you know, uh, looking at, you know, the, the, you know, the innovation cells that most of the B schools have, right? So they, they needs to be a very strong, sustainable, inclusive approach to the entire, you know, programming that any institution does for that matter. Uh, I think um, what you, which you did mention in your, uh, your presentation is there also has to be a paradigm shift in, in 
in how do we create policies and programs to encourage women's entrepreneurship. If the if the entire approach is only to is reactive to change the uh, inequality, then that has only a certain uh, limited success. Until and unless you see women as a huge talent pool of expertise and experience, which has can be utilized. So there you're looking not as women entrepreneurs, you're looking at entrepreneurship and they happen to be women. So yeah. I think there has to be a nuanced and a paradigm shift in the approach as I yeah, can see. Yeah, no, absolutely. That is why we, we need to be very, very gender intentional in all our things that we do, right? So it's it's not really a reactive kind of a momentum that we need to build, but it has to be kind of thought, you know, imagine 50% of the population is not included in the workforce, right? I mean, so it's, you know, so the numbers are kind of, you know, very, very kind of different. Yeah. Uh, I think there was thank you. Are there any... That, are there I any more questions? questions? I think one question was there. Yeah. Uh, how how can how do self help groups? You know how can uh, I can see that on my chat. How do you see self help group movement helping in this regard? Okay. I think self help groups um they certainly are a very good foundation when it comes to kind of drawing uh, collective power and collectiveness. And also to, I think also the SSG bank linkage, particularly in India, that program has certainly provided a big boost in women to, uh, you know, giving them some power to manage money. Okay. Whether it is, uh, you know, just coming and sitting in the team meeting, uh, sitting as a group meeting and, you know, handling cash, right. But also, you know, there are, you know, there are others, there, there's also other side of the coin that, you know, it is just the woman who's transacting, the actual decision is made by the man or a male person in the household. So I think the SHG movement, you know, any movement would have something good, something not so good. But I think as a foundation, it has done a fantastic job. The thrust right now, uh, which I, uh, you know, through my work that I do and, and I engage with a lot of state government um, agencies, the thrust is to look at how do we move SHGs to become, uh, to become enterprises, how do we look at making them micro enterprises? You know, SAGs is 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 the work of the SAG just to uh, you know look at access to credit and maybe just a bit of savings and stuff like that. Does it mean only that, or what should the graduation, what should the trajectory look like for SAG? So I think as a movement, it is a very very important movement, and I think there is a lot of power there. But it needs to get graduated to the next level because the time and era in which we are in, uh, women across rural, urban, poor, they need that kind of a push. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Raki. And we move to our next presentation by Professor Devlina De from the Jindal Global Law University, and she is the Assistant Director at the Center for Law and Humanities. Uh, and she will give us the gender perspective on laws that protect uh, women. Uh, Devlina, your time starts now and let's put it at 12 minutes so that we can open it up for uh, question and answers, if that's fine by you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kanna. Um, and uh, uh, my greetings to all of you and a big thank you to Help Vision and Dr. Anupama Dutta for inviting me to this forum. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, such amazing presentations, such insightful uh, uh, point of views. Uh, I enjoyed listening to the previous two speakers. Um, so I teach sociology at uh, my university and I'm an ethnographer and a qualitative uh, researcher. Um, and I have studied dispute resolution systems and uh, maintenance cases. So I uh, hope to be able to flag off some key issues with respect to uh, the laws that exist for older women, uh, rather than maybe providing some answers. Uh, before I delve into the discussion, um, I'll share an anecdote. Uh, I don't have a presentation, so I'll just keep it in a, a conversational mode. Um, I happened to be in Kolkata, and I was interacting with a few older women who were sex workers in their younger days. Um, I met this one woman um, who, who spent all her life in this profession. She had a son from one of her, one of the men, one of the customers. Uh, she looked after her son with her hard-earned money. That son is now an adult and has gotten married to another woman who is also in this profession. Now, because his wife earns more money, 
uh, he has shifted out and is staying with her and has completely abandoned his mother who is now more of a liability for him the woman uh, the, the woman however did not complain and is always uh, full of good things to say about her son what i saw was that she's languishing on charity these days and like many other sex workers hardly ever even able to step out of her area to access different facilities recreation and so on due to social exclusion um she, the, all of this was narrated to me uh, partly by someone very close to her she did not know about the maintenance and welfare of parents and senior citizens act um uh, and not that she would file a case or, or, or claim maintenance i i wonder like whether she would have if she knew about the law i i doubt she would have um so i wonder what role the law plays in the lives of such marginalized older women why don't we probably begin the legal thinking process by starting with the most marginalized is the law really touching their lives is it bringing about any kind of improvement in their lives so this episode made me think about the limitations of the legal system in terms of its reach for one what some of us can probably do is, is to at least begin to think of how to make the law more accessible and more meaningful for the most marginalized of the older women for example the sex workers uh, or aging trans women childless single widowed women and so on um there are broadly to my mind two ways of understanding discrimination and uh, uh, i think this point becomes important if we are to uh, formulate more effective laws and uh, i'd like to reiterate uh, something that uh, uh, ms kanna had mentioned in the introduction about discrimination as being uh, a continuum of sorts that uh, that is where uh, an older woman uh, who's already been subject to abuse by kin uh, by, by her kin um, previously whether it is in the context of uh, domestic violence by her in-laws or intimate partner violence and so on and it continues into her late life so it's not like a uh, uh, the, the fact that the discrimination happens only because she's uh, an older person so i think discrimination as a continuum is an important framework because there is often a tension between asserting your uh, individual rights as a woman versus the duty to ensure that family harmony is maintained at all costs even if it means that one has to internalize some degree of violence and suffering the responsibility to ensure as we know uh, that it's kind of upon the woman to maintain uh, the familial harmony and uh, there is a hard question to be asked here that is how can we make laws more responsive to those situations where women live um, and, and where the boundaries between the customs and discriminatory practices are blurred we often speak of the extraordinary forms of violence or assault upon women but what about the mundane and ordinary zones of life where uh, discrimination is thriving but are often sidelined and i think that remains a big challenge the other way of looking at discrimination is as a standalone instance of ageism and all those um, so this refers to all those instances of um, discrimination where age becomes the factor for discrimination such as when single women are denied housing when older divorced family less women are blamed for misfortune in the community often tagged as witches and so on uh in the institutional setups in the context of employment when she's denied work uh in the context of care homes when she uh, she is subject to forms of neglect because of her age um some common problems faced by older women uh and it I don't want to repeat the points and therefore I'll just keep it very brief. Um in my own study and observation I find that financial security independence is a big big issue and the sense of being a burden upon uh, the family members is 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 quite a real problem and a challenge for them to deal with. Um often that in fact can lead to forms of abuse and abandonment uh, by families and different institutions. Um the third aspect or third sort of challenge that older women face is that of um, uh, so older women can become very easy targets of coercion and manipulation uh, in the case of propertyed older women many experience abuse after the property has been transferred to their adult children um, so under the pretext of uh, a, a, maybe a false promise of care and so on uh, so after the property has been transferred 
Uh, many older women complain of them being subject to abuse and neglect of all kinds. Another thing that I found in in some of the cases that I witnessed and uh, was part of in the hearings was um, that they are quite susceptible to emotional blackmailing as well, at least comparatively speaking, when I look at older men. Uh, and they're sort of stuck between um, uh, in, in the uh, in in between sibling rivalry of sorts when one child is instigating the mother against the other child to whom the property has been transferred. Uh, and then uh, after transfer of property, there's extreme control over their lives, movements and decisions and, and so on. But then there are those women who, are, who don't even have the property and they're often driven to uh, destitution. Uh, there are concerns of safety and well-being, which um, I will... I'm happy to elaborate later on. on. I don't want to uh, uh, take up too much time. Uh, just a small point about the challenges that I feel those who are uh, who are the protectors of the law or who are the implementing uh, persons. Some of the challenges that they commonly face are one is that there is a refusal to complain. Of course, we know, and there is a Help Age India study on on this as well that how um, the older woman is really hesitant to complain against one's own children because it brings a lot of familial disrepute and so on. The other thing that I've observed is the withdrawal of complaints, um, as it happens in uh, various domestic violence cases uh, that uh, the, the uh, aggressor has intimidated the older woman and she has to take back the case after the initial filing of the complaint. Uh, this happens to younger women also, of course, but I think older women are probably more vulnerable because of their ailments, disabilities, and even dependencies uh, upon their family. So there is a fear of more violence, uh, which makes them probably take back their cases. Uh, the third factor or third point that one can uh, talk about is the internalization of abuse, and that remains a significant uh, issue as well. So how does the law meaningfully orient itself to these things is the question. In terms of the legal remedies that are available, there are different forums uh, that are available for uh, to older women to access justice. Uh, so beginning with the highest court uh, of India, the Supreme Court, the state high courts, there are maintenance tribunals, there are mediation centers, and also legal advocacy uh, and, uh, and, and counseling centers that are uh, run by um, several NGOs. But out of all of this, the maintenance tribunal is the only state forum uh, which is set up in order to, uh, to, to look into maintenance cases and to resolve um, disputes. Uh, very briefly um, about, so there are multiple laws. The, the most, I don't know if I should say the word, use the word comprehensive, but the law which has been designed, formulated for senior citizens is the Maintenance and Welfare um, of Senior Citizens Act. I'll just uh, call it the Senior Citizens Law. Uh, it's a very interesting piece of legislation, and I will uh, just flag off some of the positive uh, aspects to it, uh, uh, positive sides or positive points about the law. Um, so, of course, it does uh, make it mandatory of, for uh, the children to pay the maintenance, as well as the uh, relatives who inherit the property to pay maintenance. Um, there is a provision uh, against abandonment. Uh, the, the law is also being sensitive and mindful because it keeps in keeps in mind the fact that many older women are, um, the property of many older women are fraudulently usurped. They are just taken away by their adult children. So there is a clause for that. Uh, the other few very positive aspects of this law is that there is a strict time limit for disposal of cases. There's a very de-formalized dispute resolution mechanism and so on. Um, then, of course, uh, some of us might be aware of the uh, personal law, the Hindu Adoptions and Maintenance Act of 1956, uh, then the CRPC, the Code of Criminal Procedure, uh, under Section 125, all of that which provides maintenance um, for older people. Then there is there are also very important provisions within the uh, protection of women from domestic violence as well. Now, I will quickly conclude with some suggestions and concluding thoughts. And I'm happy to elaborate on any of the other points I've just mentioned. So um, while laws, I believe, undoubtedly safeguard the rights of older women, it is challenging really to conjure a law for every situation of harm done to older women. Um, as political theorist 
Wendy Brown argues that rights serve as a mitigation, but it's not really a resolution of subordinating powers. So for me, I think laws are more like a post facto repair mechanism uh, where it repairs the brokenness, brokenness of relationships within the family and society. But it doesn't really address the real roots of the problem. And that is where more sensitization, learning um, and unlearning is required. The second point um, I, I think is important is, uh, and also it relates to some of the points mentioned by uh, the previous presenters, is that the care work must be accorded due importance in the political and legal discourse. Many women, uh, women remain engaged in care work throughout their lives, and that may limit her life chances. Uh, this, uh, Devina, you have six, 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay, sure. Uh, so I, I met this uh, uh, eight-year-old uh, woman who told me how she found herself uh, after relocating to an uh, institutional setup and after her husband had passed away. And she said that now she felt free. So uh, I think this is, this is a poignant remark. And it also indicates, one, the need to restore dignity in women's labor. And secondly, um, that there is a demand for these spaces as well. Uh, the last point is that leaving everything to law, I don't think is the right approach uh, for various reasons. Some of the quick reasons. Uh, one is that in my observations, I find different kinds of judgments being given for the same kind of issue. And it depends on the judges. Sometimes the judgments are really liberating and thoughtful judgments. Sometimes they're quite the opposite. And uh, sometimes laws even perpetrate certain kinds of ideas and prejudicial views. So, for example, the Maintenance Act, it sort of re-familiarizes care. And it says that every uh, the, the responsibility of care is, should be with the family. And it kind of... Uh, forgets that families can be a site of violence and uh, what about those people who do not have families so um, I think it's very important to therefore question what the law is responding to and uh, what is it engendering for older uh, women really so I'll end my presentation with these provocations thank you very much thank you thank you Neblina that was very interesting insightful and uh, you're right that law by itself cannot address the issue uh, at hand. But having said that, without the laws, you cannot address the issue either. So the maintenance, uh, the act, despite the fact that the reportage uh, under that act is minimal, but the fact that there is a law like that is a deterrent. It's like a it is a because the, there is the awareness that a legal avenue is available to the older person. So it could act as a, a, a deterrent. And like you said, law itself cannot change or cannot change. It's, it has to be a, a many hands approach uh, to the issue. Uh, there, have, there are a couple of questions uh, here. Uh, one, of course, is and this is interesting that if you had a law against uh, discrimination or like ageism is a discrimination, like we have a law against racism or sexism, would that make a change? Uh, you know, because we uh, look at racist remarks or at sexist remarks and consider that inappropriate, right? But ageism is sort of accepted as part of the cultural norm. So until and unless we make a conscious effort to change our attitude towards aging, uh, that perhaps is the most proactive uh, step that we can take. So the question is, can a law help on that? Right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm kind of on board with you, uh, uh, Meera, ma'am, uh, about what you just said, that um, just having a law would not really solve all the problems. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not really possible. One is in terms of the wording of the law, in terms of the fact that uh, you know, how it, is being, it has been formulated, that is at one level. The issue can be at uh, you know, the formulation of the law. So, for example, the Maintenance Act doesn't really talk about abuse per se, what constitutes abuse and so on. And I've observed there being a gap in the way in which the law operates in the uh, in, in the field, really, and how it is interpreted and applied uh, versus what what is there in the law in terms of the provision. Um, 
Uh, so uh, absolutely, I mean, uh, the law is a deterrent for some. Um, and w- what happens in in case of so one of the things good things about this law is that it tries to promote a more deformalized setup where uh, the different parties, especially the older person, is coming and uh, so it becomes like more of a venting out session. It does have some function. It does play a role, but it doesn't really solve the problem of ageism. But it's it's a kind of a counselling that goes on. The family members are uh, uh, told about what is a good behavior and things like that, which is also can be quite problematic in some uh, contexts. But uh, a simple answer to that would be the law is not able to really solve uh, ageism per se. There's a lot more to that uh, that needs to be done. And also sometimes implementers of the law themselves can be heavily prejudiced. Heavily. So that is another uh, problem to deal with. Uh, that actually takes us to the next uh, session, next uh, presentation. Uh, interestingly, ageism uh, in our country was not part of a cultural norm uh, because the the culture uh, in 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 this part and in many, many parts of South Asia is this uh, extraordinary respect that you gave to lived experience and to the wisdom that you create that you garnered from the lived experience. So ageism has is something uh, which I find is something that has uh, has uh, manifested itself in probably in the last five, six or seven decades. The reasons I'm sure we will be able to find out because the next presentation by uh, Dr. Meera Ramachandran, retired principal of uh, Gargi College, uh, and she is going to talk about portrayal of women in a few select works of Indian literature and portrayal of older women. So, uh, and she's also my namesake. So there was a bit of confusion about the chairing of the sessions. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran, welcome and over to you. So about 11 to 12 minutes and after that we can stop for questions. Uh, Dr. Ramchandran, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. okay. Your, uh, you can start thank you now. So much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, the hosts of uh, Helpage India, for inviting me to address such an enlightened audience, as I can see. Of course, I do feel an odd one, since all the deliberations so far have been squarely rooted in the empirical world, here I am going to take you into a fictional world. Um, Of course, fiction substantially mirrors uh, real life. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the empirical world can sometimes interfere in the creative process coming between the author and the character. And I hope I can give an example that is pertinent to the theme of this seminar. I must also confess that my field of study is Western literature and my knowledge of Indian literature is limited to a few works that I have read purely for pleasure. And as you already pointed out, uh, in the works I've read, an older woman is rarely the focus, the main focus, uh, which validates validates the theme of the seminar. Uh, Somehow, Aging seems to seize as a subject of creative inspiration more of women than perhaps of men. And therefore, your assertion, it's time to counter in, is so justified. Anyway, I'm going to begin with um, uh, two women from one of our oldest texts, the Mahabharata, uh, Kunti and Gandhari. Now, Kunti, as you know, could not get children through her husband. And knowing this, Sage Durvasa had taught her a mantra whereby she can invoke divine beings who can impregnate her. Now, in the typical curiosity of youth, she put this mantra to test even before marriage and through the sun god, she gets Karna. Isn't it amazing what a liberated world that was, that they acknowledged the needs of women's sexuality and motherhood and did not think she had to suffer 
the fate of her husband. So even after marriage, she goes through the same process and gets three sons. And perhaps this is an earliest instance of surrogacy. Well, we know that during the height of the Kurukshetra war, Kunti went to Karna and asked him to hand over his coverage so that he could easily be killed by Arjuna. Now, this is a stunning choice, a shocking choice indeed for a mother to do. But then she was thinking of a cause, in the, a cause that was more important than mother's love, that in the battle between good and evil, Karna was tragically on the wrong side and therefore needed to be sacrificed. Gandhari does something similar. She pleads with Duryodhana to be just towards the Pandavas, but to no avail. When Duryodhana comes to take his mother's blessing before proceeding to the Kurukshetra war, the response of Gandhari, in spite of her adoration for Duryodhana, her response is, may the righteous win. I think, the and, and you will agree with me that these may just be words, but they're actually equal to a heroic action. Both these women have empowered themselves to make choices of words and language that makes them put the sense of right above motherhood and thereby they emerge as keepers of conscience and have become permanent icons in our culture. Thus, in these instances, age and gender intersect to produce a very positive image of the older woman being respected and respectable. But we see quite a different view when we move to the modern age. I'd like to come to the 19th century and deal with two novels, Rabindranath Tagore's uh, Choker Bali and Bani Basu's A Plate of White Marble. Both of these deal with young widows. Now, Tagore's Binodari is extremely beautiful. And Aishwarya Rai, by acting this role in the big screen, has given a face to this beauty. After losing her husband, she comes to live with a friend in her uh, household. Now, the friend's husband is drawn to Binodini's beauty, while Binodini herself is attracted towards the bachelor friend of the husband who visits the house now and then. But this friend is much more drawn to the young wife and does not at all take kindly to the presence of Binodini in the house. Now, Binodini, in frustration, begins to have an affair, an illicit affair on the sly with the husband. What is amazing is that Tagore deals with this situation from a realistic point of view, which is totally morally neutral. Now, there are many twists and turns in the story, but I will cut short to the end where the friend ultimately does propose to Binodini that they elope. But Binodini at this stage has a twinge of conscience and she thinks it is wrong and she gives away her meager wealth to the friend to donate to charity and herself goes off to Kashi. Now in Basu's heroine, Bandana, whose name resonates with Binodini, if you notice, um, she is a darling bahu in her household, but the moment her husband dies, she is shunted to the kitchen and has to wear white, eat terrible food, etc., etc. One day, her uncle comes and seeing her in this condition, takes her away, sets her up in a flat with her young son and gets her a teaching job to make her economically independent. Now, gradually, Bandana settles down to her new life, 
starts shedding the trappings of widowhood and tries to re-engage with life. And meanwhile, the son is growing up. There is one teacher who falls in love with Mondana and he is devoted towards her. But paradoxically, ironically, and tragically, the son is opposed to the mother's remarriage. And Vandana herself, afraid of society in general, quits her job and goes to live in a house for destitute children and there to serve, be a volunteer there. Now, you notice both these women have made self-negating choices. And we know that as they age, they are going to lead a life that is withdrawn and confined within an institutional setting. Is this fair? Because we have seen both of them when young as courageously independent, trying to break the stereotype. Is it they or is it their authors who have surrendered to social compulsions, perhaps with an eye to the reception in the marketplace? I am taking the liberty to put forth this question because Tagore himself, in a private interview, said that he was very uncomfortable with the ending of his novel and he would have rather given it a happy ending. In other words, the author, the character, and the receiving community have colluded to marginalize this widow and keep her, and, and not just marginalize, but also wrap her in the glorious robe of an angel to show her as a volunteer, and I'm putting this in inverted commas, as a volunteer to serve humanity. This reminds me of some Indian men who are probably beating their wives at home, but in a public forum will boast that in India, men worship women as goddesses, as Durga and Lakshmi, in total denial of whitewashing the reality. So you see these two novels present a picture of the aging woman in rather depressing terms. But I'm now going to climax my presentation with a novel by Gitanjali Shri called uh, Reti Samadhi, or The Tomb of Sand, which won the Pulitzer Prize last year. In this, the protagonist herself is an 80-year-old woman. This woman, having recently lost her husband, losing the purpose to live, just lies down on the bed, facing the wall for days together. One day, perhaps triggered by the association of this wall with something, she gets up and decides to re-engage with her life. She moves in with her bohemian daughter, has a wonderful time, with a childhood friend, Rosie, who is incidentally a transgender, sheds her saris, wears kaftans, so much so that the daughter keeps starts wondering who really is the bohemian now. Now, one day, the mother tells the daughter to take her to Pakistan because she wants to uh, visit her childhood home. And the way they cross the Vaga border without a passport or a visa, is rendered by the author in semi-comic, semi-tragic manner, but it asserts the zeal and ingeniousness of an 80-year-old woman. Once in Pakistan, and, and I also realized that the wall, that the wall that she had been facing and which inspired her to get up, perhaps was symbolic of the wall between the two countries. Once in Pakistan... Dr. Ramchandran, 60 yeah, seconds. I'm finishing in two sentences. Once in Pakistan, she uh, we realize that she's actually 
come in search of her former husband, Anwar. And when she finds him, he is bedridden and she falls into his arms to say, Tumhari Chanda. This is the first time we even know her name. Of course, the novel moves forward and has some tragic conclusions, but it is a celebration of the demolition of boundaries. The boundaries between nations, religion, society, and family. It is a release for the old woman from the confines of being a ma to becoming a free individual Prabha, to shed her age and become a young girl once again. Yes, in this novel, gender and age intersect to produce a charmingly positive image. And I would conclude by saying, in this novel, certainly the time has been ushered to count her in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramachandran. That was so riveting, actually. Uh, and uh, let's open this up for uh, questions. Dr. Ramachandran, I just had a, particular, a doubt. Uh, isn't it interesting that during the Mahabharata, that period, the women made very self-assertive choices? And by the time it is the 19th century and the early 20th century, they make self-negating choices. Mm -hmm. So what has changed or what has triggered this rather downward trend in terms of women's empowerment? I, I have, a, you know, a lot has to do with the Industrial Revolution, if you ask me. The Industrial Revolution uh, made uh, material acquisition uh, the center of, uh, of living, you know. And uh, there came about also what we call a middle class morality. You know, the new middle class that came up because of this Industrial Revolution, they for their survival had a code of ethics whereby the women were kept controlled. That, that is a phenomenon that is, that is much researched. If you see the novels of 18th century, 19th century, it is full of women who have to abide by a code of conduct, um, you know, who are not permitted to go out and work. You know, many, many of these uh, things happened and that is why, and, and, and it is shocking to me that even Tagore, known for his liberal views, a kind of capitulated, you know, to give the ending of the novel much against his own native instinct. Uh, you know, so, so I think uh, the modern age has been an age where we have seen commerce and materialism kind of produce a lot of inequality, a lot of class and gender issues, and so on. Uh, the question that has been raised from the audience is, does gender of the author make a difference in treatment of the subject? And this is particularly interesting because you have uh, uh, writers like, like uh, Lalitambika Antarjanam, uh, mm. from Kerala, who was mm. uh, uh, the Nambudri uh, writer, who explores this intersectionality of widowhood and aging and gender. Mm. Uh, and her treatment of this is, um, bit, one, it comes from lived experience. So there is a uh, inherent sensitivity to the treatment of the subject. Yes. So that is the question that is being asked. Yes, yes, this is true to some extent that women can empathize more uh, with other women, can understand the nuances, can understand the uh, shades of uh, uh, instinct uh, and um, uh, stimulations that lead to action, but it is certainly not universally true. One of the writers who has shown a great sensitivity to women is Shakespeare, a man. We have many, many male writers who have written very sensitively about women. Uh, sometimes, sometimes an external perspective helps. We women sometimes may be so biased, uh, yes. so ideologically obsessed, uh, you know, having an agenda that we may sometimes miss the whole truth. 
So I would say this is partially true or substantially true, but not universally and absolutely true. Dr. Ramachandran, thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. And it has kept your audience absolutely riveted. Uh, we move on to the next uh, presentation by uh, Amrita Sengupta. Uh, she's research and program lead at the Center for Internet and Society. And she will be talking on digital inclusion, older women, latest challenge in technology and women. Amrita, over to you and your time starts now. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Meera. And thank you for inviting me here and for having the opportunity, given the opportunity to listen to such lovely sort of uh, provocations and interventions from the other speakers. Um, just a little bit of introduction for the Center for Internet and Society, which is where I work. Um, we're a digital uh, tech policy research think tank. So we look at various issues and we research various topics around digital rights. What are the intersections of digit digitization and society and impacts on um, various demographics or, and, and communities? Um, so I, I kind of want to start our discussion with sort of, uh, I think an earlier uh, participant asked, you know, sort of what is the top line uh, for this particular presentation? And I would say the top line for this presentation is that um, one of the earlier speakers spoke about a discrimination as a continuum. And it is very much in that same frame that we see that, you know, with digital, the exacerbation of the kinds of discriminations that exist online also happen when we move online, uh, from offline to offline, online. Um, so, and, and with the respect to this, I want to speak through three or four broad areas. Um, I want to start with some numbers to sort of, again, contextualize um, this particular conversation where we see that, you know, sort of, where is the internet access today? When we think about the questions of internet access, a report that was taken out by the National Family Health Survey, which was in 2019 to 21, uh, we saw that 57.1% of the male population in India had internet access, while only 33.3% of the female population had ever used the internet. Um, and also just a disclaimer here, when somebody says that it has one has ever used the internet, it doesn't mean that they have internet access necessarily. It just means that they might have used it through a friend or a family member's uh, phone or device or through a cyber cafe. So therefore, like having used the internet is also not the same as having internet access. Now, if we further sort of get this conversation into what it means for uh, elderly population, um, another uh, sort of statistic from Statista tells us that, you know, for populations between 55 years and older, between the sort of uh, years of 2013 and 2019, only 7% of people in, in this age group actually had access to the internet in India. And the projected growth is only to about 26% um, in uh, by the year 2025. So clearly, you know, one of the things to establish here is that, you know, amongst the elderly, the internet access, the point of access in itself is a huge issue, which has already been ex uh, established. Um, now I want to talk to you about a few studies that we've done and, you know, sort of what are some of the findings from there. And I want to start by talking about a study that we had done on digital divide in India a few years back uh, when I was with a different organization. And we actually went on the field and spoke to uh, elderly women, elderly men, and other demographics. Now, one of the striking things to notice here when you actually go to do field work is that women don't occupy public spaces, especially true for elderly women. Um, you could find, um, you know, when you think about the public infrastructure that exists in our country, we don't necessarily see a lot of elderly women, especially when you think about, you know, from the earlier presentation, if they have not been necessarily pushed to do uh, work or uh, have employment and so on. Um, so the, the, the sort of interesting finding from that study was that a lot of women, especially elderly women, wanted to have access to the Internet to manage their finances, which is coming up as sort of a big sort of uh, financial inclusion question. And this also brings us to a study that we're now doing on digital financial risks, vulnerabilities, and harm within CIS. Um, and when we think about digital financing, we're thinking about various platforms, including platforms such as UPI, digital payment platforms, but not limited to that, but also things like digital lending, accessing direct benefit transfers online, accessing basic net banking and digital credit. 
and 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 here we are again trying to sort of speak to elderly and and this is also how uh, we spoke to in fact anupama for this project and one of the things that we're we're sort of looking at is like how are elderly persons thinking about digital finances and and again you know the the sort of challenges that exist in accessing digital finance amongst elderly is varied um i think early, earlier speakers spoke about literacy access um, I want to talk about two things. One is financial literacy, and the second is digital literacy. Um, we know that you know socially, women are conditioned, at least in our country, to have lower financial awareness. As as a as a as a society, our uh, you know women in our society have lower financial awareness than men. The finances within the household are often controlled by the men in the household. And, and what that does is that, you know, when we move all of these services and products online, the digital financial services, it leads to greater amount of exclusion, which is something that we're seeing um, in certain instances. Especially if we think about, for example, uh, we're doing a study on understanding how is this economic control sort of moving when we think about the sort of movement of finances online. And what we're seeing is that a lot of the sort of net banking passwords and things like that continue to be controlled by uh, men in the household and elderly persons in the household who who may have greater understanding and knowledge the other thing to think about is and this is more true for low income households but we even if we think about uh, you know educated households where there are men and women and elderly persons who have had um, education and literacy i want to caution us to the fact that you know having literacy is not the same as having digital literacy especially for persons who belong to the elderly age groups this is also because elderly persons who ex in our society today are not digital natives they have not grown up with access to digital platforms digital services and so on and what that means is that when we move a lot of sort of important significant services online there is already a sort of gap that there is being created on digital literacy now um, and 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 to be able to access these things if we take an example of the time of covid for example a lot of uh, work a lot of services moved online education moved online entertainment moved online and and we know that in a lot of societies even if we think of middle income privileged communities the the way that elderly persons are also interacting within the society is through in person you know you go out for walks you go for yoga clubs and so on so so forth there are studies that actually indicate that during covid because of lack of enough uh, you know significant access to digital media or even social media platforms um, not just access but also literacy and awareness around using a lot of social media platforms it led to sort of greater isolation of elderly persons who were sort of confined to their homes without any real means and uh, you know ways of being connected to their families to their friends and so on um so so that was something that i wanted to talk about in terms of just the financial sort of ways in which some of these uh, you know discrimination is exacerbated now the other thing that i wanted to talk about was also about these emerging technologies that are now being used in financial platforms. And we think about primarily artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence is a self-learning system where you know, a lot of data points are added into the system and it is, it is able to make certain reasonable uh, judgments about, let's say, things like credit worthiness and credit scoring. And, 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 and I, I know that an earlier speaker also sort of reflected on this about credit worthiness. And when we think about especially elderly women, what we would find is that a lot of the data points that are being used by artificial intelligence systems or credit scoring systems online may not actually exist for elderly women who have had primarily offline ways of managing finances or via managing their finances in a largely cash economy earlier. So what that does is that, again, there is a sense of isolation and exclusion that can happen um, when um, you know sophisticated training models and systems are used for uh, sort of deciding who or who will get um, a credit uh, a loan or who will actually be able to uh, access their insurance uh, you know sort of uh, whatever the insurance payments that they will require to make um the other point staying on this discussion on finances is also that there are a lot of new ways in which now elderly women and men are actually entering into the whole digital space but what we are also seeing is that there is also a greater susceptibility for frauds and scams amongst elderly persons um in india and and it has really really sort of and the cyber crime um, you know uh, in, in sort of set up and teams within India are absolutely overwhelmed with the number of frauds and scams that have 
emerged in India, especially for elderly persons with, um, you know, sort of this compounding effect of uh, less digital literacy, sort of very quick leapfrogging to digital financial methods and not really knowing how to sort of, and, and I can give you several examples, but to share one perhaps is, um, you know, somebody I know had received um, a message on Facebook, which was an impersonation of their friend. And then they were asked to sort of send um, 10,000 rupees online. And then they, you know, took help with some, from somebody and, you know, fell part of that scam. And then they gave money to a, 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 a essentially who would have been an impersonator. So there are a lot of these also kinds of financial risks that exist when we move online, which need to be sort of thought about, especially for persons, elderly women who are who have multiple axes of sort of discriminations and vulnerabilities that they already come from. Now, um, and to think a little bit more about like, what are the various points of solutions or policy that one can think about. Um, there is a, the, uh, under the Digital India program, there already exists a uh, Pradhan Mantri Digital uh, Shiksha program, which is to actually create greater digital literacy, especially amongst women and girls. But there are also systemic and platform questions that one needs to think about. Um, to, what I mean by this is that when we think about questions of design, there is often amongst the big tech providers or the platforms that are actually designing a lot of these systems, whether you think of social media, whether you think of fintech platforms, digital lending platforms, they are often designed with a particular user in mind. And the visual of that user is almost never an elderly woman um, or, or, or elderly persons. If you think about the original or the very initial smartphones that came came to be, they were actually designed for a man hand that will actually is a man's hand. It's not a woman's hand. And, and if you think about various desks in our schools, they were designed for a right-handed person and not a left-handed person. So design is a very important question that we must ask when we think about who are you thinking about when you actually design and to actually keep in mind edge cases where let's say elderly women are a particular user group, but are they forming a part of your user research? Are they forming a part of your UX research? or once your platform has actually been designed, are they being tested with elderly women is a question one must ask and should be pushed for. The other thing is also uh, within India particularly important is the question of languages. We know that most platforms and a lot of the digital platforms that exist today primarily exist in English and at best Hindi in India. And, and to think about that having digital literacy, financial literacy, again, is not in, in, in enough because languages also play a very important role in being able to access the sort of data or the information that is being shared. And the last- Amrita, a minute to wrap up, please. Sure. And the last bit I want to talk about is accessibility where um, and reasonable accommodations. Technology can play a big role in actually creating accessible in, uh, accommodations in our digital financial studies. We're also finding how tech can make it actually more easier for persons with visual impairment. And again, with women, there might also be at older ages, different kinds of accessibility needs. And technology should be used to enable that kind of those kinds of accommodations um, for um, uh, persons with disabilities, but also particularly elderly women who already face different kinds of uh, discrimination. And I will pause there. Thank you, Amrita. That was excellent. And uh, you're very right. Uh, the, the public spaces is a male universe. So you, you rarely see uh, women. And um, women, you don't even see elder, elderly women. Uh, the digital divide uh, has worked against women at this moment. They were just getting over the literacy part of it. And then came the digital illiteracy, which has actually put them uh, further. Uh, and some of the points that you raised that how do you make it uh, user friendly? Because uh, manufacturers and software operators do not see a huge target audience of digitally literate uh, elder women. That is why the programs are not designed in such a way. For example, even a, 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 a portal that is open only for, uh, say, a limited seconds a older woman may find it very difficult to do it fast enough to ensure that you don't cross the limit or even the size of the keypad you know your keypad your your keypads are so close to each other that when you uh, when you put an m it could also be an n with the result you have lots of issues like that which i think organizations like yours are definitely going to work 
on 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 a digitally uh you know sense it uh, a digital program which is gender sensitized or gender through the gender lens uh i think we have a question uh, for you uh do we need special provisions in the law to protect women from digital frauds you know i am not so happy with so much of law because uh the more uh, legal avenues we keep opening the more avenues there is for uh, litigation and a lot of precious time lost so how isn't there a system of of creating such strong awareness of the procedure and the processes that can protect the elderly against digital fraud sorry anupama i just put in a, my two bits there thanks thanks for that uh, ma'am and, and and thanks for the question i think um, you know one of the ongoing sort of discussions within the tech policy space about laws generally on digital you know sort of governing digital mechanisms is um, there is an understanding that technologies are going to move much faster than laws can come in to actually make uh, you know, sort of interventions for them. If we think about artificial intelligence think today, we think about chat GPT, um, we think about the spread of mis and disinformation online. There are a lot of emerging issues that are happening today and will continue to come up. And laws might find it very, very hard to actually keep up with the pace of technology. I think um, one of the things that a lot of organizations like us or others are doing is to provide sort of um, mechanisms for redressal, mechanisms for creating a awareness, like Meera ma'am said, um, to be, and, and pot potentially to have greater sort of government interventions to think about how can we create uh, more awareness programs that actually prevent such kinds of frauds. Um, because the, the question of digital fraud is very interesting, because a lot of time it is not something that is illegal that the scammer has done. They have asked you to give you an OTP, which you have yourself given, and then they have been able to withdraw money. And often enough, it is very hard to sort of bring that into a legal framework of how can we, and which is why a lot of the digital frauds, actually the scammers continue to be outside because the, within the legal current provisions, it doesn't have. So I don't know if the law would be the right answer or greater, like Mira Ma'am said, awareness, greater sort of stringent, um, actually at a systemic level to allow for, you know, when even when we are thinking of digital lending platforms, today there are so many legit digital shadow lending platforms, which is targeting low income users uh, by telling them that, you know, you can just access credit with a very, with very low protection, but then, you know, then they are getting scammed. So how can we have at a systemic level, can the banks, the NBFCs, provide stricter controls on who gets into the market than actually having legal uh, penal provisions for the later stage when the fraud has already occurred. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that response. Are there any other questions? Uh, uh, okay. Not on the Thank chat. Thank you. Um, there's, there's a question what? in the chat? No, there's no, no other question on the chat. And I don't see any okay. hands also. So I'm assuming that Okay, thank you. Thank you, Devlina. And we move uh, for, towards the next presentation by uh, Rubab Mohsin, who's a research scholar at the Aligarh Muslim University. And uh, she'll be talking on aging with dignity. How can cities accommodate older women? Excellent. Looking forward to hearing from you, Rubab. And your time starts now. Ruba, are you there? Hello. Hello. Yeah. I'm yeah. audible. We can, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, Anupama, ma'am, and Helpage India for pro providing me this incredible opportunity. I am deeply grateful to share this platform with esteemed and experienced individ individuals in this field. Thank you, Meera, ma'am, for introducing me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Rubab Mohsin, and I am a research scholar at the Advanced Center for Women's Studies, Aligarh Muslim University, Aligarh. While I may not have as much experience as my fellow ex speakers, I am excited about my recent journey in this area. And I hope to learn immensely from this wonderful webinar and look forward to gaining valuable insights from the expertise gathered here. Today, uh, we gather to explore a theme that resonates deeply with all of us, enabling environment for a fulfilling life in old age for women. 
Before we delve into the details, let's take a moment to appreciate the wealth of experiences and contributions that older women bring to our communities. Today's discussion is not just about addressing challenges, it's about creating an environment that recognizes and nurtures the unique journey of older women. So, what do we, uh, what do we mean by an enabling environment for fulfilling life in old age? It's a comprehensive concept that goes beyond physical accessibility. It's about crafting communities where every aspect from infrastructure to social engagement is, de is designed to contribute to the well-being and fulfillment of older women. Let's start with the foundation that is urban design, a city that enables a fulfilling life for older women prioritize accessibility. From age-friendly public spaces to thoughtfully designed transportation systems, the physical environment must empower them to navigate the city easily and independently. Moving beyond the infrastructure, community engagement becomes a cornerstone of creating an enabling environment. Social programs, intergenerational initiatives, and inclusive community spaces provide opportunities for older women to connect, share experiences, and actively participate in the social fabric in our, of our cities. Creating an inclusive in environment is not just about ticking boxes. It's about recognizing the profound impact it has on the lives of older women. When our cities are designed to embrace diversity and ensure the participation of older women, we witness a ripple effect of positivity, resilience, and shared wisdom. Let's not forget the importance of age-friendly services. From healthcare to recreational facilities, creating an enabling environment involves tail tailoring services to meet the unique needs of older women. Accessible healthcare and engaging recreational opportunities contribute significantly to their over uh, overall well-being. Before I conclude, I want to share some valuable insights from my research, specifically focuses on the experiences of older women residing in Aligarh city. Uh, the findings shed light on the unique challenges they face while navigating public spaces. In the context of a small, smaller city like Aligarh, the urban design plays a vital role and significantly impacts the daily experiences of older women in various ways. Uh, they mentioned issues like uh, issues with streets and roads. A central concern highlighted by respondents revolves around streets and roads, often congested with cars and other vehicles. And these environments are described as unhealthy, unwelcoming, and unsafe. Uh, next challenge they faced it uh, because of lack of proper infrastructure. Uh, one recurring issue, issue is the need for proper infrastructures to support the needs of older women. As they traverse the outdoor places, the absence of accessible toilets poses a significant problem because in old age, holding urine is a major issue. Next, they face the difficulty with the transport system. Uh, one of the challenges older women face in public, place, public places is transport facilities. The public tra road transport system needed several aspects like bus station, bus stops, bus designs, overcrowding, uh, overcharging, and misbehavior by route operators. Uh, uh, when I ask about the social engagement opportunities, so uh, the social engagement opportunities for older individuals in Aligarh are quite restricted. Uh, they were uh, they were mainly indulging in the household shows uh, as compared to the older men. So uh, the places where they uh, socially interacted with others like the parks and community centers in their localities. And some residential complexes feature dedicated parks and green spaces designed for the enjoyment of residents for all ages, including the elderly and the children. And some of them are residing in such areas and can visit parks for regular walks. Next, they visited to the public parks also. And local parks and neighborhood areas are the primary public domain where older women communicate. And the observed social interactions include the unplanned conversation, strolling, and family gathering. And... Uh, um, uh, and for some older women, public places also serve as employment workspaces. Many individu individuals find purpose and fulfillment in contributing to the community 
and public spaces provide avenues for them to offer their skills, knowledge, and time. And this involvement allows them to stay active and reinforces their sense of purpose and value within the society. And uh, now I am concluding uh, by actively working towards creating environment that enable fulfilling lives for older women. We contribute not only to their well-being, but also to the vibrancy and richness of our communities. It's a shared responsibility and an opportunity for growth, connection, and a future where every woman can age with dignity and fulfillment. As I speak before this esteemed gathering, I am not only here to share my research findings, but also to humbly seek the valuable expertise of those present. Uh, your wealth, knowledge, your wealth of knowledge and experience in an invaluable resource. I would be deeply grateful for any suggestions, insights, or recommendations you may have regarding my research on the challenges faced by older women in Aligarh city. Uh, in public spaces. Your input will undoubtedly contribute to the depth and quality of my study and I welcome any guidance you may offer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rubab. That was so beautifully presented. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, I am looking for uh, anyone who has a question from your excellent presentation. Uh, but I have uh, one. What do you think is the the biggest challenge uh, that we face in making our public spaces uh, geriatric friendly? Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, they face uh, various challenges while uh, navigating public spaces like uh, transportation issues and uh, I'm talking about what what is the challenge that that stops us from what is the challenge that stops governments and communities from making spaces gender friendly and geriatric friendly? Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, they are not uh, considered elderly, uh, elder. Uh, Ma'am, Ma they are not considered elderly people as. Uh, uh, Ma'am, they, I... uh, they are not important enough. Yes, ma'am. They are not incorporating their problems uh, in the service. Ma'am, um, uh, there is a smart city mission where they included elderly women, uh, elderly issues, but uh, they are not, uh, uh, ma'am, bilkul achche se nahi kiya. Matlab, unhone provision provide kiye hain waha pe, lekin wo abhi apply nahi huye hain for making uh, uh, elderly, matlab, elderly uh, population ke liye. Ji. Uh, you said that transportation ke liye, uh, that is trans transportation has to be uh, uh, user friendly. Yes, uh, ma'am. One more thing is that last mile connectivity is very low in our transportation system. Yes. You can go from the metro and you have to go somewhere else. So, your last mile connectivity is very low in our transportation system. Wo neither gender friendly hai, neither is it geriatric friendly. Yes, ma'am. Definitely. Right? Yes, ma'am. Or dusra hamara spaces jo uh, safe nahi hai, or to kili to safe hai hi nahi, to buzurgong kili bi or bi unsafe. Yes, ma'am. To yes, ye ek challenge uh, banta hai, hai na? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. I will definitely incorporate it in my study. Thank you. And any questions? Or we can move to the. Uh, uh, I think we we move to the next segment, ma'am. No questions in the chat. Thank okay, you. Thank no question. Thank you, Rabat. That was thank excellent. You, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, our next presentation is by Dr. Rachel Albon, a consultant, aging and health unit, Department of Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health and Aging of the WHO and uh, the presentation will also be shared by Dr. Uh, Jiang. Uh, the topic is uh, life course approach, way to healthy and active aging for women. And I'm looking uh, forward to this uh, presentation on active aging for women. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'll share my screen if that's okay. We have some slides. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my slides. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank HelpAge India for inviting us to join today's webinar. Um, so as uh, our chair has mentioned, um, this is a joint presentation by myself and my colleague, Hiobong, um, and we're going to be sharing some of what WHO is, is working on and thinking in relation to older women and healthy aging. Um, I think we've covered this. I think uh, our chair did a fantastic job of highlighting some of the demographics we're seeing um, around the world with older, with women living longer than men everywhere around the world and therefore making up um, a larger proportion of older people. So I won't focus too much on this. But I wanted to add that not only do we know that women live longer than men, we also see that women live a greater proportion of their later life in poorer health than men. So we know that between uh, the years of 2000 and 2019, there was an increase in the gap between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy for both women and men. But that increase was greater in women. So between 2000 and 2019, the gap between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy increased by one year for men from 7.3 to 8.3 years, but it increased by 1.3 years for women from 9.7 to 11 years. So you can see there the, the extra amount of time that, that women are living in poorer health. And I think this graph kind of really demonstrates that that is a pattern that's repeating across all regions of the world. So just to um, say a little bit around what we know in terms of how that poorer health for older women plays out. And we have some evidence, some data around specific health conditions, specific diseases. So we have evidence that shows, for example, that women, older women live with lower levels of intrinsic capacity and functional ability than older men. And we see this in weaker hand grip strength and slower gait speed in older women. We also consistently see um, higher prevalence of both urinary incontinence and low back pain in women. And we know that 8.1% of women, older women around the world are living with dementia in comparison with 5.4% of older men. And we also know that mental health is um, more of an issue for, for older women. So older women are more likely to be experiencing depression or anxiety. And you can see the stats here on the screen for, for older women compared with older men. And then, then another factor is menopause. So we know that women's bodies change during the menopause. This includes a reduction in bone mass and bone density. And so this explains why we see um, much higher rates of osteoporosis in older women than older men. And I just wanted to highlight that we don't only see these challenges and these issues in relation to health. When we're thinking about healthy aging, we're looking beyond health. We're looking to other factors in, um, in older people's lives. And, and I think some of this has been covered in the presentations we've already heard this morning. Um, so I won't focus too much on this. But as we've heard, you know, for older women, we often see this combination, this intersection of sexism and ageism coming together. And we also see the accumulation of discrimination and disadvantage that has happened across a woman's life course. Um, that presents significant challenges in older age. I also wanted to highlight some of the challenges around data. So on my last couple of slides, I've been able to give you some data, some statistics in terms of the experiences and the situation of older women around the world. But we really wanted to highlight that we have a significant challenge in terms of data there's a lot that we don't know, we don't understand well enough, um, because older women in particular still tend to be excluded from data. 
So we see the frequent exclusion from research activities and, and particularly clinical trials. Um, we still rarely see appropriate or adequate disaggregation of data by age and sex. So that leads to a gap. Um, we also see a lot of prominent surveys that exclude older women by only focusing on women of a certain age, and that tends to be women up to the age of 49. And we also see um, really limited research that is sex or gender specific. So therefore, we don't necessarily understand the specific interventions and responses needed for older women. So in the face of all of this, um, we wanted to highlight a bit about what WHO is doing in response. So last year, we partnered with the White Ribbon Alliance and a range of implementing partners, including HelpAge India, to undertake a project called Women's Health and Wellbeing, Listening Across the Lifespan. And over the course of the year, we asked one million women around the world in 14 countries um, what they wanted for their health and well-being. And of that one million women, 15% were aged 55 and over. I've summarized on the slide here some of the most um, frequently heard demands from older women. You can read those on the slide. And I think a project like this is important to WHO because it gives us a greater understanding of, of what's important to older women and the situations they're facing. But it also helps to, um, to enable older women to have a voice and to feel heard and to hold service providers in particular to account. So some of the other things we've been doing. In 2022, WHO published its first fact sheet on the menopause. And we'll be following this up by including menopause in planned self-care guidelines on sexual and reproductive health. Um, in our work as a team, the Aging and Health Unit, we're, we're working this year on um, our integrated care for older people approach and, and doing some updates to, to that work. And we plan to include some more gender specific considerations, including around urinary incontinence, but also um, support and engagement of caregivers. In 2023, we published the first WHO guideline on the management of chronic primary low back pain. And we know that the majority of people who are affected by low back pain are women and significantly older women. And then in relation to the data point, we're also calling for improved age and sex disaggregated data, but also um, working towards appropriate gender sensitive monitoring of the UN decade of healthy aging. And in relation to the decade, we published our first progress report on the decade at the end of last year. And we tried to include a focus on older women um, within that report by highlighting a number of initiatives and projects being implemented by different stakeholders around the world. So I wanted to, to finish up just by highlighting a couple of those and then I'll hand over to, to Hiabum. Um, so one project we thought was interesting was um, in the UK, it was an art and research project, which was focused on inequalities being faced by women, older women in relation to work and the discrimination they felt in relation to their age, their gender, their ethnicity, disability and migration status. And this was an interesting one as um, older women were interviewed live in an art gallery so that visitors to the gallery could, could hear and read what the women were saying. And then the interviews were um, transcribed and um, analysed by researchers to inform policy asks. And with this one, not only were the participants older women, but the whole research team were older women as well. Uh, we have a couple here. So... Um, in the USA, there is um, a project focused on personalized care for perimenopausal and menopausal women um, with a focus on providing a comprehensive assessment, but also thinking about how we can improve referral and communication between specialist healthcare providers and family doctors. And a final point um, that I'll leave you with is a project in Argentina, which was the establishment of a center for older women who've experienced gender-based violence. Um, it's a place where older women can go for psychosocial support, for training, for advice, and to report what's happened to them. And it's the first of its kind um, to be opened in Latin America. 
So on that note, I'm going to stop and hand over to Heerbom to talk about um, the gendered nature of long-term care. Over to you, Heerbom. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so I'd like to just mention briefly on some of the care gender issues in caregiving for all the people. So as we know, the majority of informal and unpaid carers for family members are women around the world. And all the women often need to provide care to their families. We know that all the women spend more time than men on paid care and domestic work. And most of family carers are women. And Although they provide a lot of uh, care work, they don't necessarily receive education or training to provide proper care. And there is a strong need for them to you know, build their capacity to provide care. And at the same time they are providing care, they also are care recipients, especially older women, but because of their duty and responsibility and caregiver, their needs are not really visible while they have duty in their families. And also, while having this uh, duties of uh, caregiving, they may experience more easily the negative effect caused on clinical and social conditions such as abuse or violence. Next, please. From the same reference of the Decade of Healthy Aging Progress Report, we also have a case study from Thailand that the research was done to assess the impact of COVID-19 on older women. It, it found that the gender roles of older women on care informal work and poorly paid work have been made ex more exposed to COVID and also it prevented them to seek proper health services. And even those informal unpaid carers are not eligible for public financial systems, which also worsen their income security. Next, please. In South Africa, there was a, a initiative involving women carers in the community. So not just in this country, but in many uh, parts of the world, as we heard from our colleagues. Uh, Many NGOs and non-profit organizations are working closely with the community people, including women, and uh, they are trying to provide care where they select of our former systems. Next, please. In one of the recent publications from the WHO, there were some interventions suggested uh, to mitigate gender inequalities and access to long-term care. So the lesson is that top policies and programs should be designed to address gender disparity and uh, obvious purpose and policy target to support uh, women, older women and women carers. And its output and outcome should be monitored and measures. Otherwise, although the, the design the target policies and programs might positively affect uh, the women, support the women or the women, it should be uh, really targeted and monitored. Next, please. Dr. Yang, you have a minute to Yes, thank you. This is up, a Yeah. So as Rachel already mentioned, the WHO needs to better understand the women's care needs, especially from low income countries. And also we need to develop Asian gender friendly environment, especially in health and care settings. And we need to share the good practices. And like today, we are really keen to collaborate with actors, stakeholders and partners around the world from UN partners to civil society, partners, academia, to work on this women and gender issues in aging and care. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yang and uh, Dr. Rachel. Uh, uh, I'm not seeing any questions on the chat, but uh, Dr. Uh, Rachel, I'm glad you emphasized on the lack of data uh, on older uh, women. And I somehow feel that the fact that there is not enough uh, data on uh, older women 
actually is indicative of, I think, their devaluation. They're not even considered important enough to be counted. Uh, so how do we how do we change uh, this generation of data? Because there can be no uh, effective policy or program created until and unless we have data, which is both a report card as well as a management tool. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it is about a devaluation of, of older women. I think it's also um, a reflection that for a long time, um, people have considered women as, as reproductive beings. So what people find interesting and important to collect data on is linked to women in childbearing age um, and women's reproductive health. It doesn't go beyond um, the age of menopause. Um, so I think that has to be challenged. It's um, something that lots of organisations, civil society, um, ourselves and our team is increasingly challenging. Um, but it's a kind of deeply embedded problem, I think. Um, I think we need to tackle this on a number of fronts. There's, um, there's the people, the organisations that manage the surveys that collect this data, that get used in countries around the world. Um, you know, there's an influencing job there to change those surveys. There's advocacy needed with, with governments so that they more clearly understand why it's important to collect data on older women and go beyond these kind of age brackets in these surveys. Um, there's also the organisations that fund countries to implement these surveys. You know, a lot of the, the surveys that collect data for the SDG monitoring, for example, um, are really big projects, really big pieces of work that cost a significant amount of money. And there's often external funders that support that work. And I think they need to be um, influenced to, to see the importance of funding extended research with older women as well. I think it's, um, it's a huge challenge, but you're right. It speaks to how we value and perceive um, older women. And we know it's a cliche, but we know that what gets monitored, what gets what is known, gets implemented, gets done. And so the longer we go on not fully understanding the situation of older women, the harder it is for us to to respond um, appropriately to their needs. Thank you. Uh, we move on to the last presentation. Now we have of one this. final poll question, which we'll quickly put up. Okay. And what's the result of this question? Ma'am, we'll just put it up. Okay. Strongly disagree. Okay, some are neutral it. also. I mean, I'm some I'm a little surprised, but some are neutral as well. Those are the people we should actually uh, speak yeah, with. Yeah, the neutral. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, ma'am. You can proceed now. So we invite the last uh, uh, presenter for this day, Dr. Renu Varghese, uh, chairperson of the Travanco Foundation. And she's going to talk about the role of women in community care uh, models, successful experiments from Kerala. And uh, Dr. Varghese, we are all years waiting to hear the successful best practices from that from that state over to you thank you miss kanna for that lovely introduction uh, first i want to wish all the women here a happy international women's day i also want to extend my um uh, sincere thanks to the health page team especially miss anupa anupama uh, for inviting me, and it is a pressure of mine to join this webinar. Um, I am actually joining from New York. It's very early in the morning here. And thank you so much uh, for all the speakers that went before me, and uh, especially um, the speaker just before me, and I think there's a segue that I could start with um, the caregiving models. 
Um, so I know that um, it's only a few minutes that I have left here. So I just want to speak and touch upon three major areas. Uh, that is uh, informal caregiving is an overview. And then of course the Kerala scenario and the dimensions of caregiving and the role of women in community um, care models in Kerala. So if you can advance the slide, next slide for me, please. Um, I, I had been listening to all the women here who spoke, all these presenters here who spoke before me. So it was the common theme that I could um, see that woman as strong force, not live at home, but also in communities and also in the society at large, societies at large. And uh, the previous presenter had said that globally women are the predominant pro providers of informal care for family. Uh, globally, at least 70 to 80% of the informal care is being given by women. And um, caring for elders is also a family affair that is mainly carried by women because of the social connections and family ob obligations and so on. And it is also notable that older women um, live outlive men. So they give care for longer time and they spend more time providing care and carrying out personal care tasks uh, care tasks for older than men. Um, so they are more exposed. And I think we just heard from uh, the previous presenter that because of that caregiving task, they are more um, likely to report greater strain, burden, distress, and negative psychological effects. So I'm not going to go on uh, because this is what we've been talking about. Um, so this is what is globally true is true in India and all the states of India. We have the same concepts that women being um, in dual role most of the time they work outside of the home and also they are the major care providers, whether they are spouses, wives, uh, most probably adult daughters. Um, daughters-in-law and even granddaughters. And you know, uh, women, middle-aged women are being termed as a sandwich generation because they have to take care of their children, probably granddaughters, and um, also in addition to taking care of their older parents. So women usually sacrifice their career, they pass up their promotions and lucrative jobs. And some of them mainly have to leave their own family members if, because to take care of their older parents and they have negative financial implications as well. So this is the common thread that goes through the entire, entire nation of India and Kerala cannot be any different. But I just wanted to mention few of the salient features of Kerala uh, being the Southern state of India. And then we will, I will focus on the community workforce um, led by the women in Kerala model. Next slide, please. So if you see the age composition of senior citizens in Kerala, this is not different from anywhere in the world or in India. Um, so you see that 60 to 69 and 70 to 79 and 80 plus women are more. Women outlive, uh, outlive men. So they are um, uh, proportionally more in all age, um, age, age of the population. So. Uh, they are the one who primarily give care to their spouses and also the informal caregivers. Next slide, please. So um, coming to Kerala facts, um, Kerala is the southernmost southern state of India with the highest percentage of 60 uh, above population. That is almost 16.5% or 18 when compared to the national average of 8.6 or 10%. Um, Kerala is also termed as the immigration pocket of India. As you know, uh, many uh, immigration, many uh, youngsters and also many families immigrate and that especially now more than 35,000 students migrate. Probably it might be more as we speak of 2024. Uh, they mostly students migrate to other countries and also more than 12 lakh homes are vacant in Kerala because of that. Um, so Kochi, one of the city is um, declared as the dementia friendly city as of 2023 April. And also WHO, you recently Kochi joined the list of WHO, the first of what I think the first city in Asia to be age friendly city uh, as declared by WHO. So Kerala has many positive um, 
positive facts to say. Um, however, elder care is um, at a dif difficult stage now because of the immigration. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So literacy rate in Kerala is 96.2% and women literacy is 90%. And uh, it's not worthy to mention one of the oldest 96 years old, Karthia Niyama, who scored the highest marks in the actual election test, a fourth standard equivalent examination few years ago. She was 101. She passed away a few months uh, before in 2023. And she received a Nari Shakti Award from the President of India in 2020 um, Women's Day. And she became a Commonwealth of Learning Goodwill Ambassador in 2019. Um, so we have strong women, strong independent older women in Kerala who lives alone. If you go to the next slide. So this is the impact of migration in Kerala. Many older women are living alone. Their children are away either um, outside of Kerala, outside of India. And so many of them have intermittent help from uh, a domestic worker or something, but may, majority of the time they are alone. So if you, the statistics shows that 10.1% of, of older women live alone. And out of that 60 to 64 is 7.5%, 75 to 79 range is 11.3% and 80 plus 10.3 percent. So this is the impact of immigration that um, Kerala is undergoing now, uh, that many houses are empty or many houses with just older people living either alone or older spouses alone. Next slide. So the family caregiving dimensions are the same, but I just wanted to make sure that um, you know, Kerala care dimensions may be a little different just because of the facts that I mentioned before. So the time dimension, people giving short-term care, intermittent care, and long-term care. Short-term care is when um, elderly parents undergo a major surgery or acute illness, then the caregivers, the daughters, daughters-in-law, or granddaughters have to temporarily uh, take off from their work and they have financial implications, but it is it is not permanent. So they go back to work after that uh, acute stage is over and the parents are okay. Then the intermittent care, that is the maintenance care that um, they need continuous care to take them to the doctor's office, medication management and um, activities of daily living, all that, that they may need some supervision on a daily basis. And the last, and that is, is the long-term care, uh, most probably 80 plus. And I think people become, uh, when they become uh, more dependent on care, they cannot uh, be alone or they cannot even take care of themselves without the help. They become long-term care. This is where the family caregivers, informal caregivers go through a series of changes in their life. They might have to give up job. They might even have to give up the family to come back from wherever they are, and then they have to take care of their older parents. So there is um, a geographic dimension. Mostly what we see in Kerala is the long-distance caregiving. Um, the long-distance caregiving, I, you know, including me, my parents are alone, so I just always have to make a call different times of the day to make sure that they are okay. The, the caretaker came home or they have food on the table. So these are some of the some of the hardships that the long distance caregivers go through uh, because of the geographic dim dimension. The distance between the care receiver and the caregiver is much farther and it's getting it's longer and longer or wider and wider. The financial dimension is that long term care and also uh, elder care is getting uh, to be very expensive. The medications are expensive. Most of them may not have um, any type of pension and family giving up their jobs and, you know, because without financial security, they are going through um, a difficult time. And especially when people live with chronic diseases, you know, they have to have ho much um, hospitalization very frequently. They have a lot of medications and that costs money. So that is a financial dimension. Emotional dimension, 
In addition to caregivers giving physical care, you know that it depends on the emotional status, um, especially people living with Alzheimer's, dementia. We need to we need the caregivers or the informal care caregivers that the family members need to give, need to make sure that they are also getting that emotional part covered. So that um, is very critical. And um, last is residential dimension. You know that all older parents or older, all of us want to be at home for, um, you know, till, till the last day, but it is not going to be possible because of the lack of caregivers and there is a disproportion between care receivers and caregivers. And that is that is the residential um, dimension that we see. Next slide, please. So now I want to focus on a few things that how the social engineering of the Kerala model and how it is effective. So um, Kudumba Sri is, um, is uh, it was implemented as a part of uh, state state um, uh, state scheme to prevent uh, poverty and eradication of the poverty. So it's a community network that addresses um, or helps the government many different levels. So it works as a three tier. The first one is neighbor neighborhood groups or Ayal Kotam in Malayalam. Uh, the next is at least the neighbor, neighborhood groups is at the primary level, and area development societies at the ward level. And the community development societies, of course, it's at the state government level. Kudumbasri has completed 25 years this year. So it has done tremendous job in making sure that it works with the local um, local, um, local panchayat and also to the state government. So as you know, ASHA workers is the liaison between society and the public health system. They report to National Rural Health Mission. So what worked well is the layered system that the Kudumbasri people work with ASHA workers. And uh, that is how it strengthened the community uh, for the public health system and also for the daily um, local functions. So I just want to mention- sorry for, sorry for interrupting. You have a minute to wrap up. Okay. That's all. I just wanted to mention a few things that um, the social of uh, the Kudumbasri people working during the COVID season, they worked on uh, mask making and sanita sanitary, sanitary products. And they also now started with the community kitchen that they, uh, they pack an extra lunch for people who are hospitalized and their families. And they have counseling assistance to eradicate um, uh, the addiction for drug and alcohol. They have um, counseling sessions that work with the excise department um, and also Swastium, the wellness project that they work for vertical as work for the cancer prevention and early detection. And also um, Nirpaya volunteers for domestic abusers. And they have a Snehida project for uh, people to call upon if they want help with this um, abuse women and Vyomitra uh, for elder care that people are who are isolated. They provide care for them and to provide assistance and to give one-on-one -on -one care. Um, so, and Swastiam is the wellness project portal that anybody can be a part of Kudumbasri. Uh, it's voluntary. Um, they can just part of the, they can just go in and apply and then be a part of the voluntary program that Kerala has. And these are some of the very effective models that Kerala uh, state government has provided to the community. And I think WHO appreciated and they, um, uh, this, this model, and it can be a replication of, the model can be replicated to other societies as well. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to just touch upon few things uh, from the Southern part of India. Dr. Verghese, thank you so much for that uh, excellent presentation. I just had a quick question. What is the role of religious institutions in providing uh, uh, geriatric friendly care uh, as part of their outreach? So what I have mentioned so far is some of the um, United projects, but in addition to that, there are many 
uh, individual based work that's going on for especially uh, uh, people not there are many religious organizations that take part in um, distributing clothes, distributing food, um, and also even home visits. There are that that is happening, and also on individual basis, there are people who just go to hospitals and take care of the uh, isolated people and deserted, destitute, and these things happening all over Kerala. These are not accounted for because it is very much uh, from the you know uh, from personal uh, sources and religious sources, church, temples, and many of the other organizations as well. Uh, we have a very interesting question. Can any of the projects that you have mentioned about from Kerala be replicated in other parts of the country? Uh, country? Yes. Uh, of course, incorporating the local uh, culture, cultural nuances. Yes, of course. And I think that's where I ended because um, when WHO has... Um, praised Kerala for this project, they also said it could be replicated. And I think, um, especially in Indian states, we do not differ from any other states and we have just the common thread that runs across all our states, um, and, you know, culturally, uh, just few differences probably because geographically. Because this Kudumbasri project, actually, it is neighborhood groups of women coming together for self um, help groups and for some of the, you know, in, in, to be their interconnected groups in their own panchayat, in their community. And then it gets connected to wider groups. And then finally, it goes to the ward level and it's to go to the state level. And I think that is a that is a model that can be replicated because it is nothing but voluntary. Any adult woman with, with time and energy and willingness can be a part of this. So it is. It is any anybody who is willing to give some time, or uh, uh, is able to work towards just to building up the society. Because I think women um, is the strong source that that help the uh, help other women, and we are uh, resourceful in many ways. Not only helping the individuals at home, but then you know it can be spread throughout the country as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varghese. Are there any more questions? Uh, well, that actually brings us to the end of uh, this session. And we have overshot only by eight minutes, uh, uh, Anupama. And I think that's that's good timing, I think. Uh, thank, first of all, thank you very much to our ex esteemed uh, speakers. The presentations were brilliant. And I... Uh, urge you to please mail your presentations to Dr. Anupama Datta so that this can be part of the documentation process and a lot many more people can be inspired by these uh, presentations. Thank you very much for sparing the time. And one common theme that has come out definitely is that it is a many hands approach. Uh, it cannot be just the government or individual societies or even the families. So it is a many hands approach, a multi-sectoral, multi-layered approach to, uh, to, to taking care of the elderly, particularly the uh, aging women who, who face uh, many more layers of vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the points that was underscored by many of our speakers was the lack of data. And this is something that most non-profit organizations like the Help Page and the Guild have been emphasizing the, the lack of data. And because there is lack of data, we do not have enough innovative, out-of-the-box thinking as far as policy and programs for the elderly are concerned. And data is essential not just for the, the, the policy, but also if you have to create a impl implementable law or even if there has to be a legal avenue to, for taking care of the elderly, we need that kind of uh, data. The second point that, that has come up again in most presentations was the need for financial inclusion. Well, this was really a no-brainer because all of us know that the economic dependency is only increasing, particularly for age, uh, aging women. And financial inclusion, of course, of co making them creditworthy, making them accessible to uh, skilled uh, skill development and also the marketing linkages. But a new dimension has been added now is the digital literacy. 
because it is impossible for them to be financially literate and financially included if digital literacy is not there. Uh, the, these are reactive policies that we are looking at, which of course, uh, when we create a, a, a recommendatory paper, we will be incorporating these suggestions. But finally, what is also most important is the proactive measure of how do we address ageism through the gender lens? And how do we ensure that this double whammy of gender and aging are addressed effectively? So on that moot question, I am going to uh, uh, stop here. Thank you so much, Anupama, for a brilliant afternoon. Thank you so much to our speakers. They really made this afternoon extremely stimulating and uh, and has given us so much of food for thought and for action. Thank you. I would also like to, on behalf of Helpage India, thank all the uh, panelists and all the attendees, and uh, of course the chair for being um, so strict and so lenient and making it in time. Otherwise, uh, we normally are unable to keep time. And also people from various time zones were, you know, uh, getting onto this panel. So uh, thank you all to them also, because some of for some of them, it was very inconvenient, but they still, you know, managed to uh, share their thoughts with us. So special thanks to all of them. And uh, this is just the first step in this dialogue about uh, older women. And uh, we'll try and sort of make it into a live document, which we can circulate to everybody. And we can continue this dialogue for uh, refining it and you know um, because we are a we are an organization that's into action so from this understanding that we have we'd like to drop on your knowledge and your understanding and then also put it in action somehow so that it's not just at uh, discussion level but it actually finds uh, some useful uh, you know um, a practical application so we'll be very happy to share it with you and uh, thank you once again uh, and we'll close it now and happy Women's Day to everybody. Please have a blast tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.